Okay. So, uh, good morning to everybody and uh, welcome to this event. Uh, I am Olaj from Technalia. Technalia is uh, controlling this, uh, this event that is part of the Neurostream Spinal Project. Uh, so, in this uh, event, some speakers that are from the consortium and another invited speaker that we uh, are very grateful for your participation and your contribution. So, uh, this event is going to be recorded uh, and we will upload to. to if some of you have some problem, please uh, say yes. Uh, and if you, if some of you uh, was not that uh, some information appear, uh, say yes, and uh, we will manage. Uh, I I want to ask you to be very strict with the question of the time. So I will tell you when uh, when you are in your in your last minute, in order that uh, to fit the the, the program. And for questions, uh, there are two, two ways to do the question. As you know, we have a, a slot of uh, presentation. And after the first slot, that is uh, more or less about uh, 11 and a half, we have um, one time for, the, for questions. To do the question, you do it by means of the chat of the application that will be uh, always open. And in the, in the time of the question, uh, we will review this, uh, this chat. Or you have another option that is by mean of the micro. You open your micro in the time of questions and you put uh, you put your your question. You raise the hand and I will I will introduce you. And at the end of the event, you will receive one questionnaire that we will be very grateful uh, if you fit this questionnaire uh, because it will allow us uh, to, to improve uh, this uh, this event. And thank you. And I, we can start uh, with the with the event. I would like to introduce uh, as, uh, Arthur Silva, Vice of the uh, for Research and Innovation of the University of Aido uh, from Portugal. And uh, I give you the control of the of the event. So please. Uh, all uh, the other speakers, please, uh, you can, if you can, uh, put off cameras and micro in order to better understand and to better hear. Uh, it's, I think, uh, the best. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning to all of you. And uh, I would say welcome to the University of Aveiro in these, uh, in these strange times and also with a new platform that I have now. Uh, introducing my computer. Well, in these times we are now doing or, or learning to do different different uh, conferences, different, different meetings, different workshops. But uh, but we we have learned uh, uh, quite well and 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 quite quickly. But it's uh, my pleasure to be here uh, in this uh, in the opening of this um, event. Let's say. Uh, um, because I, I, I would like to, to give my support to, to the project, especially to the to the to the members and to, to the to the PI of the project, to Paula, to for this um, this adventure that uh, she have um, in the project is a, a special team that are are um, of interest for 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 the universe of Aveiro, especially for a, a, a big group. Of, of researchers, in this case from the, the research unit of uh, TEMA, but it's also uh, broader because in the University of Aveiro we have a, a good, a large community in biomaterials. This is um, is a subject that we have uh, is included in the in the in the broader one that is the, the material science because it's it's a hot topic and a, a, a topic. Uh, where the University of Aveiro is well placed in the in the Europe and in the world, so uh, this is uh, uh, the first word is to support the the, the project. To to uh, that I, I uh, it's why I'm I'm here present in the in the opening of this this event. But I would like to say that uh, this group of researchers uh, are uh, among our community. Um, 
that we have 20 research units in the university. Uh, these 20, uh, uh, 20 research units were classified by our colleagues, our foreign colleagues. It's a process that is, is implemented by our foundation for research for, for science and technology. And we have been classified as all of them as very good and excellent. This uh, show um, the strengths of our research, but also the, the interest of our community and also from the, our rectorate to support all the, the research units and all the, the, the researchers in itself. So uh, I think it uh, at the end of this event, all of you uh, will be more rich because we will share your, your, your ideas, um, we share your, your thoughts and how to implement this excellent uh, project in the, in the biomaterials um, and especially also for the specific teams that involve the, 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 the nervous uh, central system of the human body. So I, I, I would finish by this. I wish you a very fruitful event. Of course, that if you were in, at the University of Aveiro and in Aveiro, I would like to invite you to see the campus and to see the city because we have a, a beautiful city and beautiful campus. It's not possible in this way, but I hope that in the future you can visit our campus, you can visit our city and, and Portugal. And thank you very much for, for, for being with us to, to in this meeting. And congratulations to and I give you all the support for this for this event. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Arthur. And now is the time of uh, Paula, uh, Paula Marquez, that is coordinator of the project and is the principal researcher of mechanical engineering department of the University of uh, Aveiro. Uh, please, Paula. Yeah. Uh, Paula, is loading. Now. First of all, uh, I would like to, of course, thank Professor Silva for her kind words and also I know you have a very full agenda, so thank you so much for your time and to, um, to be here with us and thank you for your support. Uh, I am seeing if uh, the presentation is starting to be shared. Do you see it now? Okay, this is a new platform, so this is something. You see my screen? Can you please, because I don't see now. Okay. No, no. I, should, I just see myself. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, uh, no. People can see your screen, yes. But now I don't know how I can uh, insert the PowerPoint. Okay, now it's okay. You see my screen now? Yes, yes. So can I start? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you again. I was thanking the Professor Tursilbo for the, his introduction and now uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to the first Neurospin Spinal Workshop. And of course, I want to express my gratitude to each of you for your interest in attending this event, but especially to the invited speakers who have kindly agreed to contribute towards its enrichment. Um, how, ah, okay. Um, allow me uh, uh, then to begin by introducing Neurostim Spinal Project. So this is a FET Open uh, project, a type of initiative meant to create innovative ideas for fundamentally new technologies inside the H2020 program. Neurostim Spinal aims to take a step forward to spinal cord injury repair using innovative stimulated nanoengineering scaffolds. It started on the 1st of April of 2019 and has a duration of 48 months. Um, the subject or the focus is spinal cord and uh, as you know, the spinal cord is regarding as the link between the brain and the rest of the body. 
As a result, a disruption to the spinal cord neural network has a profound effect on the nervous system general function, as the spinal cord has a very limited capacity for regeneration. Finally, spinal cord damage has, as you know, uh, catastrophic uh, long-term health uh, implications and frequently resulting in total or partial uh, paralysis. Unfortunately, until now, existing therapies, uh, therapies remain uh, ineffective. So our objective is to de develop a neuro tissue engineered scaffold capable of mimicking the native uh, spinal cord structure. And given the biological complexity of the spinal cord injury, even a small incremental advance in this field may result in improved clinical treatment and quality of life for these patients. Therefore, our approach to build these scaffolds takes advantage of the properties of uh, two materials, graphene-based materials supported by a protein-rich solarized extracellular matrix. Several manufacturing techniques are being explored in the project uh, to produce scaffolds with uh, different uh, morphologies. The selected scaffolds will be that are then being studied by in vitro studies and will be also uh, studied by in vivo studies, both with and without uh, electrical simulation. To embrace this challenge, our consortium is constituted by um, seven partners from five different countries. In a, uh, so in Portugal, we have the University of Alvaro and two companies, Stematters and Grafnest. We have also in Spain, uh, University Complutense of Madrid and Research Institute Technalia. In Greece, we have the Ford Institute and in the Netherlands, we have the Red van Munch University. Just to give you an idea of the project organization, it consists of seven work packages and the scientific work package are uh, dedicated to a device for the electrical stimulation development for the, to, to stimulate the scaffolds, the scaffolds production itself and the in vitro and in vivo studies. Okay, we are uh, dedicating our research to a very complex, um, to a very complex uh, area of fields because neuro tissue engineering is really complex and a scaffold designated uh, for spinal cord injury must comply with several specifications. Some of them are illustrated here in this picture, in this figure. And um, since morphology, biocompatibility, mechanical properties, a uh, lot of uh, details need to be explored. And uh, regarding the scaffold compositions, I want to, um, to present you graphene, or more accurately, graphene-based materials, which is a nanomaterial with significant characteristics that may assist in obtaining some of these scaffolds' important attributes. For those of you unfamiliar with graphene, it is a single sheet of uh, carbon atoms organized in an hexagonal lattice structure. And while a uh, graphene, single graphene layer is challenging to acquire and deal with, its derivatives such as few layer graphene, graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide have also uh, interesting properties that we can explore. And this material is very, also very interesting because it can be modified with uh, several other chemical moieties by covalent or not covalent linkage. I just want to emphasize graphene's well-known properties uh, for biomedical applications by displaying here a page from the Graphene flagship magazine from 2020, which discusses the applications for flexible uh, neural uh, implants, graphene-based electrodes to restore vision, and the use of graphene-based materials for the delivery. I want just to take the opportunity to highlight that uh, in our group, since 2009, uh, we have been investigating graphene-based materials for different applications from composites, uh, environment, and also from for bio applications as uh, uh, it is highlighted here uh, with several uh, publications from, from our group. Um, due to the graphene-based composite, nanocomposites properties that we were achieving, 
we started to be interested in the application of materials for neural uh, tissue engineering some years ago, and we published our first article uh, in 2016. Uh, interestingly, uh, here uh, we already started to, to work with neural cells with the group of one of our today invited speakers, James Phillips. And this has, this has inspired André Giraud to begin his PhD research in 2017 on a three-dimensional graphene composite scaffold with a combinatorial fibrous porous architecture for spinal cord injury. And uh, he's co-supervised by my colleague Antonio Completo and also Maria Concepcion Serrano, who is also um, going to present here today um, uh, at the workshop. And he is obtained some interesting findings by mixing graphene oxide with a variety of polymers and exploring the fibrous porous topologies of the scaffolds. Joana Souza, another PhD student, is investigated the effect of adding graphene-based materials to a photopolymerized plated lysate hydrogel. It's also very interesting material. And uh, additionally, she's examining different method methods for simulating the anisotropy uh, characteristics of the neural stem spinal. And she's been co-supervised by uh, our colleague from the University of Alvaro Romano and also Emmanuel Sardakis from Ford. Daniela Silva, a PhD student, is exploring the fabrication of the neural tissue engineering scaffolds using various uh, adipose, uh, using various, uh, um, adipose tissue, tissueized extracellular matrix and graphene-based materials formulations as part of the Neurosim Spinal project. So she's primarily using a, a method uh, just to produce foams by phase separation and freeze drying. And also she's preparing hydrogel formulation for 3D printing, as, as she will explain in detail also in this workshop. She's being supervised by Natalie Verhoeke, a principal researcher of the Neurosim Spinal project and co-supervised by me and Andy Brunella from Ford. Additionally, um, uh, graphene uh, is a key nanomaterial for the fabrication of the graphene inks used to construct the electrodes for the electrical simulation device, which is also another important uh, deliver of our project. And our partner, GraphNest, is committed to addressing these issues. So the graphene based inks production and the 3D electrical simulation device. Uh, I can mention that these uh, three, uh, both it items are already being protected by patent rights. Our team from the University of uh, Aveiro, Departments of Electronical Engineering, is responsible for the conceptualization and implementation for the in vitro device as well as design and, develop and development of custom, co uh, custom components for the generation and regulation of the simulation signal. Patricia and Guilherme are PhD students working directly on the Neurosim Spinal project, while Latifa is a PhD student collaborating on the Neurosim Spinal under the Carnegie Mellon University Portugal um, program scholarship. So um, this, is, this was a brief uh, description of uh, our team and our expertise. And uh, we, uh, in summary, uh, we hope that our approach of combining graphene-based materials with the protein-rich matrix, which will be described uh, in detail by, later by the partner at the Technology, from the Technology team, in conjunction with the electrical simulations, will provide um, valuable insight into the neural uh, cells' ability to repair the spinal cord injury at the, at the end of the project. So, uh, if we can make at least one or two steps increasing knowledge and having an influence in the field of neural tissue engineering, we will have accomplished our objective. So, I want to show uh, my appreciation to everyone once again and um, wish each of one uh, an exciting and productive day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula, for, for your great overview of NIR's STEM Spinal project. So the next speaker is also a member of NIR's STEM Spinal project, my colleague, uh, Olatz Murua. She's a market uh, manager for European programs at Ignalia. 
and her talk is titled Neurostin Spinal uh, Potential Application in, in Other Medical Fields. Thank you, uh, Beatriz. Uh, yes, I am Olach Murua uh, from Technalia. And uh, as you know, in the STEAM Spinal project, uh, as, uh, as objective, we have the development of one scaffold for a spinal cord injury. So uh, this is a FETOPEN project. Uh, so uh, the objective of the FETOPEN project is to uh, is to be is to have one foundational character. So uh, in this objective of FETOPENS, my my talk, the objective of my talk is to do one approach of other potential application of the scaffold that we have developing in the in the context of the of this project. So uh, this is my this is the objective is to open the the window to other potential application based in the experience and in the development that we are doing. So so uh, at first, what is the concept that we have developed in the in the Neurostim Spinal project? Uh, we have a scaffold that is made uh, by one side of uh, the cellularized material. That means it's a uh, tissue that has adipose origin uh, that in which has been removed cells and the immunological components and uh, that this became that the tissue was an excellent structure for the cell survival and for the cells behavior uh, because uh, the point is that it's very rich in basement membrane proteins. So this uh, tissue uh, is combined with one uh, graphene basal materials uh, with different uh, properties, different conditions, uh, different treatments that our colleagues of Aveiro will go to the details. And uh, this is the design of the scaffold that we have. So the application is for, is for a spinal cord injury, but uh, we thought that other potential application can be in the field of uh, neurofield. That means, uh, for example, there are some diseases as uh, strokes and uh, brain traumas uh, in which uh, potentially uh, the solution could be to implant one tissue in order to get the regeneration of the brain. What are the sources to access to the brain? Uh, in this moment, in the state of the art, uh, are studying different uh, ways. One of them is by means of the uh, frontal area, and other uh, way to access is uh, by means of the nose. Other potential application of our scaffold is in the hair field within. Uh, it's possible to add it, to introduce cardiomyocytes in the scaffold for cases in which we have uh, tissue damage. That means in disease as heart failure or infarction and fibrosis. Because in this disease, uh, the problem is that it generates one scar, as in the spinal cord injury case, and uh, there is an inflammatory environment uh, in which cell survival is very difficult and uh, the damage of the tissue is uh, happened, and this damage uh, thin the weight of the, of the hair. So this has, as consequently, one respiratory failure. So potentially, it could be possible to develop one scaffold, one fill, based in, uh, in our material and uh, cardiomyocyte, for example, in order to get the regeneration of this area. To manufacture this, uh, this scaffold, this fill, is possible to do by means of 3D bioprinting because, because we have already uh, checked that, uh, that our TC is very printable. Other potential application could be diagnosis and therapy. That means early diagnosis devices and uh, devices in order to develop personalized therapies. Uh, here, the concept should be to use the scaffold that we have developed, that means the desolated matrix and the graphene based materials, in which we can introduce uh, drugs uh, by means of encapsulation. We have this expertise. We can introduce cells. We can introduce antibodies or genetic therapies, and uh, this construct uh, the point should be or the contribution should be that it was better uh, matrix in order to do the studies for diagnosis or for therapy. This construct will be introduced in one integrated tissue in a chip, for example, or in one bioreactor, or uh, to use in in vitro studies. And uh, in order to uh, obtain therapies, personalized, personalized therapies 
or diagnosis uh, improved devices to study disease as uh, Parkinson, Alzheimer, or hair fire, or even cancer, in which we have some small experience. The point will be that we will have one device improved by me uh, because of the um, combination or the design of this uh, uh, scaffold that we are developing. Uh, the last one uh, field that we uh, see that could be possible to use our scaffold is the teaching engineering by means of 3D bioprinting. We have already so we have already checked that our uh, scaffold is uh, is very printable. We have worked already in different shapes by means of uh, scaffolds, porous scaffolds with controlled uh, porosity or even with electro spinning. We have checked that there is no problem to manufacture the scaffold by means of these technologies. So uh, this open one field of uh, tissue regeneration that I think that could be very important. So as summarized, the field that I have uh, comment as potential application of the, this scaffold uh, are the neurofield, the heart muscle regeneration, diagnosis and therapy, and tissue engineering. So uh, this is the this is my talk. Thank you for your attention. The objective I, I thought that I, I hope. Uh, that was uh, some point of interest in, uh, for some of you. If you have some interest, uh, my objective was to open this window for discussion, for contribution, uh, for new contacts. Thank you very much. Is, uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, Laura Valerini, full professor of uh, Physiology International School of Advanced Studies of uh, Trieste and Italy. So thank you very much, and uh, I wish to thank Paula Marquez for um, the and the Neurosteam Spinal Project, of course, of course, for organizing uh, this workshop, which somehow is intended to sustain and frame the Neurosteam Spinal Project uh, approach and strategy within uh, the research at the new frontiers, as we have heard right now, among nanomaterials applications in neuroscience. So I'm particularly honored to be here. Now, in my brief presentation, uh, I will address um, the use of uh, novel or outstanding nanomaterials to uh, interface uh, neurons and the ability of such materials somehow to affect uh, what are the general neuronal functional uh, features, including uh, regen axonal regenerations, thus representing ultimately what we can to um, tell as uh, unconventional tools uh, to govern gene and biological uh, processes. Now, we have used uh, carbon nanotubes, which I'm reporting about today, and more recently even graphene, so we share this passion for carbon-based materials and their uh, outstanding properties, to exploit the physical properties of this material, such as uh, um, topographical properties or electrical properties or chemical properties, to instruct neural network reconstruction. Now, in the study I'm going to quickly present today, uh, we have addressed the impact of carbon nanotubes in particular on neuronal signaling. And actually, we were the first to demonstrate that um, these materials is not inert. Once interfaced to neurons, it will affect and impact the nature of the network, their connectivity, and even single cell activities. Now, the growing interest in carbon nanotube is mostly based on their use as components of uh, medical devices. Um, and uh, um, w th therefore, uh, this has been attracting uh, attention since these materials, as also other one, uh, do possess some uh, dimensional and chemical compatibility with biomolecules such, for example, DNA or proteins. Now, uh, in general, carbon nanotube have received an extensive attention for application in the industry of electronic computer, aerospace, or even more. But in the same breath, in the last two decades, they have been also at the center of platform development of platform te technology for biomedical applications, such as sensors, the one I mentioned before. But their application in neurology or in neuroscience include electrical interfaces for neuronal stimulation and recording and the implement of a, a composite for tissue engineering approaches. Now, these sketches show the two mostly used geometries of these materials for biomedical applications. And as you might notice, these are the same 
sheet of uh, graphene, which was illustrated by Paula before, rolled up to four carbon nanotubes to form uh, alloy cylinder in a single wall configuration or multi wall. These uh, scanning electron micrograph and atomic force micrograph illustrate uh, the appearance of pure carpets of single wall carbon nanotubes and at the atomic force microscopy, multi wall carbon nanotubes. So this material was prepared and purified and uh, um, provided to us mostly from Maurizio Prato, with whom we have been collaborating since almost more than 15 years on this project. So any result I'm presenting has been done in collaboration uh, with uh, his group and also other groups. So the easiest setting were to test the impact of the interfacing of these materials with neurons is that of cultured neurons. So cultured neurons on substrate illustrated here by AFM, these are multi-wall carbon nanotubes and these image highlight the uh, roughness of the surface, so this is electrically conductive, and usual uh, glass cover slips. So neuronal networks were developed, interfaced to these two substrate and compared. And among the several studies we have we've done, uh, one of the observations at the ultrastructure at scanning electron microscopy, which is pointed here by these arrows or here, which really struck us and we think is at the core of the interaction of the material with the um, neurons, and is highlighted in here as well, is the formation of time and intimate contact between the material and outgrowing axons and dendrites of the culture. The consequence of this sort of hybrids are of three major uh, outputs, which are represented by an improved network activity, an improved single cell excitability, and improved axonal regrowth due to the interfacing of carbon nanotubes with neurons. And of course, this last one is the one we are most interested in uh, at the moment. Now, we have done several studies along the last decades in which we report improved network activity, which means there is a, a, an, improves, uh, an increased number of synapses when neurons are uh, regrowing and forming network interface to carbon nanotube. These are single cell patch clamp recording in voltage clamp mode, and these deflections are uh, synaptic currents. So there is an increased frequency of, uh, of currents, uh, both from glutamatergic and GABAergic origins. So excitatory and inhibitory components are balanced out in this increased connectivity. Therefore, we never observe parasitic events such as um, epileptic bursting or similar to uh, epileptic bursting. So there is an increased efficacy of the network in transferring signal, which is linked to an increased number of synapses, which have been um, demonstrated by confocal microscopy, which are not shown in here, and electrophysiological settings such as pair recordings. Now we have done also some more um, exquisite biophysics uh, experiment in which we also address the second point, increased cellular excitability. So neuronal regenerative properties are boosted by carbon nanotube. Neurons are somehow um, uh, co-opting nanotubes for their activity. In particular, I'm flashing on it because I'm then getting to another point. In particular, the ability to backpropagate action potential uh, in the dendritic arborization, which is a regenerative properties involving spike time dependent plasticity. So synaptic plasticity is addressed in this case. So these substrates work as a sort of uh, artificial biomimetic cues offering the opportunity to uh, improve synapse formation and plasticity. Getting to axonal regeneration, this was tested in a more complex in vitro model, which is represented by spinal cord organotypic cultures. These are slices of segments of the spinal cord, which are cultured for weeks or months um, in the presence of the dorsal root ganglia. And the site architecture of the system, the ventral fissure, the ventral horn, dorsal horn, DRGs are maintained. As you might notice, there is a huge outgrowth of fibers. When we interface this structure and let them grow for weeks, interface to carbon nanotube, we observe several effects. But getting to the axonal regeneration, we observe that there is an increased outgrowth of axons which reaches longer distances in a higher numbers. And in particular, again, the tight connection, these are scanning electron microscopy images with the material are present. And when we explore by atomic force microscopy, um, by nano indentation, we explore the stiffness of the, of the axons and compare the stiffness to, to what grown on uh, traditional grass cover slips we observed that they were less stiff on carbon nanotube and flattening out. Somehow, this tight connection used the carbon nanotube as a sort of uh, exoskeleton to grow, um, uh, to grow for the axons. And we also observed 
uh, an increased growth gone activity. Now, uh, what really changes our approach uh, to, these, uh, um, to these materials was the potential um, um, to use a three-dimensional uh, structure. We have always had these carpets of carbon nanotube and we grow over the neurons. Now, we had the possibility, thanks to the collaboration of uh, Maurizio Prato with the group in Rome, of, to use this scaffold. This is a, a self-standing uh, random skeleton done of multi-wall, look at this, this is a Piscanic electron microscopy, uh, um, multi-wall carbon nanotubes with an incredible porosity, an incredible elasticity, can be compressed and then goes back to the initial dimensions. And these images we show clearly the structure of this multi-wall scaffold are obtained by confocal microscopy in the reflection mode, since this material is metallic and is electrically conductive. So we could use a three-dimensional scaffold done by uh, carbon nanotube. At first, we interface uh, this scaffold with the very same model you have seen before, the organotypic spinal cord cultures, but in a different setting. We co-culture two slices. This is a sort of in vitro model of, uh, of a spinal injury. I mean, here, the slices is an injury per se, but then they let, we let them grow for weeks or months. And then if we co-culture two spinal cord slices at a distance that is uh, over uh, 200 or 300 micron. Uh, this is a huge growth of fibers. This is their nature, but they will not function and reconnect to each other. So it can be used as a model uh, to test interfaces. So we co-culture the slices, either interface or not with the uh, three-dimensional carbon nanotube scaffold, and then we perform simultaneous recording and histology on these uh, conditions. Now, um, here is again an image of the scaffold you have seen before at two different magnification, and this is a controller and interface grows with the scaffold. What happens is that the outgrowing fibers, this is a, 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 these are examples of beta tubulin positive fibers. We had uh, co-staining with beta tubulin as Me32 as well, so axons which are growing as bundles in the control conditions. In the presence of the sponge, as you might notice, they follow the three-dimensionality of the sponge and they follow the carbon nanotube sponge in their growth. Uh, what is the effect of this uh, uh, conditioned growth by the 3D carbon nanofiber? This is the abbreviation for the sponge. Well, from the functional point of view, uh, what we notice is that when you are simultaneously recording the two ventral horn, and if you are inducing rhythmic activity, which is a trick on the spinal cord to activate the pattern generator in, in vitro, uh, what, you, uh, what you observe is that there is an increased cross-correlation among the two signals. And if you get through a statistical permutation test, you can detect that there is an increased fraction of significantly correlated pair. And the third proof that these are connected is by stimulating the dorsal horn, you can entrain this system. So uh, this uh, structure could restore the functional coupling among artificially separated spinal slices. Now, the ultimate potential of any scaffold, as uh, also stated by the previous speaker, is the application in vivo. So we decided to use Use this scaffold to uh, test it in in vivo condition. So what we have done is to induce a, a, a surgical spinal cord injury in mammals, which is and we use the uh, lumbar hemisection paradigm where we in adult rats. Uh, so we got at L1 an hemicordectomy, and then in the right and Amicord, and then in the right amicord, and then we insert either a PAG polyethylene glycol, which is the vehicle of the scaffold when it's implanted in the cord as a control, or the carbon nanotube fiber, the scaffold you have seen before, and we let them there for six months. So we analyzed these at two levels. The first is an ultrastructural level to investigate the stability of the scaffold under these conditions. And these, for example, if you focus on this image there, this is the scaffold, the scanning electron microscopy. This is a slice from the spinal cord after six months of implantation. And you might notice how the structure is maintained of the scaffold and how the surrounding tissue is in tight contact. If we slice out and uh, perform immunosaining from beta tubulin 3, and again, the gray stuff is the carbon nanotubes under reflection mode. This is a high magnification confocal image. You might notice that these fibers are entering the fibers. At the macroscopic level, thanks to the collaboration with Pedro Ramon Cabrer, we could observe uh, uh, MRI, um, uh, high resolution T2 weighted anatomical images in a control 
um, uh, naive animals in a PEG lesion and in a carbon nanotube. The dark hypertense structure is uh, due to the porous structure of the scaffold. And in that case, the first observation is the mechanical stability of the lesion area, which collapsed in PEG and is sustaining uh, carbon nanotube uh, treated, uh, um, treated animals. And we also exploit a, a simulation by um, by, by a finite element method. I mean, we simulate the spinal cord as a viscoelastic structure, and then we simulate a, a, an axial load, and we simulate the uh, stability with the, including the properties, mechanical properties of the, of the carbon nanotubes or uh, of the PEG, of course. And therefore, we could observe these uh, uh, different behaviors. So, uh, the, the sponge provide presumably a certain mechanical stability. We also investigated the tissue reactivity. I'm not going into the details. Uh, there is not a foreign body reaction to the sponge. This is the bottom line. We further investigated the presence of regrowing axons within the sponge after six months. And this is an example of the peg which shredded remains in there. And then the dark is of, all, of course the empty lesion. And in the presence of carbon nanotubes, again highlighted on a certain uh, level by the confocal microscopy in reflection mode, and the huge presence of fibers at the microscopic level entering the sponge. Again, thanks to the collaboration with Pedro, we also uh, assessed uh, uh, the neuronal, the, the axonal regeneration in the entire spinal cord while exploited um, um, MRI images and uh, uh, therefore exploited the um, diffusion weighted image comp uh, com com complexated to uh, some uh, mathematical methods, which I'm not expert in, to reconstruct tracting fiber uh, based on the functional isotropy of the, of the axons. Here is the intact one, the PEG one, and these are different examples after six months of uh, implantation of the carbon nanofibers. So all in all, we could quantitatively assess that above and below the lesion, um, taking an area of three millimeter above and three millimeter below, uh, in the presence of CNF, there is an improved spinal cord fiber density upon PEG implantation. And these are the fractional anisotropy. And this is another approach by another uh, model, which uh, somehow try to show not the quantity of fiber, but the directionality of the fiber growing. So to investigate it, whether uh, the uh, regrowing axons uh, are represented, at least in part, from regenerated axotomized cortical spinal tract, uh, we further form some experiment by labeling the, uh, the cortical spinal tract by dextran um, uh, neurotracers, injected after three months after the lesion, the surgery, in the, in the somatosensory cortex of the rat, and then at four months, we performed the experiment perfusing the animal and the histology. You might notice the red uh, uh, labeled uh, fibers are from the dextran labeled one on a thin slices of the cord, and this is the rostral, she and coda, the lesion and coda. If we magnified the area with the carbon nanotube, we might notice some positive fibers inside the sponge, uh, which were double positive for v one so glutamatergic fiber, and for 5-HT. We also assess the, uh, from the behavioral point of view, uh, these animals after six months, monitoring in general their uh, locomotive behavior by the traditional BBB score. And I wish to point out that there is uh, the dark dots are those implanted. There is a significant improvement of, of the behavioral locomotor, of the locomotor um, behavior in these animals in an acute phase. And we assume this is due to the mechanical stability, which I pointed out at the beginning. And then in later phases, 120 days, which might be ascribed to the regrowing fibers. We um, thought to measure more refined sensory motor performance by the ladder score. And again, we have initial uh, improvement, but then uh, after one month, this is increasing and reaching more or less uh, higher levels. And the immediate uh, improvement is also shown in a hind limb pole plantar placement. So our hypothesis is that the uh, carbon nanotube fibers, uh, the 3D structure inserted in the tissue exerts um, an impact in uh, Pause immediately after the lesion phases, presumably due to the improving the mechanical stability of the cord. But the, later on, uh, we, as, we uh, propose that there is a connection with the regrowing fibers. So to conclude, the point I want to make today, uh, which I think are uh, significant for the uh, spinal stem project, 
is that uh, we may have a different way to look at neuroregeneration, introducing some physical rules to neural tissue repair strategies. The fact that the axon regeneration and the directionality might depend on pure material physical properties in the absence of specific uh, biochemical sophistications or additional biomimetic one might uh, indicate a cost-effective manner to approach engineering of the uh, spinal cord. And then newly engineered artificial scaffold might serve as prototype uh, to exploit what I usually term the physics governing regenerative plasticity in vivo, because this regenerative ability of the odd spinal cord um, and the ability to reorganize its circuits when altering the physical microenvironment by smart materials might be an important point to work on when designing. Uh, scaffolds, not the only one, but one to be taken into consideration. I wish then to conclude by acknowledging people participating to this study. As I mentioned, Pedro Ramos Cabrera and his collaborators from the city of Magune has been an extraordinary work in uh, addressing the MRI of these animals, which were traveling from Italy to, uh, to uh, San Sebastian and back. Maurizio Prato, as I mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, still now, of course, we are still collaborating, and all the work has been done in collaboration with Maurizio. The group of Maurizio De Crescenzi for the three-dimensional scaffold, and people from my group, which are here nicely represented in one of the most uh, uh, important activity in Trieste, having dinner outside in summer, which, well, before pandemic, and uh, I wish to acknowledge Sadaf for all the in vivo experiment together with Raffaele and Audrey and Manuela. And for the in vitro one, uh, Giada, Dennis and Nicolo Pampaloni and Rosanna Rauti, two previous collaborators of the lab. And I wish to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. Now, the uh, next speaker is uh, my colleague, Irache Madarieta from Tecnalia, that is senior researcher of Tecnalia. Uh, from the biomaterials group. Okay. Now you can listen me. Yeah. Yeah. My apologizes. The program uh, switch off in the moment that I was uh, speaking. So um, so as as we saw, uh, the the spinal cord injury uh, affects two million individuals suffer worldwide and. Uh, we have a very low axonal regeneration uh, and restricted also with inhibitory molecules generated by gear scar and uh, at present it's a big challenge to uh, obtain a functional repair of the tissue. A uh, neurostim spinal project is a fed open project as the speak uh, Paula uh, explained before and the objective is to obtain a graphene and adipose extracellular matrix derived scaffold integrated in an electrical stimulation device to produce a neural regeneration. Uh, I would like to thank to all the partners of the Neurostim Spinal Project, principally uh, to the University of Aveiro for the coordination. And the principal role of Tecnalia Biomaterials is, is the development of adipose extracellular matrix biologic scaffold. So, uh, this is the, the focus of my talk, the decellularized adipose tissue biologic scaffold materials. Um, tissue uh, extracellular matrix is the natural template for cells as structural and functional properties. And tissue decellularization is the excellent technology to obtain complete extracellular matrix materials. The aim of objective is to remove cells and cell components to avoid immune response and maintain as much as possible the extracellular matrix structure and composition. Uh, extracellular matrix derived materials have been uh, preclinical and clinically applica applicated and uh, one of the principal advantage over single component is the constructive remodeling instead of producing a scar tissue and uh, it has been used uh, for many tissues, but relatively few studies for central nervous system. So why we have uh, decellularized adipose tissue? Uh, the reason behind is that it's an abundant source of both human and animal tissue, easily obtainable in large quantities, and the composition includes basement membrane proteins. 
So Tecnalia is a proprietary for a specific uh, enzymatic method to decellularize adipose tissue since 2015. And the method was based on the conservation of the uh, extracellular matrix proteins and the, uh, the obtaining of a very low uh, remanent DNA materials. So during the Neurostim Spinal Project, we are producing porcine and human adipose extracellular matrices using two different methods, enzymatic method that I explained to you before, and also a more standardized method, uh, which is based on organic solvents. So we are producing uh, uh, totally four different materials based on adipose extracellular matrix. And we also have the opportunity to scale up our production from 0.1 grams to 20 grams. So in adipose tissue, uh, it's very important to check desterilization criteria, delipidation, and uh, conservation of uh, proteins. But there is no, there is no uh, standardized uh, protocol to desterilize any tissue, so Ternalia provides the adipose extracellular matrix materials with a certificate of analysis of uh, decellularization, protein content, viscosity, and scaffolding uh, properties, uh, cytotoxicity, and endotoxin analysis. And during tissue decellularization, uh, in those materials, we observe the remanent DNA, and also the delipidation. Okay, so we, we obtain materials with very low remanent DNA, uh, principally with the enzymatic method, and uh, we also effectively remove lipids from uh, human and porcine adipose tissue, uh, being also more effective than enzymatic uh, method to uh, remove the triacid glycerols. We analyze the, the protein composition and uh, we observe here you have the extracellular matrix protein composition of our materials in a human derived. And we observe that the enzymatic method conserves more proteins uh, than uh, organic solvent methods. And uh, both methods conserve all base membrane protein, except laminin subunit uh, 3. Uh, uh, here you have the, the composition, extracellular matrix composition of the native porcine adipose tissue and uh, two materials obtained by enzymatic method and uh, isopropanol. And in this case, uh, we conserve more extracellular matrix proteins when we use uh, organic solvents. So once we have the, the material uh, well characterized, uh, we start uh, applying uh, scaffolding technologies. Firstly, we obtain coatings with the materials uh, and also three-dimensional materials like uh, solid forms and uh, electrospan nanofibers, and finally, we develop in situ polymerization hydrogels and bionics. So now I'm going to explain uh, a little bit one of each of these uh, materials, starting for coatings that uh, could efficiently, it's more efficient to plant cells uh, in, uh, in this kind of coating, and uh, you can obtain a higher proliferation or density with uh, these coatings. And uh, here you have a scheme of how we produce these, these coatings. And during the Neurostim project, we have uh, collaborated with the Complutense University uh, to observe the macrofactorization of these coatings. Uh, and uh, they are going to explain uh, their work uh, just after my talk. So as uh, tissues are three-dimensional, uh, we started uh, producing three-dimensional biomaterials with the adipose extracellular matrix, uh, firstly with solid forms. So here you have an scheme that 
how we produce uh, solid forms. We dissolve in acetic acid and then we apply the freeze drying methodology to remove uh, water and to obtain a porous structure. Uh, we obtain uh, with all the materials, we obtain uh, interconnected uh, porous structures and uh, we also could uh, change the stiffness of the of these uh, scaffolds, uh, increasing the material qu quantity in the solution and the mechanical behavior of the scaffolds uh, is like a, it's like a gel like where the elastic modulus is bigger than uh, than the um, loose modulus yeah uh, we also have uh, introduced gaffrene oxide in the in these solid forms and uh, the solid forms uh, permit to introduce a very high uh, percentage of graphene and uh, without uh, altering the the porous structure and interconnectivity and in this task the University of Aveiro is uh, most focusing uh, on this task. Uh, here you can observe that we develop uh, also biphasic solid forms uh, with uh, graphene only in the external part uh, or only in the internal part and here you can see the elastic behavior of our scaffolds. So we also uh, produce uh, nanofibers with uh, electrospinning. Uh, this is a very nice technology to obtain uh, nanofibers and to produce coatings uh, in the scaffolds. So we, uh, the material uh, is able to produce uh, graphene and adipose extracellular matrix blending uh, to coat the scaffolds, and we also can align this uh, this this fibers. now in this task also the university of Aveiro is uh, working very hard and finally uh, we develop hydrogels probably the most uh, similar material for tissues since uh, this material can retain uh, a lot of water and uh, here you have a scheme to how we produce the hydrogels uh, we digest the material with pepsin and then produce a self-assembling at 33 degrees to form the hydrogen. Here you can see the structure of uh, fibers in the hydrogen and we, uh, you can see that it's more dense when we increase the material quantity and uh, also mechanical behavior of course is a uh, uh, gel behavior and we can increase the stiffness if we, we increase the material quantity and we can also change the viscosity uh, for uh, bioprinting purposes. So one of the advantage of hydrogel is the cell encapsulation and um, here you have a scheme of how we encapsulate cells. Uh, um, starting from the uh, pre-gel, we uh, put uh, the pre-gel in, in the cell pellet and then we self-assemble the gel out at uh, 37 degrees and uh, cells uh, are encapsulated inside the hydrogen. And uh, we are uh, collaborating with Ford for the Neurostim Spinal Project, encapsulating uh, neural progenitor cells. And uh, we observed that uh, we can encapsulate uh, with uh, good viability uh, neur uh, neural progenitor cells in different hydrogels uh, for, for seven days. And also we have encapsulated uh, these cells with hydrogels closely with genitin. Finally, we are trying to produce uh, bio inks with the hydrogen and we observe uh, that uh, the printability of adipose cellular matrix uh, increases when we add gelatin and this is an approach that we are uh, now continuing working. So, um, 
for resume, uh, the cellular life that impose biologic scaffold materials we can obtain from animal and human uh, origin. We have uh, quite good uh, production scale, uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, controlled batch to batch variability but by our own certification. Uh, materials have an excellent processability for scaffolding. We can control porosity and stiffness and materials are easy for blending with different materials and has uh, excellent compatibility and stability with cell culture. So ongoing approaches, uh, we are continuing to provide these accurate materials to partners and uh, we are uh, in collaboration with Ford for neural cell uh, differentiation in, in the hydrogens and also for bioprinting neural cells and uh, also uh, we are starting to work with electrical stimulation in vitro. So finally, I would like to show you some further applications that we are uh, using these materials with Biodonostia. Uh, those are uh, all local uh, collaborations. With Biodonostia, we are developing muscle and fibrosis in vitro models. With Biocruces in Bilbao, we are doing alginate and platter bridge plasma blended with uh, adipose extracellular matrix for skin regenerative. Uh, for, with the University of the Basque Country, we are uh, culturing human dental pulp stem cells in our materials. And this afternoon, we have uh, the invited speaker, Professor Gascon Ibarreche. Uh, he's going to tell us. Uh, more about these cells in, in adipose cellular matrix scaffolds. And finally, very recently, we have uh, an alliance, uh, joint research laboratory on advanced pharma development that is focused on drug delivery medical device and uh, technology and biomaterials is going to principally participate in regenerative medicine and bioprinting uh, approaches. So thank Thanks for you, for your attention. And uh, now I would like to try to show you a very short video that uh, uh, we have developed during the Neurostim project. Uh, and you can see how we produce this material and how we process with uh, different uh, technologies. So, uh, well, I think it is, quite big the video on uh, anyway uh, this video is, is we have in, in YouTube so if you are interested to show uh, how we produce the material uh, you can introduce Nevers Team Spinal Project uh, in YouTube and uh, you can see how we produce and process these materials thank you very much for your attention Okay, thank you very much, Irache. Uh, now, next speaker is Teresa Portoles, full professor of biochemistry and molecular biology of the University uh, Complutense of uh, Madrid, Spain. Um, thank you, Lars. Uh, it's, it's okay, my presentation? Yes, it's okay. I can start. Yes. Thank you very much. The results that uh, will be present are part of the European uh, Pet Open Neurostima Spinal Project. And the objective of this uh, project, uh, as you know, is uh, to develop uh, scaffolds for spinal cord injury repair by combination of extracellular matrix and graphene related materials. These scaffolds will be coupled with an electrical stimulation device to promote the growth and recognition of the ruptured nerves. The main aspects uh, to be considered for designing uh, functional scaffolds for the treatment of spinal cord injury include biocompatibility, mechanical properties, morphology, architecture, biodegradability, and electrical stimulation. Regarding biocompatibility, 
the assessment of the biocompatibility of scaffolds for tissue engineering is an essential step, a step prior to their implantation in the human body. This assessment requires demonstrating that the scaffolds and their components are non-toxic and also generate the appropriate and beneficial cellular response to regenerate the tissue. Thus, in the biocompatibility studies of the NeuroSteam spinal project, is necessary to carry out cytotoxicity studies and specific cell response studies as immune response and neural response studies. For the cytotoxicity studies, we use specific cell lines representative of liver, kidney and lung because uh, these organs are usually studied for toxicity assessment. Concerning the immune response studies, we use macrophages and lymphocytes as representative cells of the immune system. Neural response studies are carried out with neural cell lines and neural progenitor cells. In this presentation, I will show you the studies we have carried out regarding the immune response to the cellularized extracellular matrices and graphene-derived nanostructures as main components of scaffolds for spinal cord injury repair. First, I will focus on the studies carried out with human and porcine decellularized adipose tissue matrices, DAMS, obtained and characterized by technalia, uh, obtained by enzymatic methods or uh, organic solvent treatment. In order to assess the immune response to these matrices, we culture macrophages in contact with these four uh, matrices and we evaluate different aspects related to the macrophage function. Thus, we analyze the effects of these matrices on the macrophage polarization towards M1 and M2 phenotypes through specific markers and cytokines, as well as uh, the macrophage defense capability against pathogens through a phagocytosis assay using a red fluorescent strain of the fungal pathogen Candida albicans. Macrophages display a spectrum of phenotypes to respond to changes in their environment. Pro-inflammatory M1 and reparative M2 phenotypes are the extremes of this population spectrum. M1 and M2 phenotypes are characterized by the expression of specific cell surface markers and by the secretion of different cytokines. It's also well known that M1 pro-inflammatory macrophages produce higher uh, reactive oxygen uh, levels than M2 preparative uh, cells, promoting the pro-inflammatory response. All these uh, markers are evaluated by flow cytometry and confocal microscopy with specific fluorescent antibodies and specific probes. The levels of each cytokine are detected by enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. We have studied the influence of these matrices, these four matrices, on macrophage polarization towards pro-inflammatory M1 or reparative M2 phenotypes through the expression of different M1 and M2 markers. As M1 markers, we analyze the expression of CD80, the secretion of TNF, as pro-inflammatory cytokine and the proportion of macrophages with high content of reactive oxygen species. 
As M2 markers, we analyzed the expression of CD163 and CD206 and the proportion of macrophages with low content of reactive oxygen species. After contact of macrophages with these matrices, we observed that M1 markers decrease or remain equal to controls. However, in general, M2 markers increase or remain equal to controls after exposition of macrophages to these matrices. Thus, two important conclusions of uh, these macrophage polarization studies have been obtained. None of these matrices induce a pro inflammatory phenotype in macrophages, and the porcine matrices favor the reparative phenotype. We have also evaluated the effects of these matrices on the macrophage defense capability against pathogens through a phagocytosis assay using a red fluorescent strain of the fungal pathogen Candida albicans. We observed higher fungal uh, phagocytosis uh, by macrophages uh, after exposition to human uh, matrix 1 and porcine matrix 2. These two matrices present a higher total protein content and a specific proteins differentially preserved and related with uh, phagocytosis. Our results evidence the close relation between the biochemical composition of the extracellular matrix and the macrophage uh, functional role, highlighting that the uh, composition of the extracellular matrix influences the adhesion of macrophages and their phagocytosis capability. Two additional important conclusions have been obtained from a macrophage phagocytosis uh, studies in contact with these matrices. None of these matrices alters the immunocompetence of macrophages against the pathogenic fungus Candida albicans, inducing an increase, uh, in some cases, of the fungal phagocytosis by macrophages. Macrophage phagocytosis capability is related to specific proteins differentially preserved in certain matrices. Morphological studies have also been carried out to detect the difference in the activation of macrophages cultured on human and porcine matrices by scanning electron microscopy and confocal microscopy. By scanning electron microscopy, we have observed that macrophages on human matrices exhibit longer philopodia than those on porcine dams. The elongation of philopodia depends on the polymerization and cross-linking of actin filaments, and it is related to key actin-associated proteins. By confocal microscopy, we have observed the macrophage actin cytoskeleton in green and its uh, reorganization against the fungus uh, Candida albicans in red. Macrophages on human matrices exhibit philopodia surrounding. Uh, Candida albicans longer than those on porcine uh, dams. Macrophages on porcine dams present the formation of a remarkable actin ring surrounding Candida albicans hyphae. These studies have allowed to obtain important conclusion, significant difference in macrophage activation and acting reorganization in response to candida albicans have been detected 
in contact with these uh, four uh, matrices depending mainly on the proteins that have been conserved. The macrophage morphological changes observed in, on these four matrices are key to understand the macrophage functionality as uh, defense cells against fungal pathogens, depending on their extracellular microenvironment. The results of immune response to the cellularized extracellular matrices obtained in this project have led to two articles recently uh, published in this year in International Journal of Molecular Science and in Journal of Fungi. On the other hand, we have evaluated the response of macrophages to graphene oxide and two types of reduced graphene oxide uh, by thermal treatment of 15 and 30 uh, minutes prepared and characterized by uh, Aveiro University. Considering uh, that macrophages play a key role in the removal of nanomaterials and uh, in the removal of biodegradation products from scaffolds, we have evaluated the intracellular incorporation of different doses of graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide 50 and 30 by macrophages using a flow cytometry and confocal and phase contrast microscopy. These results evidence that in general graphene oxide is incorporated by macrophages in greater quantity than reduced graphene oxide. The cellular uptake of nanomaterials is highly dependent on their physicochemical characteristics such as their lateral dimension, oxidation level and uh, surface functional groups. Then we evaluated different parameters related to the specific function of macrophages to know if the incorporation of these nanostructures induce oxidative stress and promote a possible inflammatory response. This figure uh, shows uh, that uh, graphene oxide uh, treatment induce a significant increase of uh, macrophage intracellular reactive oxygen spaces at uh, all uh, doses obtaining the most uh, pronounced uh, effect with uh, 5 microgram per milliliter. However, reduced graphene oxide produced an effect uh, less prominent than uh, graphene oxide. These results demonstrate that the graphene oxide reduction process by thermal treatment at 200 degrees improves its biocompatibility by decreasing its ability to induce oxidative stress. These facts uh, were more evident with uh, uh, 5 micrograms per uh, milliliter of these nanostructures. We have also evaluated the effects uh, produced by graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide on the polarization of macrophages towards uh, the M1 uh, pro-inflammatory phenotype through the expression of CD80 and the secretion of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines as TNF and interleukin-6 uh, uh, after uh, graphene oxides and reduced graphene oxides uptake. Results evidence a significant increase in the CD80 expression with the highest uh, dose. However, uh, this effect is not observed after exposition uh, to uh, reduce uh, graphene oxide 15 and 30. The TNF and interleukin levels released by macrophages after exposition to graphene oxide increase uh, in a dose-dependent uh, manner. 
However, the lower levels are uh, obtained after exposition to reduce graphene uh, 15 and reduce graphene 30. All these results have allowed us to obtain important uh, conclusions. The graphene oxide reduction by thermal treatment results in a decrease of both oxidative stress and pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion by macrophages, significantly improving its biocompatibility and its potential for the preparation of 3D scaffolds able to trigger in the appropriate immune response for tissue regeneration. These uh, results of immune response to graphene-derived uh, nanostructures obtained in this project have led to a third article recently published in International Journal of Molecular Science. The results shown evidence that the extracellular matrices evaluated in this project and the reduced graphene oxide are biocompatible biomaterials complementary and suitable for the preparation of 3D scaffolds in order to promote neural repair after spinal cord injury. Thanks to all the participants in this NeuroSteam spinal workshop, the results shown have been possible thanks to the collaboration of the UCM group, constituted by Rosalia Diez, Maria Jose Feito, Monica Cicuendez, and uh, Laura Casarubios, and me, uh, and the collaboration with the uh, group of uh, Tecnalia and the University of Aveiro within this uh, NeuroSteam Spinal Project, a project involving different organizations with which we are currently collaborating. Thanks to all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Teresa, uh, for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, now we have one uh, time for, for questions, more or less uh, five, uh, seven minutes. Uh, so uh, in the chat, there is not a question at the moment. I suppose that you prefer to, to do by means of the micro orally. So uh, uh, what uh, you want, uh, please uh, start with your questions. I don't know if someone has uh, some question. Uh, so uh, I have a question for Laura Valerini. Uh, that is, uh, Laura, uh, what is your impression about the, what is your experience with the concentration of the carbon nanotubes? That means if you increase your, your concentration of carbon nanotubes, what is the influence that you have seen in the in the neuro behavior. Oh, that's, this is Paula. Sorry, uh, Laura just sent me a message because she had other um, other meetings now, so she's already uh, not present. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, she could not <laughs> attend until, until the, the end of the presentation. Um, okay. May I ask? The, the attendees from outside, so the, that were not panelists, they, they can also uh, speak using the the chat, or they can they can um, or they can communicate the external um, uh, attendees. Uh, external attendees, uh, I think they want if they want uh, to do some question. They can do it, and I ask to I ask to them to, to do it if they have some questions. Yeah, it will be interesting to have uh, outside uh, people from outside of the project to ask us questions. Mm -hmm. I think they are all shy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just a little question. So I'm Gasconi Barreta, one of the invited speakers in the workshop. So 
So I'm curious about uh, the anti-inflammatory phenotype of these uh, stacellar matrix uh, derived products, like, like uh, the cellular side of tissue. So I guess there are other talks coming in where we where they will describe possibly the the compatibility of these scaffolds in spinal cord injury models. Possibly talk of Daniela Silva coming uh, later on. So I'm just curious whether you had any any result of um, improvement of a spinal cord injury uh, disability by transplanting these scaffolds, these decellularized uh, Yeah, Thank you. Can I see Peyton Asen? I don't know. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. If I understand properly, uh, you asked for the anti-inflammatory effect of the extracellular matrix. Um, we didn't show. Uh, we didn't do any assess to for the anti-inflammatory capacity, but uh, theoretically, the, there are many materials that uh, uh, have these properties. So, uh, of course, it's very important, and we are we are uh, going to check in future. I don't think if uh, you have us any more things about the matrix. Sorry. Yeah, because I think it's really interesting. I mean, uh, the characterization you are making about uh, the properties of these materials. So I guess uh, yeah, it could be a, a, just um, watching the talk of Teresa saying that about this, uh, these um, materials may have uh, like uh, immune regulatory activities that could be very useful to uh, I mean to treat the spinal cord injuries. So well, I. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the rest of the of the talks to to see more results about it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Our results uh, are obtained in vitro with macrophages in contact with uh, all these matrices, and in these in vitro assays we obtain a. Uh, uh, um, uh, response uh, not in inflammatory uh, with these uh, in vitro models. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, if you have not uh, more questions, I think we can go to the next uh, speaker. Uh, that is James Philip, Professor of Regenerative Medicine and Co-Director of the Center of Nerve Engineering uh, from Aveiro. Um, moment, I'm going to give you the, the control. Please, you have the control, Philip. James, sorry, when do you want? Okay, hopefully you can, can you see my screen and my pointer? And yes, uh, yes okay. and you are University of College of London. Uh, sorry for the mistake. <laughs> so, um, so, so thank you for the introduction and thank you very much to the organisers for, for giving me the, the chance to speak today. I think what you're doing in, in the consortium is, is, is really exciting and um, and, and I think you've got some really nice approaches, um, and I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing how it progresses. Yeah. Um, my plan today is, is just to talk a little bit about um, some nervous system tissue engineering that we've been doing in London. Um, we've tended to take quite different approaches, um, but um, some, of, some of the problems are the same. And my idea is to just kind of talk through some of the scenarios that, that we've been looking at, um, because they may help um, help, help to uh, to influence or, or, or to inform some of the approaches that you might take. Um, so let's see if I can make this work. Um, so we actually do tissue engineering to various different parts of the nervous system. Um, 
Now, the spinal cord um, we're hearing lots about today, um, but we also do some work on the brain and we also do some work on the peripheral nerves. And I'm actually going to start off by talking a little bit about some peripheral nerve tissue engineering. Um, I know that's not the fo focus of the consortium, but in my lab, that's probably the most translational thing we've done. It's the thing we've, we're have we really trying to move forwards towards the clinic. Um, so I felt like that would be a useful story to tell, first of all. Um, so for people that are not particularly familiar with peripheral nerves, um, peripheral neurons, they, the cell body is inside or next to the spinal cord. Um, and here you can see a, a peripheral neuron that's, that, that would be running all, all the way down a limb to a, to a muscle. When you cut through peripheral neurons, um, they, they can survive and they are actually quite good at regenerating um, given the right environment. What happens is the Schwann cells, the glial cells of the peripheral nerves, switch to being a really repair supportive phenotype. And those Schwann cells then form tracts that will guide regenerating neuronal sprouts um, all the way to the target. So when people say, oh, peripheral nerves, they can regenerate naturally, um, it's true. The problem is they only do it when they're in this really nice environment and there's continuity. And the reality of the situation is actually when a nerve has been cut, then um, it doesn't matter how nice this environment is for regeneration. It doesn't matter what capacity these upstream neurons have to regenerate. Um, if you've got a gap and you haven't got continuity, then you get no regeneration. So currently what a, a surgeon will attempt to do if a patient has a nerve injury is the first thing um, that he or she will do is try and just directly um, reconnect the nerves. Now that can work quite well. It restores, um, it re removes any gap and allows regeneration to go from the upstream part to the downstream part. The problem is it's unlikely and, and, and difficult that um, in many cases you can just do a nice neat repair like this. A lot of the time there's a gap and at the moment the clinical gold standard is to use a nerve autograft where a bit of nerve from elsewhere in the patient is used to bridge the gap. And this causes problems, it causes extra um, nerve damage, um, there's limited availability. Um, so along with lots of other people we were looking at how to make an artificial version of the nerve autograft. So we developed something we called engineered neural tissue, NGNT. This is effectively aligned therapeutic cells in a collagen matrix, which supports and guides regeneration. So it can be put into a nerve gap um, in the place of a nerve autograft. <clears throat> now, when we first started doing this um, back in, in 2013, we had quite a, a clunky approach to building our engineered tissue. We'd effectively we had a way of, of, of engineering alignment in Schwann cells in a collagen gel um, and then stabilizing them to make a sheet of aligned cellular material, which we then had to roll up to create a cylinder. And all of this took about, about 24 hours. Um, so what we've done more, <clears throat> more recently is we've developed a new approach, which was published last year, um, where effectively we do, we can make, here you can see the little engineered scaffolds. So these are still, aligned cells inside an aligned collagen gel, but we kind of make them through a, an aspiration extrusion process using this apparatus, um, which really just sort of makes them in a very short time. So as soon as you've mixed your cells with your gel and, and let it set, you can then make these stabilized um, engineered constructs um, in about five or 10 minutes, which is a big advantage. As well as um, kind of looking at our manufacturing process um, over the course of that kind of eight years, we've also gone on a bit of a journey to work out what the cells should be. So our early stage um, validation work, we, we just used rat Schwann cells in our rat model. Um, and again, this is 2013. And since then, we've been trying to identify sources of cells that would actually be therapeutically relevant. So the first things we looked at were the idea of using autologous cells. Um, so we used adipose-derived stem cells, dental pulp stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, differentiated them to be Schwann cells, um, and then tried building our engineered tissue using those. And it, it worked reasonably well in the animal models, but we, we struggled with the, the clinical reality of using these, mainly because of the time taken to harvest someone's tissue, isolate the stem cells, differentiate the stem cells, build the engineered tissue. Nerves need to be repaired straight away. So having that kind of delay is actually um, counterproductive. Um, 
so more recently, um, we've been really interested in the idea of, of, of having a kind of an off-the-shelf um, allogeneic cell type um, so that we could effectively build our engineered tissue and have its stores um, in the hospitals ready for instant implantation and, and rapid nerve repair. Um, so that's our most kind of recent idea, the idea of off-the-shelf allogeneic stem cells. We teamed up with a company called Reneuron, who had clinical grade human neural stem cells, which have been genetically modified um, so that they're um, conditionally immortalized, um, which means that they can only really divide in the presence of a synthetic compound, which is good because you can drive their expansion in culture. But as soon as they're implanted, they can no longer divide, which makes them quite safe um, because the, the risk of, of tumorigenesis and this kind of thing is massively reduced. Um, so we took those cells and we didn't turn them into Schwann cells. We kind of differentiated them a little bit. Um, and we've done some in vivo testing um, in athymic nude rats because this is another issue. And, and, and actually one of the, the talks earlier was, was touching on some of this. Um, we, be, because of the, the immune response, it actually makes it quite hard to be developing human cellular therapies using animal models. Um, so we've had to use athymic nude rats for this. Um, and we've kind of done some work using uh, lo long gap um, repairs. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. Um, it was published just a few weeks ago. If you're interested, please take a look. Um, for me, the highlight is this figure, which shows that um, the compound muscle action potential. So this is the re re restoration of electrophysiological function um, in our engineered tissue repairs is the same as in the autografts. Um, and you don't get it with empty tubes. And this is just a positive control with some, um, with some rat Schwann cells. Um, and we looked at this in, in two different downstream muscles, the gastrocnemius and the tibialis anterior muscle. Um, we also did lots of histology and that kind of thing, which is in the paper if you're interested. Um, but in summary, that's kind of worked quite well. Um, and now we're looking towards the commercial and clinical translation. That's our current focus. This kind of engineered tissue where you're combining materials with, with cells, um, these would be advanced therapy medicinal products, ATMPs. They need to be made under GMP conditions. Um, you need to have an optimal product design and do the appropriate preclinical testing to support reg regulatory approval and a first in human trial. So hopefully this is the kind of future direction of the things from your consortium too. Um, we, ra rather than having um, a kind of a, a network of academic groups. We've had to uh, um, actually spin out our own company. You, you guys are really well set up with your industry partners, um, but we've actually had to form our own company here in London called Glearline. Um, and Glearline are now kind of taking this forward and, and trying to bring in, in funding. Um, so we've had funding from, from some VC type sources and innovate um, sources of, of kind of that, that support companies rather than support academics, which is quite useful. Um, so that's moving forward in a kind of um, a commercial spin-out direction. At the same time, in my academic lab, um, we're, we're really kind of looking at how to push the technology further. Um, so different cell types using induced pluripotent stem cells, embryonic stem cells, endothelial cells, and, and gene-modified cells to see if we can really make this better. Like I said, the cell site we used, we picked because it was kind of off the shelf, um, clinically approved for other things. It doesn't make it the perfect cell. I'd really like to make some really good cells for this. Um, we're also looking at, at better designs, particularly using mathematical modeling to tell us how to arrange our cells within our and, and our biomaterials. Um, we're also looking at biomechanics, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment, and how we can combine these sorts of advanced therapies with drug therapies to really enhance the effects. And alongside that, we've also been um, working a lot with, with our patient and clinical partners to come up with better outcome measures um, and to engage with patients in so we can really do clinical trials that will be able to detect things that are that are important for patients. It's quite difficult to measure these things and do kind of properly randomized trials unless you have really good outcome measures. So we're working on that too. <clears throat> so in the in the final part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about central nervous system damage um, and how we've been thinking about treating this using tissue engineering. And I'm just going to give you a flavor of three different areas. Um, one of them is, is spinal cord injury, which um, is, is highly relevant for the workshop today. Um, and a, a lot of people here will be 
far, have far better expertise than me in spinal cord um, therapies. Um, we, we did a review um, a, a couple of years ago now, um, which was really looking at what was happening in terms of clinical trials using cell therapies for spinal cord. And it was quite clear you could kind of see um, you know, every few years a new cell therapy comes along and starts to take off and moves through into clinical trials. Um, in most of these cases, um, really what people are doing is they're, is they're just injecting some cells in a suspension. And what happens when you do that is a lot of the cells will just die. A lot of the cells will be cleared from the area and a very small proportion of cells actually remains and can have some therapeutic benefit. Um, so what we've been doing is, is asking whether if we deliver our cells in a biomaterial, can we actually improve retention and survival of the therapeutic cells? Perhaps that means they work better. Perhaps it means you don't need so many. Um, now, this is very preliminary data from a, a PhD student um, um, who, who's recently finished, Richard, um, where he was, he was kind of comparing putting in olfactory and sheathing cells, either in fibrin or in collagen. So these are both protein hydrogels. Um, and it, it kind of um, looks like the, the fibrin option was, was giving better function, slightly better function in our, in our rat model. The rat model we use is a very mild spinal cord injury. Um, so it's, it's a, a cervical level um, partial dorsal resection. So we just cut a little wedge of tissue out um, and, and the animals lose, lose function in one fall in. Um, and then what we can do is we can test out our material just into that lesion area. So it's, it's, a, it's a very mild injury where spinal cord is concerned. Um, the other thing we were quite interested in looking at is, is the glial response to these um, and the retention. So the cells were GFP positive and we could see that in the fibrin, we're getting much better retention of cells than in the collagen. Um, and we're also um, seeing a, a better astrocyte response with the fibrin. Um, in that, that it was it was a lesser GFAP response. Um, so that's kind of still a work in progress for us, but I wanted to mention it because it, it's, it's the kind of thing we're interested in at the moment. Um, one of the key points in Richard's project was actually identifying biomaterials to use in the spinal cord based on their biomechanical properties. I think this is something that's really important and is sometimes neglected. If you're going to implant a material into a really delicate, soft environment like the spinal cord, it's really important that that material really matches the stiffness of the cord. The trouble is it's quite hard to measure stiffness of very soft things. Um, so we, we developed a, a technique, um, dynamic mechanical analysis, which is quite good for just slightly, slightly deforming very soft materials within their elastic range. And of course, the rate at which you deform viscoelastic materials um, has an effect on their stiffness because um, for, for people that, that know about the kind of mechanical properties, um, these are viscoelastic hydrogels um, and they become uh, stiffer or softer depending on how fast you deform them. So the way dynamic mechanical analysis works is you kind of get a stiffness reading um, that's different for different um, rates of strain, which is which here is frequency on this graph. So this is what spinal cord looks like when you squash it. Um, and this is what collagen gels are like, different concentrations of, of collagen. This is what fibrin gels are like, different concentrations of fibrin. Um, so really the, the purpose of this figure was to try and match exactly which formulation of material gave the best biomechanical interface with the spinal cord tissue. Um, and we also did some more work. So this, this paper actually, if anyone's interested in this, also looks at brain tissue. Um, where, where we also analyze that and try to benchmark some materials um, to brain tissue. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is brain tissue. So um, <clears throat> we've had a project that's run for a few years now where we're interested in, in modeling traumatic brain injury. Um, firstly, in vitro. So this is actually a mechanical impactor that's used um, in, in mice. And you can see it's being used here in a cell culture. So effectively, what we did here is we built a, a 3D in vitro model using um, central nervous system cells, astrocytes, and we then hit them with the impactor and you could see the astrocyte response develop um, over the days following injury. So this is quite a good way of, of looking at kind of mechanical injury and then testing out potential therapies all in vitro um, before you move on to the animal models. Um, and I'd, I'd really encourage people to consider the use, particularly of, of the soft 
um, hydrogel-based 3D in vitro models for testing out things before you move to your animal models. Um, having said that, we have now moved to an animal model for this. Um, and here we were actually testing out using um, decellularized um, dura, which was then um, digested and then made into a hydrogel. And we could either combine that um, with um, therapeutic cells. These are the same neural stem cells I mentioned earlier, um, or have the cells and the ECM on their own. So, so this is just a, a, an early look at an ongoing project. We haven't finished the analysis of this. And it really looks like um, certainly with, with, with some of the um, functional outcomes, um, we see a big deficit with traumatic brain injury and we rescue that just with injection of either material or cells or a combination of both. Of both. So this is an ongoing project um, and that's kind of, we're literally still analyzing the histology for it um, at the moment, but there's some early um, functional outcome for you. Um, this is the final thing I want to mention. Um, we're quite interested um, in the idea of treating Parkinson's disease. Um, now there's some other groups around who have been doing cell transplantation for that. Um, and that's, that's really good. But again, they're always just injecting the cells in a suspension. So we've been looking at trying to encapsulate the cells um, in a material. And we decided for, for this purpose, the best material to use was actually alginate. Um, and what we've been doing is, is encapsulating these um, IPS derived dopaminergic neurons in an alginate hydrogel. Um, and the idea of that is, is actually quite a long lived implant. So it's not like a temporary scaffold. For this, we want these transplanted cells to remain um, and be protected for years. Okay, so alginate is quite a good thing to use for that. We match the stiffness quite carefully um, and we then decorated it with um, immunosuppressant drugs. Um, the idea being um, that what we can do is we can really aid the integration and avoid the kind of rejection of this. At the moment, people who get stem cell treatments for Parkinson's disease in the clinical trials, they're all being immunosuppressed. And it'd be quite nice not to have to immunosuppress the whole patient. So we're exploring the idea of local immunosuppression. So I tried to move through that quite, quite rapidly just to give you a flavor of the thought, sorts of things that we're doing. Um, in the, in the hope that it will generate some discussion, but also, you know, potential collaborations. I'm always on the lookout for that kind of thing. Um, so really, this is what I've told you about. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the, the various funding sources. And importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the, the, the extended list of collaborators and the team in the lab. So this is kind of the current lab team down here. These are some of the people who contributed to the work I presented who now have moved on. Um, and really, we're, we're very multidisciplinary, very translational, very collaborative. So if anyone ever wants to, to come and work with us in London, do please let me know. I'll stop there. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, James. Uh, next speaker is uh, Daniela. Uh, Daniela uh, is a PhD student from the University of Aveiro. Uh, please, uh, Daniela, when you want, to have the control. Thank you. Uh, you can see my presentation? No? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. now. Yes. Okay. 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 So, hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me also? Yes, yes, no problem. Yes. Okay, okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, first, it is a pleasure to be talking the first uh, Medicine Spinal Workshop, first of many, I hope. My name is Daniela Silva. I'm a PhD student at the University of Aveiro in Portugal. I'm working on a Medicine Spinal project that, as you know, aims to develop a treatment for spinal cord injury. Although, because although different strategies have been tested until today, there's no effective cure or therapy for such life saving condition. So, in this, in this presentation, I'm going to show you a preliminary preliminary work uh, on scaffolds based on the cellularized extracellular matrix and graphene oxide as a potential route to repair the spinal cord injury. And I will start with a, a little introduction on spinal cord injury. So the spinal cord is considered a highway for communication between the brain and the rest of our body. So a disruption to the spinal cord neural network can severely affect the overall function of the nervous system since it has very limited regeneration ability. An injury to the spinal cord refers to the spinal cord itself 
or specific nerves and can be caused by, dra by trauma, diseases or degeneration. The symptom symptomatology depends on the local of the injury and its severity. The injury can be partial and, and complete. In this last one, when, when there's a complete, um, a complete damage, uh, um, blocking all sides and causing cell death to the stop of blood supply or by triggering apoptosis, but also it develops a glial scar formation. This formation happens when a side creates a scar or radiation to prevent infection. However, the inflammatory process and the release molecules inhibit the regeneration of the nerve cells, making it difficult for the tissue to, to regenerate. Every year, uh, up to half a million people suffer a spinal cord injury, which translates in calculus costs for the patient and for society. Professor Paula already spoke about the scope of the project, so I promise I'll try to be brief. So basically, uh, our group aims to design the common generation of electronic neural interfaces for electrical neuromodulation to treat the spinal cord injury. Uh, and, uh, and do with this by combining an electrical conductive platform coupled in an electrical simulation system. To do so, Neurosteam Spinal are exploring two building blocks that depose extracellular matrix and graphene based materials, namely reduced graphene oxide. They are being combined in, under, different, under different formats and different techniques, such as freeze drying, electro spinning, and additive manufacturing. They are assessing the site compatibility and performance using different cell types such as macrophages, neurons, astrocytes, to single out the best performance strategy and finally evaluate their systemic and long-term efficacy in an in vivo model. So one building block is a protein reach at the post at the cell rise to saving matrix. Already talked in this workshop by the task of um, uh, by Technalia. Uh, the other building block is graphene. Graphene has been popular in biomedical engineering due to its excellent biological, optical, electronic, and thermal properties. Uh, in simple terms, graphene is a one atom thick layer of carbon atoms arranged in an hexagonal lattice. And this two dimensional material has a set of unique and outstanding properties. As well as being the tiniest, strongest, and lightest known material, graphene is flexible and extremely electrical and thermally conductive which makes it an attractive material for many applications. In fact, graphene can be further from sterilized and already used in biomedical applications such as drug delivery, wound healing, uh, cancer treatments, biosensors, uh, <laughs> implants, and has the, uh, the possibility to modulate cell behavior. But why a graphene used uh, for the spinal cord injury? Because of these properties, uh, and due to the fact that graphene makes uh, soft materials, materials closer to the native tissue, plus he has, he has electroconductivity and uh, has nanometrical features, allowing neurons to grow nicely on graphene-based materials. And actually, seminal work from Maria Concepcion Serrano, who is one of the various speakers in this workshop and her team show that 3D forms without any further biological functionaliza functionalization when implanted for four months, that is the longer period that geoforms have been implanted for spinal cord injury, at least the best of my knowledge, uh, they shown to be fully vascularized with myelinated excitatory actions, uh, with reduced perilesion damage, and without alter the red behavior or induce any toxicity in major organs. But what a scaffold needs to have to be uh, uh, so it can use for spinal cord. Uh, and it must comply with specific criteria on, uh, depending on target tissue. So for the spinal cord injury, uh, a scaffold must breach the distal and proximal stands of the injured, uh, injured spinal cord by feeding in the lesion cavity. Uh, restricting glial cell formation and guiding axonal regrowth. However, the challenge to the engineering scaffold for the spinal cord injury is the need to uh, meet several specifications. It must have a 3D uh, architecture, biochemical and biomechanical features, has to be biodegradable by maintaining its structural integrity for several months and reproducible with a cost effective process. So, and having this in account, I'm going to show you are two, two of the neurostim spinal scaffold strategies for the spinal cord injury, namely the foams and hydrogels. And I will start with the foams. 
Uh, in this strategy, before being incorporated within the scaffold, uh, we've reduced thermal with the graphene oxide. So now we show some characterization data, starting with the morphology of graphene oxide and with this graphene oxide and, its, and the analysis of its reduction. Then I'm going to show you the production of the, um, the scaffold itself, followed by the characterization of the scaffold per se, namely the cross-linking analysis, the mechanical properties, and the overall scaffold morphology. So we started by analyzing the graphene oxide and with this graphene oxide by atomic force microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. The graphene oxide presents uh, dispersed single flakes and after reduction exhibits some agglomeration. In the AFEM, we can see some edge-to-edge -edge arrangement and in the TAM, we can see some face-to-face -face aggregation. Then we anal analyze the, um, the reduction of a green, uh, graphene oxide by X-ray powder diffraction and X-ray photorelating spectroscopy. The X-ray analysis reveals that upon reduction, the characteristic peak of GO decreases drastically and uh, presents a shift to the higher to theta. Uh, so the thermal reduction for 30 minutes at tw uh, 12 degrees to 100 degrees was enough to reduce the graphene oxide reduction. Additionally, the presence of exposed peaks indicate an incomplete reduction, which is most suitable for biomedical applications as fully reduced graphene oxide loses ability to disperse. Complementary to XRD, the XP XPS analysis shows that the three com oxygenated components and their GO are smaller than those on the graphene oxide, proving a significant deoxygena deoxygenation during thermal reduction. Now regarding the scaffold preparation, this strategy involves the dissolution of the matrix in acetic acid, then a reduced graphene oxide is incorporated, sunicated, to be later frozen going through a solid liquid separation to be finally freeze-dried. And given the successful reduction process, we could prepare formulations with different ratios of uh, reduced graphene oxide and we could load the scaffolds with up to 50% of reduced graphene oxide. Continued characterization data, and due to the need of a cross-linking to stabilize mechanical properties and degradation, we use EDC, a coupling agent com commonly used to cross-linking collagen, and in this case may also allow the covalent conjugation between RGO and the matrix. <laughs> the cross-linking efficiency was evaluated by a collimatic assay um, using TNB assay, and by the results, <laughs> sorry, um, we can see that the cross linking with ADC is significantly effective for the scaffolds with up to 30% of our GO. The mechanical properties were determined through compression tests. From the st stress and strain curve, the young models was calculated in an elastic region. And as the RGO is incorporated, uh, replacing part of the matrix, the young, mod the young models decreases, varying from 1.5 and the 50% content of RGO to 4.2 kilopascal and the matrix only, which, which is a favorable range uh, for neuronal growth. And then the porosity and pore size of all formulations were determined and determined from 3D morphometric analysis of reconstructed projections obtained by micro CT and by scan electron microscopy. And it appears that RGO incorporation has little effect on scaffold morphology. Here we have the matrix and then the 50% of RGO, 30% of RGO, and 50% of RGO. Uh, and all have interconnected porosity with pore ranges for 54 to 126 micrometers. To further study, uh, at the further study and characterize our, our scaffolds, they were seeded with an aeropetelial cell line NE4C. They, they were established from the cervical vesicles of nine days old mouse embryos, and we studied their adhesion, evaluated their differentiation, and synaptogenesis on our scaffolds. On the cellular response regarding adhesion, any for cell were cultured by fourth on our scaffolds, and we see here the matrix only and the different formulations and different contents of RGO. Here happens that some morphology data in same image, and you can see the cells are there and proliferate on all compositions. And according to extent time points in further cultures, the compositions with less reduced graphene oxide facilitate cells additions, while the proliferation rate remains the same. 
The NIDL scaffold for spinal cord injury should support differentiation towards neurons instead of astrocytes and should suppress the glial cell proliferation and activation. So the different neuronal differentiation was evaluated and the TDF cultures, the cell were marked uh, by uh, four neurons with the beta tubulina 3 and with the uh, and for astrocytes with the GFAP. And by the lack of GFAP expression and explicit tubulina 1, can we see in, in uh, green? We can uh, infer the compositions with more with this graphene oxide favor this differentiation towards neurons, having bigger narrow spheres with thicker and longer axons. Synaptogenes, that in conjunction with the differentiation, are a crucial aspect of the nervous system. Uh, so, the preliminary results on the different scaffolds and different formulations, uh, they show that the that may suggest, may suggest that all scaffold formulations have possibly function neurons, translating into a functional neural network. And we see this by the presence and the expression of synaptophysine in all formulations. So, the final conclusions of our, of our work so far on the forms are that the matrix translates into microenvironment favor for addition and proliferation of NE4C cells. Plus, incorporation with this graphene oxide favors the neuronal differentiation. So, putting them together, they show potential on scaffolds to repair the spinal cord injury. So, next, the best performing scaffolds, the ones who are a good compromise between immune response and neuronal differentiation, will be coupled with an electrical stimulation device and will be tested under different schemes of 3D electrical stimulation, varying, for example, the dose of electrical stimulant and stimulation time. Now I'm going to show you the second uh, scaffold strategy that we'll be doing uh, in a neurostim spinal, namely the hydrogels. And regarding hydrogels and as unmodified neighbor materials like control of their properties such as degradation, stiffness and porosity, which influence cell behavior, a matriculation process was performed. In this process, the matrix was dissolved in a carbonated bicarbonate uh, buffer, which leads to a higher degree of substitution while decreasing the amount of metacrylic and hydride required. And with the presence of a initiator that we choose lab, because among other reasons, it, it is, uh, its range is invisible light, we can uh, make the material float across linkable while maintaining the biological advantage of the native matrix. So about the metallurgy, the metacolated matrix was later dissolved in DPBS and then graphene oxide is incorporated. Then, and when the solution exposure to the visible light, we shield our, our, our hydrogels. With this technique, we clothe the hydrogels with different uh, contents of graphene oxide and we, could, and we went to up to 10%, although this is only a 5% picture, we went to 10% of GBMs incorporation. And uh, some notes on composite hydrogels. The young model, uh, we can tune the young modulus of the composite hydrogels by varying the photopolarization time, and we went from five seconds, five seconds to 200 sec seconds. Other important factor is the conductivity. So we perform the reduction of the green oxide afterwards with different approaches. Now the in vitro mm -hmm. studies and further characterization are ongoing. And now I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you our bio bioprinter in action. Hopefully. Uh, maybe I need to, okay. I will let the video run. Uh, besides the deposit the cell hydrogel matrix, we are exploring other proprietary biomaterials of the consortium, namely gel and gum from stem matters. And we saw in this video was the gel and gum based inks being printed while suspended in a printing bed. And we use the free form reversible embedded of suspended hydrogel technique, also known as fresh. Additionally, the cross-linking of printing gel and gum based inks occurs while the printing bed dissolves. 
and in this way we could obtain uh, these printed porous hydrogels with suitable dimensions for spinal cord lesions. And you can see here an hydrogel with, uh, with 2% of graphene oxide incorporation mm -hmm. with 64 layers with the filaments under uh, 100 micrometers. And I will leave you with this in mind. And I'll finish my presentation by acknowledging all the nearest team spinal team and thank the audience for the attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniela. Uh, now, next speaker is Antti, uh, that is a member of the consortium too, that is an assistant researcher at uh, Ford and uh, leads the DG Engineering Regenerative uh, Group. So, uh, Andy, uh, when you want, you have the control. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andy, I think that you uh, have to open your micro. Uh, you have uh, you have to open the micro, Andy. Uh, if you want, I want to try to to open you. Okay, is it okay now? Because I was mute for the organizers. Yes, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, now yes. perfect. And you wish your so, presentation. Okay, you see my presentation or not? Is it okay? It's okay. It's okay. When you want. Okay. Okay. So, good afternoon. I am Ansi Ranella from uh, Forth at uh, Heraklion at Crete in Greece. And I am, uh, it is my pleasure to be part of uh, the Neurosteam Spinal Project. And of course, I'm, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, my talk today relates uh, to the development of uh, functional networks on ADCM scaffolds uh, for spinal cord injuries. Uh, this work is part of uh, the Neurosteam Spinal Project. And uh, Lina Papadimitriou and Kanelina Karali are the postdoctoral researchers that are responsible uh, uh, for planning and carry out the experiment, experiments. Uh, for the preparation of um, the reports and general for the um, uh, responsi our responsibilities in this uh, project. So, uh, I'm afraid that uh, for my introduction, I will repeat a lot of the information that has been already been mentioned today. Uh, so, so we can see here that um, the initial mechanical trauma to the spinal cord initiates a secondary injury cascade that is characterized in the acute phase by edema, hemorrhage, ischemia, inflammatory cell infiltration, uh, the release of cytotoxic uh, products and cell death. This uh, secondary, uh, secondary injury leads to necrosis, and or apoptosis of neurons and glial cells. And finally, all these um, events uh, can lead to demyelination and the loss of a neural uh, surface. In the subacute uh, phase, uh, further ischemia occurs owing uh, to ongoing edema, vessel thrombosis, and uh, vasospasm. Vasospasm. And finally, in the intermediate and chronic phases, uh, axons continue to de de degenerate and uh, the astroglial scar matures to become a potent inhibitor of uh, regeneration. Uh, for all these reasons, uh, spinal cord injury uh, leads uh, to spinal cavitary lesions, extensive tissue loss, axonal degeneration, and finally, 
devastating lifelong motor and sensor dysfunction. Uh, it has already mentioned uh, that biomaterials uh, that mimic the three-dimensional structure, the fibrous uh, morphology, and the distinctive uh, microstructure uh, uh, properties of the extracellular matrix can enable and facilitate the regeneration and the repair, repair of damaged neural tissues and uh, circuits. Uh, it's also mentioned that um, a promising technique for the production of uh, natural scaffolds that uh, resembles structural and biochemical uh, cues of native tissue uh, is uh, the tissue decellularization technique in which ECM is obtained by cell remover. Here is a schematic uh, presentation of the poten potential uh, tissue sources um, for the preparation of ECM-based uh, biomaterials. And uh, uh, we have already seen this um, diagram and uh, you have already heard that the uh, that, um, NeuroSTEM uh, project uh, proposed to develop a neural tissue engineered scaffold using graphene related sorry graphene related uh, uh, materials um, uh, supported in a protein rich uh, uh, decellularized uh, uh, matrix and uh, this ADCF scaffolds should present um, electrical, chemical, mechanical, and topographic features able to preserve neural uh, uh, cell survivor and enhance a neural progenitor cell differentiation with the ultimate goal of mimicking the morphology of a native um, spinal cord. For uh, these studies, Sorry. For these studies, embryonic um, uh, neural progenitor cells, primary embryonic neural progenitor cells, the ENPCs, and the neural stem cell line NE4C are utilized. The results that I'll um, present to you today they were performed using hydrate solid uh, forms without RGO, as well as with RGO in different proportions. Upon uh, the end of the cultivation on, um, on these uh, scaffolds, scanning electron and confocal microscopy analysis were performed uh, to evaluate the adhesion proliferation and differentiation of neural stem cells on these scaffolds. Uh, I, will, I will quickly go through uh, the study of uh, the morphological. Sorry. So, okay. I will uh, quickly go through the study of the morphological characteristics of the scaffolds and the evaluation of the proliferation of uh, neural stem cells. Uh, and uh, I will focus mainly on the study of the, uh, of the differentiation of uh, neural stem cells. And I will also refer uh, to the development of a functional uh, neuronal uh, network on these uh, scaffolds. I can, can you see my presentation because something happened and I lost. So no, we see your presentation, eh, Andy? Okay. Uh, I so I will go on with the morphological examination of um, uh, the um, neural stem cells in the in the scaffolds, and uh, you can see here. Uh, the same images of primary mouse um, uh, stems, uh, neural stem cells grown on uh, all the five uh, 
compositions of uh, ADCM uh, uh, scaffolds. So, after three days of culture, the cells have, um, have adhered and remained spherical. Uh, similar uh, results, similar, similar morphology is shown by any 4 C cells in uh, the same scaffolds, in the scaffolds uh, without RGO and in scaffolds with 15% of RGO and in uh, the scaffolds with 30 and 50% of uh, RGO. So, uh, in order to, to, um, to, to, deter, to determine uh, the penetration of the stem cells within uh, these scaffolds, the scaffolds were cryopreserved and after three days of culture, uh, serial cryosections of the foams were acquired. These are some uh, indicative images of uh, these cryosections from different levels stained with a nuclear marker. Uh, these, uh, these images uh, demonstrate that neural stem cells are successfully growing and penetrating uh, inside uh, the, um, the scaffolds. So I will go on uh, quickly with the evaluation of uh, the proliferation of the neural stem cells. BRDUSA used uh, to identify the proliferating cells. The number of cells that incorporated uh, BRDU was evaluated and uh, we can uh, see here that uh, there was a significant increase of the spontaneous differentiation of prim primary neural stem cells um, uh, compared to the um, uh, to the control the 2D sub substrates. After five days of cultivation, there was a significant uh, increase of uh, proliferation, uh, mainly in the scaffolds with 50% uh, um, of uh, RGO. So I will continue with the evaluation of the differentiation of neural stem cells in ADCM GO scaffolds and I will start with the evaluation of spontaneous differentiation of primary neural stem cells and uh, when we are talking about spontaneous uh, differentiation we mean the study of the differentiation uh, in the absence of uh, retinoic acid or any, any dif differentiation media. So the number of uh, TUJ positive cells uh, was assessed, uh, indicating the potential of a spontaneous neuronal differentiation of these uh, cultures. We can see here that RGO Uh, Anti, uh, your phone is closed. Your microphone is uh, closed. The EGCM scaffolds, the number of GFAP uh, positive cells was assessed to indicate the potential of spontaneous astrocytic differentiation of ENTCs. So we can see here that scaffolds without or with uh, less RGO increase spontaneous differentiation towards two astrocytes. astrocytes. Uh, the number of PTGFR alpha um, positive cells was assessed in order to indicate the potential of spontaneous differentiation. Uh, of spontaneous oligodendroglial uh, differentiation. It was demonstrated that uh, the 3D environments uh, of all compositions significantly increases uh, the spontaneous oligodendroglial uh, differentiation when compared to the control to the 
uh, cultures. However, no differences um, were observed between the different compositions. Now, uh, immunofluorescence and confocal microscopy experiments demonstrated the, the successfully induced differentiation of any foci cells into neuronal and glial uh, cells. Uh, in uh, in RG, uh, in GO free scaffolds and also in scaffolds with 50% of um, RGO. And here, neuronal cells uh, positive for TUJ1 marker can be seen in green, where GFAP uh, positive cells, the glial cells, in red. The same experiments and were repeated in scaffolds with 30 and 50% of um, RGO. And um, uh, what we can claim is that the presence of RGO induced the neuronal differentiation. So I will finish with uh, uh, the evaluation of uh, uh, synaptic genesis in the ADCMGO scaffolds. And uh, for this experiment, I, I, I didn't mention that the differentiation of neural stem cells towards neurons was induced uh, using a retinoid acid. So, in this uh, induced uh, neuronal uh, induced uh, neuronal differentiation experiments, we can see that um, no significant difference was observed be between the uh, EDCM scaffolds and 2D conditions in the number of uh, neurons. Uh, however, uh, synaptogenesis was only observed in ADCM scaffolds, given that these PUJ1 positive cells uh, were um, shown also to express uh, uh, synaptophysin, uh, which is um, a membrane glycoprotein that occurs in presynaptic uh, vesicles of neurons and uh, synaptophysin is uh, used as a marker of uh, synaptogenesis. These findings indicate that uh, synaptogenesis has occurred in ADM scaffolds and uh, functional neurons could be present in, uh, in these scaffolds while synaptophysin expression was absent uh, into the uh, synaptophysin also is also expressed in the body and along the axons of the NE4C cells, cultured uh, in all five compositions, uh, but seem to be increased in scaffolds with more RGO. And in these experiments, uh, the pattern of synaptophysin um, expression also follows the pattern of the UGA, uh, of the UGA1 expression. So, to conclude, we can say that uh, neural stem cells adhere, spread, and proliferate on all ADCM scaffolds. The compositions with more RGO favor spontaneous neuronal differentiation. The composition with more RGO, the same uh, scaffolds, do not support spontaneous astrocytic differentiation. Uh, all composition favors spontaneous um, neuronal stem cell differentiation toward the OPC. Uh, the scaffolds with more RGO favor induced uh, differentiation towards neurons. And uh, we can finally say that these encouraging results so far 
indicate the ability of um, uh, of the proposed scaffolds to induce the development of functional neural, neural network allowing the initiation of the in vivo studies. So I would like to thank uh, thanks uh, first uh, um, the, the neurons, uh, the, the, the um, collaborators, uh, the, our colleagues in uh, neural steam spinal project. I would like to thank the member of uh, my group and of course all of you for your attentions and I'll be glad to answer to your questions. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now we have finished the lot of, uh, of the speakers and uh, we are in the time of uh, questions. So uh, if some of you have some, some questions, please be free to, to start uh, in the chat, uh, no questions in this moment. Uh, I think probably people prefer to, to do orally the question. So um, please, you can raise with your hand. And I think no question by the moment. Uh, uh, okay, I have in the between, uh, if people is, uh, is thinking the question, I have a question for James Philip. Uh, that is, uh, James, what do you think about your, concerning your experience? about the shape of the implants, uh, what is the more appropriate shape in your opinion or what are the differences between a shape that was a, a porous a scaffold, dense scaffold or an hydrogen? What do you think about the influence of the shape in the neurons behavior? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I think, it, I think for every, every situation you probably need to to have an appropriate shape for what you're trying to actually treat. Um, so I don't think there's one answer for that. I think it, I think it depends on each different scenario. Um, mm -hmm. was, was there a specific one you were, you were asking about? I was thinking the spinal cord injury. Uh, mm. It's uh, for this specific uh, situation. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the things we've been thinking about a lot with the spinal cord actually is um, is what is kind of how you get it in. <laughs> so when you talk to the our, our clinical colleagues and you say, right, you know, what what kind of size and shape would you like this to be? Um, they say, well, well, actually, it depends on the injury. But if you've got a, a transection or something like that, then then something that's spinal cord shape. But actually, if what you've got is a cavity, which is deep inside the cord, they don't really want to cut through the healthy tissue that may have survived around the edge. So actually, they want something that can be injected in. Um, so, so I think some versatility is, is probably the answer because it will depend on the, on the type of injury. Um, you know, because if it's, if it's just been crushed and there's, a, and there's a lesion on the inside, it could be that there's some intact tissue on the outside people would be quite reluctant to, to cut through to implant something. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if someone more I have some, some question. Pablo, may I? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, my question or comment is also to, to James. Thank you very much for our inspiring communications. Um, you mentioned a lot of uh, details, very important also, and several inputs for our project. I would like to, um, you, you, you mentioned the tuning the material mechanical properties of the, the spinal cord. Um, and you mentioned that you are applying some, uh, I, I didn't understood very well, uh, forgive me. So you apply a kind of mechanical stimulation for to the 3D scaffolds? Yeah, it's, I, I went over it very quickly. 
um, it, it's really interesting but gets quite technical because for, for mechanical testing people have traditionally um, and tissue engineers of course have traditionally worked on much harder tissue than we work on so traditionally they'll, they'll clamp something and stretch it um, or they'll just squash something now clamping and stretching very soft materials is, is challenging um, but also useful but compressing the problem if you use if you're compressing things like hydrogels um, if you compress them much then quite often you're deforming them permanently water comes out and you actually change their stiffness as you know because you're measuring them so the the approach we were using was was if you just deform it very slightly still within its mechanical sorry within its elastic range so you're not squeezing it enough to change its shape but just slightly indenting um, then that's that's quite good because um, it means that with hydrogels and with very soft tissues you can get quite an accurate reading but the problem with doing that is that the stiffness is different depending on whether you do that slowly or quickly so you kind of have to do a range of, of different rates and that's that's why the graphs i was showing actually instead of having one stiffness value um, it has a, a different stiffness value for a, for a different um, rate of deformation and because we do repeated rates um, it becomes a frequency um, but it's it's quite tricky to do but i feel like it, it's it's kind of um, a new way of of, of really trying to get to this because a lot of tr tissue engineering traditionally has has really been looking at material where you can you know you can treat it quite quite firmly but we found that with with, with nerves and particularly with the central nervous system it's such a difficult mm -hmm. thing it's almost more like a fluid you can i mean some people use like a rheometer and just treat it like a viscous fluid instead of a, a soft solid and you could kind of argue that maybe it should be treated as a as a viscous fluid rather than a soft solid um yeah it's it's a it's a challenging thing to do but i think it's really good that that people are, are thinking about it because i feel like that's one of the things that that can go wrong when you when you implant things that are not well matched mechanically um then then you can cause some extra damage and uh, for sure i will look into the paper but uh, did you i, I didn't uh, um... Now, if you, you do you did this with the um, cell inside the cell culture with cells or just you just studied the material no, we've, we've not done that so it, so it's just um just the, the material or um uh, or, or tissue just kind of in in the lab on a in a machine so um you can you, you probably should do it in a cell culture environment in in fluid but we've we've not got to that stage yet okay thank you so much Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, if someone has more questions, so we ask to, to the assistants if they want to do, to do one question, they can do it. Only open your micro and your camera if you want. So, uh, if there is no more questions, uh, we will continue uh, after lunch break that will be at 12 Spanish time. And for this, I uh, we will ask you not to not to close your application. You only uh, put in, we will put in standby. And in this way, when you come back uh, after lunch, you it's only to, to continue with the application. So uh, thank you for all people, even because uh, we are just in, in time in our schedule. So all the speakers have been very seriously with the time. Of the of the intervention, so I'm uh, very very grateful. And uh, okay, I think this is uh, this is all from our side uh, from our side, and we will continue in uh, in after the lunch at thank two o'clock. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
and her talk is titled Cool Graphic Materials from ne Neural Regeneration. So, Conchi, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with us today. And so, go ahead, please. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you very much. And, and of course, thank you to the Neurosteam uh, Spinal Project uh, members for giving me the opportunity to be here today and present. Uh, uh, now, I think you can. Yes, good. Yes, mm -hmm. can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, this probably I can put in here. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so uh, is this bothering? Can you see my image in here? Should I make this smaller? I don't know if no, it, 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 it's, 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 no it's, it's fine. You see the screen. Okay. Fine, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much, and uh, particularly to Paula and Olaf for giving me the opportunity of being here today and uh, present some of our modest contribution to the field, uh, trying to bring insights into the capacity of graphene materials to prompt neural regeneration, uh, particularly uh, our findings at the rat injury spinal cord. So, uh, before starting with the science, just a few words on the institution that I work uh, for, that is the Spanish National Research Council. It was founded in 1939 and it contains over 10,000 workers. From those, uh, over, over 3,000 are scientists. And uh, even when we are only 6% of the scientists working in Spain, we produce about 20% of the uh, total production uh, of uh, scientific contributions in the country. Uh, the SIC has uh, 122 research centers distributed all around the country and, in, and even outside, as in Rome, and some special facilities for particular um, uh, scientific uh, purposes. Uh, I belong to the Institute of Material Science Madrid, that is the largest research center devoted to material science and physics. Okay, so let's move to a brief journey through the literature. Some of the um, uh, the state-of-the-art uh, contributions have been already discussed today, earlier this morning. Uh, just a few words on graphene, uh, because most of you are really familiarized with this material and it's one of the uh, main pillars of the uh, scaffolds that are being fabricated in the Neurosteam Spinal Project. So graphene, it was first isolated by Game and Novosolov in 2004, and uh, all that early work uh, deserved the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010. Uh, this material has extraordinary properties. Some of them are summarized in here in this slide. And because of this, it has been explored for a wide range of applications, including electronic devices, solar cells, electrochemistry, but also biomedicine. What is driving scientists in biomedicine with this material? So we believe that the nanometric features of graphene and its derivatives and the outstanding properties of these materials could prompt a specific biological responses. And uh, the literature so far is demonstrating that is true. So a uh, graphene has uh, this monolayer of carbon atoms uh, uh, with sp2 hybridization has a lot of different de derivatives and from those graphene oxide is probably the most relevant ones in which uh, there are defects on this sp2 uh, hybridized a uh, monolayer of carbon atoms uh, with some oxygen containing groups pending uh, here and there. So a uh, graphene oxide shares with uh, graphene uh, extraordinary mechanical properties and features at the nano scale, but because of these oxygen containing groups, it decreases the thermal conductivity, uh, the thermal conductivity and the electrical conductivity, although it gains on hydrophilicity and versatility for functionalization that are two critical parameters when we talk about biological scenarios. We particularly work with reduced graphene oxide, as uh, you also do in uh, your project, as being is uh, an attractive material uh, in the middle of graphene and graphene oxide with a very interesting properties. 
Graphene and uh, its derivatives are already in the market. There are uh, several products that contain uh, this type of materials, particularly because of three reasons, the lightweight, the mechanical properties and the electrical conductivity. Just to, to mention uh, one particular contribution, the sensors that are being incorporated in these materials because it provides a, a higher precision, lower cost, portability. Some of these contributions comes from a, a company in San Diego and another one is uh, from colleagues in uh, Barcelona, in the uh, ICMT. It's also it's been also incorporated in in the recent times uh, in all uh, different approaches to to combat uh, the COVID pandemic as masks and also filters for air purifier. So let's move to the particular effects of these materials on neural elements. So first, uh, let's sustain two-dimensional systems in vitro. And in these systems, uh, the variety of graphene-based materials have proved that they can stimulate neuronal differentiation from uh, neural uh, progenitors. They can also boost neuride outgrowth and uh, induce neural differentiation from other types of progenitor cells that are no, not particularly compromised with the neural phenotype as mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, they can also control um, cell motility and the interaction uh, among neurons, uh, and uh, particularly by using electrical stimulation procedures. They can also stimulate electrical signaling as you can see here, by the increase in the frequency of postsynaptic uh, currents, the spontaneous postsynaptic currents, and also the amplitude of those. Uh, the increased neuronal firing by tuning the distribution of extracellular ions. This yes, a nice contribution is by Professor Valerini, who, is, who was giving a, a, a talk earlier this morning in this workshop, and also reshape in vitro uh, the functioning of neuronal uh, synapses. When we move to three-dimensional systems, the, the amount of work that has been published uh, gets uh, dramatically reduced, but there are some insights that are very interesting for us, uh, as these scaffolds containing uh, nanofibers, uh, polycaprolactone and graphene oxide, that are able to promote oligodendrocyte di differentiation. Uh, Antti was uh, also earlier today talking about the, this important feature in the context of neuroregeneration, and uh, three-dimensional forms for a uh, neuroprogenitor cells growth of this uh, type of materials. Uh, finally, they have been also proved to be uh, printed in 3D and uh, even uh, been able to uh, constitute as implants in a cadaver, in a human cadaver. Um, when they are implanted as nanomaterials in the central nervous system, they are able to support neurogenesis when they are located here in the uh, uh, olfactory valve, that is a particular region that retains neurogenesis in the adult, and also reduce inflammation and promote the migration of progenitors when they are implanted in the brain, as you can see here, how the progenitor cells uh, follow this material and, and go and migrate through. So what is our particular modest contribution to this field? We have been working with three types uh, of uh, substrates of reduced graphene oxide. The first and simpler, uh, of course, the, the way to start was th two-dimensional thin films, just as a thin coating on top of glass cover lips uh, obtained by spin coating, as you can see here, with a thickness of about 10 nanometers. Then we move um, to three-dimensional porous scaffolds with either a, a hierarchical uh, channel-like structure or uh, just random porosity fabricated by freeze casting uh, with a porosity of about 80% and uh, exclusively composed of reduced graphene oxide. There is no other polymers or biological molecules that are constituting the material. And then this compact three-dimensional microfibers fabrica fabricated by a hydrothermal treatment uh, with a diameter of about 100 to 150 uh, microns. And here you can see the physical chemical characterization of all these three materials and um, this is actually very relevant because uh, graphene-based materials diverse a lot and it's very important to characterize them uh, very uh, deeply to make sure that uh, the characteristics of the material that we have and how to compare that with the literature. So our first uh, step for the neural regeneration evaluation was the study in vitro with embryonic neuroprogenitor cells isolated from rat embryos. Uh, and here you can see representative scanning electron microscopy images at seven days and 14 days. And you can see we obtain highly dense and interconnected neural cultures on top of these two-dimensional substrates. We also characterize the phenotype of these cells, proving that they were a glial cells staining red and 
red uh, neuron uh, neurons stain in blue, as, uh, sorry, in green, as you can see here, with the cell nucleus stain in, um, in blue. Uh, we also proved the existence of active synapses by the staining of the presynaptic protein synaptophysin in green in here in green in here in this picture. Uh, we then move to the these positive findings move us to the three-dimensional systems uh, again with the same, same subtype and we evaluated first the viability in these three-dimensional structures and um, with just a conventional life that is uh, staining uh, in green you can see live cells so a lot of cells alive uh, on uh, going in these structures up to 14 days Again, we characterize the phenotype of them by staining neurons in green in here and in red you can see glial cells with different markers on the bottom also characterizing them. <clears throat> Again, highly viable, dense and interconnected cultures uh, where we prove to you uh, see uh, active synapses as you can see here by the expression of synaptophysis. Uh, regarding the microfibers, we did three different coatings, polylysing, uh, encadering by absorption and encadering by covalent bonding, and then seeded these cells again. As you can see, all the microfibers were uh, completely covered by these neural cells in vitro after 14 days. Uh, again, we did immunofluorescence um, studies to label them and to identify the specific phenotype and also the presence of the synapses, as you can see in these uh, images. We also did, in collaboration with Professor Teresa Portoles, who, who was also participating earlier today with a very nice talk um, in the in this workshop, uh, the interaction of macrophages with these uh, microfibers. As you can see here, uh, the cells were growing on the surface of these microfibers, and what we observed was a significant uh, reduction in the proliferation and an increase in the uh, expression of the reactive oxygen species in these microphages without an affectation of the viability of the cells. Uh, we also uh, mm -hmm. evidence the existence mm -hmm. of both M1-like and M2-like microphages grow growing on top of this uh, microfibers. We then move to the in vivo studies. Uh, in particular, uh, our model is a right emit section at C6. As you can see here, we remove this half of the spinal cord located at this particular uh, segment. In here, you see an intraoperatory image where we are placing this uh, three-dimensional reduced graphene oxide scaffold. And in here, we have the intact emit cord on the left side. And this is a, a picture of one of our uh, uh, rats uh, and evaluated the responses at 10 days, 30 days, and 120 days. So at the subacute state phase, so 10 days post injury, we investigated many different uh, markers related to neural components, inflammation, uh, fibroglial uh, scar formation, and uh, of course blood vessels, but uh, angiogenesis in the structure. As you can see, on top we can find the control, and then the rats that received the injury, and the ones that uh, after receiving the injury uh, were uh, receiving one of uh, these three dimensions. Scaffolds. So when we quantified these uh, markers, basically what we found is that there were no significant or very dramatic differences in the general inflammatory responses that were expected from the injury itself. And uh, also we uh, proved that the scaffold was highly colonized, so the cells like the interior of the scaffold and enter through the very, very interior areas, and that there were no systemic issues of toxicity at this early time point. We then move to a, a longer time point, early chronic phase, 30 days post injury. Again, we look at the different markers that I mentioned before. And again, what we found was were may, minor, if any, differences with respect to just, just the injury group. So the major differences were cause of uh, the, the, the injury itself. And then we uh, look more in detail into the uh, inflammatory uh, reactions that were taking place at the scaffold. And we found two important features indicating an immunomodulatory effect of the scaffold. First was a significant reduction, as you can see here, on the amount of activated EVA1 cells, so activated microglia. And then a significant reduction also in CD86 uh, positive cells that are uh, M1-like microphages. Um, we also observe uh, right in the interior areas of our scaffolds that uh, new blood vessels started to grow, as you can see here, positive for Riga 1 and laminin. So there were vasculogenesis, angiogenesis, sorry, inside our scaffolds. And also the growth of neurites, new neurites positive for tubulin and neurofilaments inside in the very inside 
side of uh, our materials. So our material had a filling effect important because prevented cavities, but also induced this immunomodulatory behavior that I mentioned, uh, sustaining angiogenesis and neuronal growth. Um, by using transmission electron microscopy, we could also observe that cells closely interacted with our the walls of our scaffolds. As you can see here, these very nice macrophages trying to degrade or uh, disassemble these walls of uh, our materials. We then move to the late chronic, 120 days post injury, and uh, by using resonance uh, magnetic imaging, the first thing that we observe, as you can see here, this is the injury group, the same as here in a different section. And in this particular one, you can see the scaffold implanted in the right hemicore. So the first thing, also we also look to perlesional areas, areas that were not at the very, very injury site, but a little bit far away, one to three centimeters away from the injury site. And the first, uh, um, observation by, by magnetic uh, resonance imaging was that the lesion in the in the rats receiving our scaffolds became apparently became larger just because of the presence of the existence of the own uh, scaffold inside the injury. Uh, and this was, as you can appreciate here, the own scaffold itself, the difference uh, in, in volume. But what was a very important uh, finding was that uh, the number and the maximal area of the perlesional damage area, so the, the damage damage that was away, a, far, a little bit far away from the injury itself was significantly reduced, both in number and, and the area, uh, in those rats that were receiving our scaffold. And that was not because of an uh, um, alteration of the intensity of the signal that was uh, similar in both groups. We then uh, focus on the mechanical properties, as it has been also widely mentioned today, the relevance of the mechanical properties as neural tissues as soft tissues by using atomic force microscopy and in collaboration with Professor Ricardo Garcia here at the Institute of Material Science, we observed that our scaffolds were uh, soft, so around one kilopascal in Jens modulus, that they increase a little bit their mechanical properties after four months of implantation because of the decolonization by cells and proteins of the extracellular matrix. But what was very uh, important was the left any core, so the other left side of the core where we didn't place the scaffold was similar in mechanical properties to the normal neural tissue of the spinal cord, meaning that we did not transmit any friction or mechanical tension to the other hemicord, as you can see here. And the interface was, as expected, softer. We also prove uh, the existence of uh, vascular structures mm -hmm. inside our scaffold, and you can see here and quantify them, and also that some of them were functional, as proved here by the presence of one of these red blood cells, as you can uh, appreciate with transmission electron microscopy. We also observe, as we did uh, after one month of implantation, after four, there were also neurites inside our scaffolds, but the amount, the quantity was much higher. As you can see here, as positive for beta-3 and this neurofilament cone, content, a uh, cocktail, uh, sorry, and most of them were proved to be b 2 positive, so excitatory neurites growing, colonizing our three-dimensional structure. And what was also very important is that there were no alteration of this neurotransmitter, the, the neurites with uh, these neurotransmitters, so uh, also glutamate, uh, but uh, dopamine and serotonin in the proximities of the injury. And also very relevant was to find that uh, some of these neurites were actually myelinated, as you can see here by this very nice uh, coding of myelin. We also got some insights into the decoration of these structures. Over time, as you can appreciate in here, there was a significant opening of the wall that was uh, linked to a decrease in the intensity of the black color, as we uh, semi-quantitatively uh, uh, quantified in here uh, in this graph. And the thickness was increasing because of this disassembly of the structure. Uh, in here, just a nice uh, detailed pictures of uh, some particular portions of these scaffolds being internalized by the cells around the scaffold. And finally, we look, as before, to the systemic toxicity for major organs that are somehow related to the elimination of toxics in the body. 
kidneys and liver, particularly important, also the spleen and the lung. Uh, that is a very sensitive uh, organ for nanomaterials. As you can see, there were no significant differences with respect to the injury uh, group that did not receive our scaffold. So uh, <clears throat> this is all the science that I wanted to share with you today. I would like to finalize by thanking, of course, our labs, Manbio and Liner, uh, at the Institute of Material Science and, and, and the National Hospital for Paraplegics, to Ana Dominguez Estervenaya San Angor González, that has been responsible for performing most of the work that I presented today, to my colleague Elisa Lopez, who is driving this journey uh, with me since 2014, to our all our collaborators, um, uh, particularly Teresa and Paula that are assisting the workshop today and of course to the funding sources that make possible all this. So thank you very much. Uh, I, will please, uh, I will be pleased to take any questions uh, if you may have later today. Okay, thank you Conti for sharing with us the interesting results about the graphene-based materials for neural generation. So we now we will move uh, to next talk. Uh, Guillermo Gil and Patricia Martins, uh, both PhD students for the University of Aveiro, are going to present their work around electrical stimulation and a scaffold electrical characterization. So we are going to start with, with Guillermo. Uh, yes. Okay, I think I, you can share your screen, please. Okay, good. Uh, are you seeing my presentation now? Yes, good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Guillermo Gil. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Aveiro and I'm working for the Nearest Team Spinal Project. And today, me and my colleague Patricia Martins are going to do a presentation on electrical stimulation and the scaffold electrical characterization. So this is the outline of my part of the presentation. First, I'm going to do a little introduction and explain what is electrical uh, stimulation, then talk about the differing, different uh, delivering methods and materials to deliver the stimulation itself. Then I'm going to discuss the effects of electrical stimulation on human cells. And because the nursing spinal uh, project focuses on the spinal cord injury, I will briefly talk about electrical stimulation for this condition. My colleague uh, Patricia Martins will then uh, start her part of the presentation. So uh, the essence of electrical stimulation is to motivate the flow of ions in the cells, which is usually achieved with the application of uh, an electrical current through electrodes. This technique is, common, is a common modality used in physical therapy, effective for many purposes, such as increasing uh, muscle strength, correction of structural deformities on our bodies, pain control, uh, wood healing, and so forth. Uh, terminology associated with electrical uh, stimulation is specified by the by therapeutic uh, application. A, uh, accurate vocabulary dictates that uh, most devices are transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulators because they, uh, they work transcutaneously through surface electrodes to excite the nerves. However, we also use other nomenclatures such as electrical muscle stimulation to get the muscles to contract and uh, functional electrical stimulation aimed at maintaining function and motor skills, uh, which I will talk about later. Uh, so, regarding the delivering methods, uh, electrical stimulation can be accomplished using three possible approaches, direct coupling, capacit capacitive coupling, and in the inductive coupling. Uh, in the, the direct coupling, the ionic motion is motivated by the application of a voltage, current, or a charge signal to a pair of electrodes that directly interact with the cells. This is the most used method for high-density neural implants because it is the most compliant for circuit integration. So, as an advantage, these stimulators exceed in providing the electrical energy to the application site, which consequently leads to more consistent results. On the other hand, since they require a surgical procedure, there is always the risk of infections and discomforting patients. Continuing on direct coupling, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we to, stem, to stimulate the cells, we must use a voltage charge or a current signal. Uh, usually, uh, current and charge are the most common solutions for integrated circuit design, 
because they are based on simple bidirectional uh, current mirrors. These techniques are often more desirable since we have more control over the current uh, or charge transfer to the cells. On the other hand, uh, voltage mode stimulation does not allow direct control over the charge transfer to the cells. So in order to compensate this uh, for this issue, we, we require additional circuitry just to limit the current on the device, which will complicate the overall design of the system. Uh, regarding uh, the capacity Capacitive coupling, there is no direct contact with the cells. The ionic motion is achieved through the influence of uh, an applied electrical field. These devices use uh, two metallic pads, the anode and the cathode, placed on top of the region of interest in a parallel configuration, similar to a capacitor. The generator, uh, usually attached to the skin, is used to cause an electrical field between both plates that promotes tissue regeneration. Although these devices do not come with the disadvantage, disadvantage of invasive systems, they can cause some discomfort to patients, some skin irritation and battery replacement concerns. Lastly, for inducting uh, coupling, there is also no direct contact with the cells. For this technique, the ionic motion is achieved through the influence of uh, an applied magnetic field instead of an electrical one. Uh, for this system, inductive coupling systems, uh, they use uh, magnetic coils together with a pulse generator to create a magnetic field and uh, consequently induce an electrical field on the stimulation area. The main advantages of these uh, systems, just as for the capacitive devices, is that they have no uh, constraints of in invasive uh, implants. On the other hand, they tend to produce inconsistent results and some discomfort to patients due to the weight of the whole device. So, uh, as a bridge to deliver electrical stimulation to the cells, scaffolds and electrodes are commonly used. However, they need to meet some requirements such as by compatibility and electrochemical performance. Throughout the years, several materials have been used to develop scaffolds. For example, metallic uh, biomaterials such as gold and platinum have high mechanical strength, good conductivity and biocompatibility. However, the ones that are not classified as novel methods can easily oxidize and present a weak, a weak corros corrosion uh, resistance. So conducting polymers are also possible candidates, although for long-term systems, the lamination of the material may reduce the effectiveness of the electrodes. Lastly, carbon-based materials uh, such as graphene have good electrical properties. Despite some of these materials having some uh, biocompatibility issues, they can easily be modified to eliminate such defects. Uh, when it comes to the benefits of electrical stimulation, several studies have shown that it has a significant effects on cell alignment, migration, differentiation and proliferation, techniques that uh, can be extremely useful in uh, regener regenerative medicine. For example, the direction of cell alignment changes gradually as the direction of the stimulation uh, changes. Some types of cells are aligned perpendicularly to the direction of the electrical field just to minimize the field gradient across, across the cell, uh, while others are aligned in parallel since the electrical stimulation causes rearrangement of the cell cytoskeleton. <laughs> For example, what concerns uh, cell migration, uh, electrical stimulation causes uh, electrotaxis, which is the directional migration of the cells in response to the stimuli. Of course, uh, the stimulation will, <clears throat> the effects of the stimulation will differ depending on the cells, the intensity of the stimulation and its duration. Uh, however, it has, it has also been shown that uh, some cell type, some cell lines of the same type can also have different responses to the same type of stimuli. Lastly, as you all know, uh, spinal cord injury is one of the most catastrophic injuries of the nervous system. Uh, that was already talked about uh, during <coughs> the, the presentation this morning, resulting in a permanent neurologic defect. Uh, despite current, current advancements in medicine uh, allowed for better life expectancy of these patients, they are still, uh, they are still functional, limited by their condition, and some must rely on others for manage their day-to-day -day living. Uh, the functional loss seen in spinal cord injury is due to the interruption of electrical impulses through the effective neurons. Uh, 
Although complete recovery of this condition is still not possible, several researchers are attempting to achieve uh, full re regeneration and repair the interruption of the nerve impulses. Uh, one uh, of the approaches used for, for this, uh, directed towards regaining functional recovery, involves the use of electrical stimulation through neuroprosthetic devices. This technique, named functional electrical stimulation, involves uh, the use of electrical current to promote regeneration of the neuromuscular system and gain back some lost functions. Uh, advancements in this technology allow this technique to provide more mobility to spinal cord in injury patients and at the same time stimulate disabled organs affected by the spinal injury, such as, for example, assistance uh, in respiration or weather activity. I will, I con I will now um, thank you for your time and pass the word for my colleague, uh, Patricia. Guilherme was talking about um the kind of stimulation that we can have in, in the project. In our project, we are going to use the direct uh, coupling. It means that um, we are going to stimulate directly the scaffold through electrodes. My presentation will be about that. Basically, I will try to characterize the scaffold itself and um, make sure that the characteristics are appropriate to, to the project. I'm going to start with the stimulation methods, going to the setup and then showing the results we achieved with the primer scaffolds that we got. So for the characterization, you use electro electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, you use 50 millivolts and went uh, between one and one megahertz. And we used also cyclic voltometry between um, 0 0.2 volts and minus 0 0.2 volts with four different scans and five cycle, uh, cycles uh, for each scan. I'm only going to show one of the, the scan rates and one of the cycles because they are all consistent. And the slower scan is what really matters for the project because we are going to apply lower low frequency. So this is the measurement setup. Basically, we have the scaffold. Um, there is going to be um, painted since the process. After the process that we are using, we have a dried scaffold. So we decided to paint with silver ink creating the electrodes and attached PT wires. This is all made before the, 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 before the scaffolds are hydrated, and then we are going to hydrate them and measure with the methods that I showed you before. So we could have, we started doing this characterization, um, having in account the composition, but the problem is that there are a lot of different materials that we can use, and we were showing two different patterns. The patterns for the smooth walls and semi-open porosity and the pattern for the nanofiber walls and open porosity. So we decide to basically to show two examples because they follow these patterns and we decide to analyze what is better for and what happens in each of the cases. I'm going to start with the smooth walls and semi-open porosity scaffolds. They are small. They are much smaller than the next ones that I'm going to show you. And we have to have this in consideration when we are going to compare. So at this stage, they are dry. So now we would paint them on top and on bottom and we would attach the PT wires and then we would hydrate them. These are the results we achieve. Uh, those photos that you saw were C, um, CIM photos and it basically the scaffold and the porosity um, of the scaffold. And here we can see on the vote plot the magnitude of the impedance that we that we measured. Basically, we see that the ones with reduced graphene oxide have um, better conductivity at higher frequencies. But for this project, we want to apply lower frequencies. So in this case, we see that reduced graphene oxide don't improve the conductivity at all. Actually, we have less conductivity. When I say don't improve, it doesn't mean that it's bad. We need to consider the kind of conductivity that we want, and I'll talk more about this in the conclusions. We also have the Nyquist plots that we can see that there are evident differences, especially if you want to um, characterize the system, it's, uh, the scaffold as a system. Somehow it's possible to have an equivalent uh, circuit for both the scaffolds with graphene and the scaffolds without graphene, and we are looking forward to to see how it happens and to characterize the, these kind of scaffolds. Uh, 
Basically, we can see more or less the same in the CV plot. We see that the ones without graphene oxide can, can provide much more current than the ones in the middle that are the ones without reduced graphene oxide. Sorry, that are the ones with reduced graphene oxide. If we go to the nanofibers and open porosity, they are much bigger. Um, because of the method, not that we cannot make them smaller, but in this case, they were much bigger. Uh, we can see an example with reduced graphene oxide and examples without reduced graphene oxide and the PT wires are always attached and they were dried before, those were hydrated already. So we can see that in this case, and that's why we divided in these two groups uh, based on the, on the porosity of the material, um, in this example, we see that we only added 2.5% of reduced graphene oxide, but it seems that the conductivity improves a lot in this type of scaffolds. Um, if we compare both, we can see that even this, the first ones being much smaller, we can see that at low frequencies, the 2.5 reduced graphene oxide that we, that we are adding in the, in the open porosity ones, that are the green ones, uh, we see that the resistivity is much lower. So basically, we can conclude that reduced graphene oxide did not have a consistent effect for all the frequencies, but for the higher frequencies, it really increased the conductivity. Also, we know, and Daniela uh, were talking about this before, that the reduced graphene oxide uh, can make the material softer. So it means that the, the results that we are seeing can be directly related with the reduced graphene oxide, but can also be direct, indirect related with the reduced graphene oxide in the sense that the reduced graphene oxide can be increasing the, the conductivity, but also it's, it has an indirect effect. It means that by making it softer, it can uh, make, them, make the electrodes closer to each other. So it can be an effect that we are considering that is a reduction uh, it did it as a reduction of the impedance, but actually it's just a reduction of the distance. Or eventually it can open the, the pores and make it more conductive because of the medium or any other reason that we are not considering. So every time I say that it's improving the conductivity, I mean that the RGO has the effect of doing it, but not directly through itself. Because of relating to that, we are not sure. So these tests um, have, been, have been made in parallel with the scaffold material optimization, and we are looking forward for more tests like these, but with the, with the final materials. So I want me and Guilherme want to thank the audience, and we are looking forward for your questions. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, uh, I would like to, to thank the organization committee for for organizing such uh, a nice workshop. Uh, my name is Mafalda Gautella, I'm from STEM Matters, and today, together with my colleague, David, uh, will be uh, presenting a work entitled Biofunctionalization of Gel and Gel Materials for Neural Stem Cell Delivery. Sorry. So to start with, I uh, will be just presenting, doing the quick overview of the, of the company STEM Matters. So STEM Matters started as a spin-off from academia and is currently an independent biotechnology company, company developed, developing breakthrough biomaterials as implantable medical devices. Uh, to do so, we are developing novel products based on an innovative biomaterial platform with potential application in multiple clinical areas. We are a vertically integrated company with resources and competences that address all product development stages from exploratory research and development up to uh, GMP production, including regulatory expertise in complex medical products and devices. Uh, furthermore, we are a fully audited and certified uh, company according to applicable standards. So to talk about the Neurostim Spinal Project, um, I'm First, need to explain the spinal cord injury um, uh, pathology and the composition of the extracellular uh, matrix. Uh, the, according to the World Health Organization, every year around the world, between 250,000 to 500,000 people suffer a spinal cord injury. 
So this results in sensory loss, paralysis, and bowel or bladder dysfunction. And up to date, there are no effective uh, spinal cord injury therapy that can entirely restore neuromotor deficits. And hence, projects such as the Neurostim Spinal Project are of utmost importance. If you look at the image to your left, where you have the composition of the extracellular matrix of an uninjured spinal cord, you can see that this is quite an organized structure where you have mostly, uh, where you have diverse molecules, but uh, mostly hyaluronin, laminin, collagen, and fibronectin. These allow for the normal functioning of the, the axons, for example. And what happens when you have a spinal cord injury is that this structure is completely disrupted. And instead of uh, regenerating into the, let's say, the native tissue, what you have is the development of a scar tissue, as, it, as you can see in image C, that actually hinders the, the normal regeneration of the axons and the neural conduit. So when we are looking for a, a therapy, it is important to look into these molecules, namely collagen, fibronectin, and laminin, which, as I previously mentioned, are present in the extracellular matrix of the spinal cord and are associated with wound healing and regeneration. And thus, this will be the primary focus for therapeutic purposes and will impact on the therapeutic outcome of the developed therapies. Uh, as for the Neurostim Spinal Project, and this is something that you, you've, you, you have seen um, earlier, uh, the, the initial approach was an extracellular matrix-based approach, and the idea was to combine this with uh, graphene oxide, and we were able to attain neural differentiation and biocompatibility. But when testing the stability in simulated cerebral spinal fluid, we saw some um, some limitations, and this is where gel and gum comes in. Gel and gum is a negatively charged polysaccharide and is currently FDA approved and commonly applied in food and pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this has been this this biomaterial has been emerging uh, for applications in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine and actually here at STEM Matters this is uh, our our uh, base biomaterial we, we develop a lot of gel and gum based products and gel and gum is quite attractive and one of the reasons for it is due to its formulation versatility it allows to be it is, is it is possible to be formulated into hydrogel which is actually what we work with most but also scaffolds and microparticles Furthermore, it, it, it is possible to be processed by different techniques such as printing, freeze drying, or casting. And this is especially interesting for the Neurostim Spinal Project because it allows to have not only randomly organized structures, as is, as it is the case of, for example, the casting or the freeze drying, but also um, organized structures and aligned structures, let's say, like uh, when using the the 3D printing. I will give now the word to to the video. I don't know. I don't know if this is uh, if this is possible. Or, or the, otherwise, I can also present and Mufalo can skip the slides. It's also possible. Have you got you have you also have you got the presentation also if you want we can move the or or maybe i uh, maybe it's easier if i follow it oh no yeah okay we, or we can switch it i also have the presentation here I'll open have it. you got also the ppt uh, i can uh, do this the give control of keyboard and mouse with andy right can i do this you can move it if you want yes then it's better i can continue on and then she has the presentation on, on her screen okay so as Mafalda was uh, saying, um, indeed then uh, for a biomaterial and for having a biomaterial for action uh, guidance, uh, I think we think that the best strategy is to have uh, these four topics that we, that we can uh, be sure that our biomaterial uh, can meet. Uh, these are mainly then the mechanosensing, uh, biocompatibility, sterility and stability and degradation. 
I think you have to control the video. No. <laughs> okay, me then. Um, so um, the first uh, thing to do then is to make sure, and especially for uh, regenerative medicine therapies, is to make sure that the biomaterial is uh, sterile. Uh, for these uh, stem methods, has been done a lot to try to um, sterilize the materials that we have. That, as, Mufalda, as mentioned, they are all gel, gel and gun based. Um, we have tried several different methods, and we came to the conclusion that steam sterilization is the method that doesn't affect the backbone of our biomaterial, as you can see from the NMR results uh, in, in, the, in the panel below. Um, doesn't affect as well the rheological properties, which of course will be essential and we will touch upon uh, later in the presentation. And we have assured that sterility is in fact uh, maintained with this technique. Moving forward, uh, we, we went to test the stability and degradation. And as you can see on the left side, uh, we have two panels, one uh, where the different uh, stem matters entities that have been tested uh, were uh, incubated with DM, DM uh, F12 and another situation, another condition where they have been incubated in PBS. Um, as far as you can see, and this is an assay that went until six months, there is no uh, degradation of these materials. There is a slight loss of shape of STM to B entity, uh, but overall we are able to have maintain the in vitro stability uh, over this period of six months. Uh, of course, if we, stop, if we talk about stability, it can only it cannot be only in vitro, but of course, it's also to be tested in vivo. And not only that, but also the biocompatibility, like we said in that panel on the right, on top right. And as you can as you can see on the left, uh, we have tested uh, taking uh, the uh, we have tested this in rat models in uh, subcutaneous implantation. And on the left, you can see that we are able to retrieve the hydrogels over a period of four weeks uh, and the gels still keep their shape even though they were in vivo implanted and on the right on the middle side of the, the slides you can see that we have test biocompatibility by uh, uh, comparing the reaction that these materials have uh, to a control that should elicit a immune response and a control that shouldn't elicit uh, an immune response as far as we can see there is a formation of uh, a thick uh, capsule around the gel and gum, in the first uh, image on top. Uh, there is some infiltration of material, which is a, a, a nice result because mean, it means that there is some interconnectivity going through the host to the, what we are uh, implanting. And this is quite comparable to the, con the negative control as well. Moving forward, we have tested as well uh, longer periods of, of time. This is a result that we have from six months and before it was three months. Um, again, here it seems that the chronic reaction that we have from the immune system seems to be very controlled and much less evidence as when we had the three months. And curiously, uh, you can see on the on the left that we still have this uh, infiltration <clears throat> of tissues, and the controls uh, show that actually the positive control shows a much thicker capsule formation and fibrotic tissue, um, and the, the the negative control shows that this capsule is much thicker that is comparable to what we have with our gel and gum based materials. So um, what is left basically is the mechanosensing uh, to make this whole uh, spectrum of uh, different topics to, to, that we have to meet. So moving forward, um, we have uh, gathered uh, several different articles that show that gel and gum has been uh, modified with different peptides to provide a vision, which of course will be essential uh, for the strategy that we are trying to do in here. You can also see in these uh, papers uh, that m some of them say neurite outgrowth. So that's also very attractive and interesting for us, uh, seeing that m another, more authors than, than us are also trying to provide guidance or exonal guidance as well for these materials. So follow some examples you can see here in this publication that RGD GG, so GG modified with the RGD peptide, which is part of the fibronectin and interacts with the integrins on the cells, uh, does promote uh, cell spreadness and cell adhesion in, in vitro in 1%. We have more, say, more, more articles that show this afterwards, yeah. 
Um, this one, for example, has a dual uh, modification system that provides as well a dual cross-linking. Basically, the gel and gum has been modified with metacrylic anhydrides, and this provides not only the, the different cross-linking through UV uh, photo uh, cro uh, cross-linking, but also in the in these moieties, uh, peptides can be attached via thiolene um, click chemistry reaction. On the right side, you can see that uh, both in 2D and in 3D, there is a, um, an, an increase of adhesion and of the, and, and spreading of the cells when they are exposed to these materials. Moving forward, this, like I told you, this this uh, uh, GG-based uh, gels have been as well used for uh, axonal growth uh, stimulation. Um, in the panel on the left, you can see that adding RGD enhances uh, the spreadness again of, uh, in this case, endothelial cells and uh, mesenchymal stem cells. But on the bottom part, you can see that putting a DR, uh, DRG, so a dorsal uh, root ganglion, inside of these hydrogels also promotes the uh, growth of the uh, neurites. On the right side, this has been used together. So these cells together with the, uh, the, 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 the DRG in GGRGD and has promoted, as you can see in the blue line, uh, it's promoted actually a nice outcome in terms of uh, lo locomotor uh, rating uh, for the rats that have been um, in a hemisection model that have been exposed to this or with these materials. Uh, finally, this is just another example we, that, again, uh, it promotes, again, uh, the axon, axonal growth, so we can move forward. Um, interestingly, these results actually have been already presented, and this is to mention, again, that not only the biochemical cues are of utmost importance, but also we have to take in consideration the mechanical properties that we put into our materials. And this has been presented by James Phillips uh, before, uh, which is a very interesting uh, uh, um, uh, explanation and, and an interesting experiment, sorry, that actually shows that we should match the mechanical properties, not only just the, the in this case, the modulus, but also the tangent delta, which shows the interaction, the ratio between, uh, in this case, E double prime to E uh, uh, prime. So in our biomaterials, we uh, are actually taking care of, uh, we are taking this in consideration. And what you can see here is that in STEM matters, uh, we have developed such a platform that uh, provides different uh, properties for the biomaterials that you can see in the left side with several different biomaterials with different ranges, ranging from 570 to 7,000. 100 pascal and on the right side with the tangent delta you can see as well that we are able to provide uh, materials that will have different um, ratios uh, and will have then uh, different behavior uh, in what concerns the frequency that they are exposed this then will of course be essential for compression and and all the mechanical stimuli that the spinal cord is going to feel afterwards so finally, uh, in the NeuroSteam uh, spinal project, what we aim now is to be able to modify the gel and gum with peptides. Uh, we have chosen to do like uh, to do a dual uh, modification with ICVAV and RGD. ICVAV being a peptide that will replace the lamin, uh, which is of course present in the lamin structure, and the RGD that is uh, provided. Uh, that provides also the substitution of pyronectin. Uh, as you can see in this uh, figure, our aim is to include the neurostem uh, sorry, the neurostem uh, cells um, after we modified the, uh, the gel and gum with the peptides and to provide then differentiation and axonal growth on this. Of course, this biomaterial then can be uh, used in combination with uh, what Technali has done with the solarized matrix and overall maybe provide better integration, mechanical properties and even uh, chemical cues. Finally, um, I would like to just present you uh, the team that has been involved in all of these uh, results that you have uh, uh, seen today. Uh, this is the our R&D uh, team and most of the things that have been done here uh, that, and I've shown were made from, this, uh, from these people that are very uh, uh, um, diverse uh, uh, people with different backgrounds. Um,
Thank you all for your attention. And of course, we are very glad that we are doing this workshop and also we are very uh, welcoming uh, questions if you have them. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing the great properties of the Yelangan for your application. So the last presentation of this slot will be carried out by Jose Abad Rodríguez, member of Membrane Biology and Axonal Repair Laboratory from Hospital Nacional de Paraplégicos. And uh, he's going to present his innovation related to glicans in the differentiation of neurons. Hello. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay. Can you see the my 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 uh, screen? Yes. Okay. So I have to activate my camera. Maybe yes. Now it's okay. Okay. Perfect. So okay. yeah. Okay, can can you see me uh, as well? <laughs> yes, yes. So because I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't have any any um, thumbnail from my yes, from my image. Yes. So anyway, I, I, once once I'm sure you're you're uh, you're watching me, I, I will not do anything strange. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, to everyone, and uh, first of all, I, I want to thank the organizer for this uh, workshop for their. Uh, for the kind of invitation, and um, I'm I'm uh, I'm afraid that I will not go so technological as uh, as the last uh, presenters. But uh, for me, uh, anyway, this is a pleasure uh, to tell you a little bit about the functions of uh, of glycans in the differentiation of neurons, and and you will uh, you will um, surely find that that uh, this combined with all these um, uh, biomaterial uh, technologies. Will uh, will be the maybe the solution for for spinal cord injury. So today uh, um, I'll I'll focus on how neuraminidase, uh, new three and galactins can synergize to drive uh, axon growth and regeneration. So to to begin with, um, what's the role of of this membrane neuraminidase, new three in axon growth and, and regeneration? Well. Um, New3 is a, a membrane neuraminidase that is specific for ganglia sets. And, and for those that are not uh, very familiar with, uh, with these uh, molecules, ganglia sites are uh, glycosphingolipids. You, you can see um, uh, a typical structure uh, here in the, in the bottom on the, on the right side of the slide. And um, well, this, these uh, ganglia sites are composed by um, a ceramide that, uh, that uh, anchors in the membrane of the, of the cells and a polar uh, head uh, formed by uh, different uh, rest of, of carbohydrates. Uh, among these, uh, these carbohydrates, uh, you have several, one or more um, molecules of, uh, of uh, neuraminic acid or sialic acid, as, as we prefer, that are this, uh, this uh, kind of pinkish um, uh, diamonds here. So the, the um, the sign new three can uh, hydrolyze this external uh, rest of uh, of sialic acid to to transform this uh, this complex uh, ganglia sites uh, with three or two um, uh, sialic acid in the final um, uh, product that is typically this uh, this simple uh, ganglia site called GM1 and um, and uh, yeah, uh, what's uh, what's the, the function of this in new three and GM1 in in, uh, in neuronal uh, physiology? Well, and from uh, from very early uh, stages in the neuronal uh, development, new three is expressed uh, asymmetrically to only one neuron, and, and this specifies the action phase of this neuron. Later on, uh, it uh, localizes to the distal part of the organ of young action. And it controls somehow their elimination. In fact, uh, if you uh, inhibit the new three um, activity uh, by pharmacological means or by um, uh, interference uh, RNA, uh, as, as you can see here in the, in the left part of the of the slide, uh, you preclude completely the, the action uh, growth. And uh, and um, 
uh, on the contrary, if you overexpress this, uh, this uh, new flea in, uh, in neurons, you stimulate action growth. So, so, go, uh, so action grow uh, much faster than the, than the non uh, uh, overexpression cells. Um, furthermore, we, um, we could prove that uh, new flea over, overexpression uh, stimulates the regeneration of injured actions in vitro. Uh, to do so, uh, we cultured rat uh, hippocampal uh, neurons in this kind of grid of cover strips and uh, um, uh, cut one uh, the, the growing action with a, with a thin glass uh, uh, pipette tip um, uh, operated with a micro manipulator and, uh, and leaving more or less the same um, distance, the same length of the, of the action of stamp than the rest of the of the new of the new expression in the in the in the neuron. So uh, we we went uh, to um, to uh, see what was happening 24 hours later and in control situation uh, that is uh, as as you see here in the upper panels. Uh, most of the times the, the the severe action gets blocked and many times as well. It was other neurite uh, growing as a neuron. And, but um, in, in contrast, when you uh, did this in a, a new free of expressing neurons, most of the times it was the same action that you cut that was regenerating uh, 24 hours uh, later. And uh, yeah, to, to, to see this clearly, to, to, to wrap up the, all these uh, experiments uh, in, in a scheme, you can uh, you can see uh, this uh, slide on the top. The acetamine and, and treated neurons renders 80% of the of axon blockade or other neurons growing as the new axon. And in the case of uh, new three um, uh, overexpressing uh, neurons, this acetamine rendered uh, uh, um, almost 80% of axon regeneration. So this was very, very nice, uh, very nice uh, result. Uh, it was encouraging to have these results in vitro, but of course the, 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 the main uh, question was what was going on in, in, in vivo? What, what had this to do with in, in vivo situation? So it is uh, well known that injured peripheral nervous system can regenerate and, and some, at some extent uh, can recover the, the function. While in uh, in central nervous system this is not the case. Uh, at all. Uh, this is the, of course this is the case of a spinal cord injury. So we decided in a, in a collaboration uh, work with the uh, James Fawcett Group in, in Cambridge, we measured a uh, new free activity in uh, injured sciatic nerves so in peripheral uh, nerve system versus optic nerve that, that is central nervous system. So the outcome uh, was that uh, early after sciatic nerve injury, the ratio between GM1 and GD1A was increased. You can you can see this uh, this uh, as, as this red um, uh, label here on the on, the, on this uh, on these panels. And when when we went to optic nerve, this was not absolutely the okay. case. So we didn't have this. Uh, increasing in the ratio of GM1 and GM1A. Um, so the, 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 idea, the idea arising from all this data is that uh, exogenously enhanced new free activity in injured cell nervous system would reproduce the peripheral nervous system capacity for action regeneration and, and perhaps could restore uh, nerve function and the traumatic insults. But uh, not uh, everything in nervous regeneration is about action growth, and regenerating actions should reach their correct targets uh, beyond the injury site, as you all know. Uh, and this is in order to recover uh, the, the nerve function. And uh, the question is how, how can we help in this? And uh, so this is uh, the, the time, the moment to, uh, to see what galactin one and again GM1 can do in action in growth and action. So galactins are carbohydrate binding proteins with uh, one or two carbohydrate uh, recognizing domains with preferential binding to, uh, to beta galactoside containing glycans. There are these uh, 
different kind of, uh, of, uh, of sequences. And they are evolutively preserved. This indicating this indicates that uh, that uh, they are quite important in the in the physiology of the, of the organism. Um, in mammalians, uh, we have uh, three um, the, uh, families of galactins: the prototype, chimeric, and tandem repeat. You can see the the, the schematic structures in, in the in the slide. And um, and galactin one in this. Uh, in it's a, it's a member of the prototype uh, family. So these are characterized by the possibility of forming um, dimers, uh, non-covalent dimers, uh, and, and uh, giving the, the, this galactin the, the possibility of cross-linking uh, like oscillated uh, molecules in, in, the, in the cell membrane. Uh, but uh, one of the most uh, interesting um, features of galactin one for us uh, was that uh, that is uh, that galactin one is the major receptor for ganglion site GM one. Uh, as if you remember, GM GM one is the main um, uh, product of uh, new C activity. And uh, on top of that, in uh, we have we have to uh, we have to say that uh, galactin one is mainly expressed and secreted by glial cells within the olfactory bulb. And, and uh, you will uh, you uh, ask who, why is this in, important? Well, the olfact in the olfactory system, the sensory neurons in the, in the nasal cavity um, project their axons to the to the to the three bone platform to the to the olfactory bulb where they form. Um, Synapses within the olfactory glomerula. Okay, and as uh, these sensory neurons are replaced periodically, new axons have to find their way, uh, even in the, in the adult um, animal. And uh, so we can say that the olfactory system is the only part of the of the of the um, central nervous system that is continuously uh, regenerating uh, axons. In a, in a spontaneous way. Uh, this, uh, so as, as I as, as I was saying, these new axons from the uh, from the nasal cavity have to find their way in in the adult animal, and um, and uh, GAL1 serves as the main guidance factor for this. We know this because uh, the new, these new sensory neurons in mice lacking this lectin fail to reach their targets and uh, and to innervate the glomeruli of the olfactory bulb. So these uh, these uh, animals become punished. In addition, we have uh, shown that GAL1 is not only a uh, chemical attractant for this, uh, these neurons in the nasal cavity, but also for uh, other kind of neurons, as hippocampal uh, neurons and neurons. We did a very simple experiment, as you see in the left panel, neurons growing on uh, until alternating polylysing in black and GAL1 in, in, in green. Uh, Show the, uh, this this action show the clear preference to grow on the on the stripes covered with the with the galactin one. As a control, we we use in the same way galactin three, for example, and uh, and, and you can see here the actions just grow where, uh, wherever they want and, and they don't they don't prefer any any of this um, uh, any of this um, stripes here. So um, these and, and many other. In data um, from um, from uh, other reports dedicated to the mechanism of uh, new three and galactin one function in actions um, uh, rendered uh, a, a, an overall view that can be summarized in the uh, in the in the next uh, slide. So um, if you focus on the uh, right part of the of the, of the slide. Uh, you will see that uh, new three can increase the quantity of GM1 in the, in the membrane of, uh, of, the, of the neurons, and this, for example, uh, this, uh, this GM1 can interact with uh, in, in the growth cone, for example, with tract A, that is the receptor for uh, for uh, proteins, and uh, and activate them, uh, and, and, and uh, well, as everyone knows already, and, and this uh, will um, uh, stimulate the, the Growth of the of the axon, and in the same way, in the distal part of the of the axon, uh, this uh, this uh, GM1, this elevated uh, quantity of GM1, can interact with in this case with the integrin subunits, 
and uh, and uh, and the electing one will form uh, uh, by cross-linking this uh, this DM1 molecule that are interacting with the interviews will form um, uh, thick aggregates of of, uh, of interviews there, activating the uh, focal addition chemist pathway. Uh, uh, um, pathway of, of signaling. This this will uh, activate some channels uh, in the in the membrane that will allow the entry of calcium, etc. And the, the 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 outcome will be the, the stimulation of axon addition and, uh, and of course of axon uh, guidance. So in consequence, with the um, Putting all this together, we can we can say that uh, this system uh, formed by new three GM1 and the lectin one can be a potential target to achieve nerve, nerve functional um, recovery. And uh, of course, uh, there have been already from the practical point of view that we may, maybe will interest uh, you most. Uh, from the practical uh, point of view, uh, there have been already some uh, reports using, for example, infused bacterial cyanides for the treatment of experimental uh, spinal cord injuries. They were tested uh, alone or in combination with the chondroitinase uh, ABC. This, uh, this, was more, this was supposed to help in the elimination of the immediate glial scar and, and uh, allowing uh, a better glow of the, of the regenerating axons. Um, but, uh, well, the, 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 the results were not uh, very let's say, too spectacular, although um, the, the, the cyanidase infusion uh, enhances some, somehow the, the recovery from this spinal experimental spinal cord condition injuries, uh, but the combination with the with with chondroitinase ABC failed to improve this, uh, this outcome. So, so the, the chondroitinase um, did, did not show uh, any improvement in the in the in the outcome of the, of this uh, treatment. Um, um, although this is the, the, the use of of, uh, of uh, soluble bacterial cellulose, like in this uh, case, it was was logical because uh, having a, a cellulose that is uh, that is um, soluble is very convenient because you can infuse them directly in the injury site, uh, uh, etc. The, the main drawback of this, uh, of this enzymes are that they are not gangliosid specific. They can hide, hydrolyze uh, bulky uh, cyanic acids also in, uh, in glycoproteins, uh, for example, and this will uh, cause for sure uh, undesired side, side, uh, side effects. So the, the, the idea uh, would be to use uh, new feed as, 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 as it is, but, uh, but it is a membrane associated Enzyme and it cannot be solubilized without uh, losing the activity. So we proposed, um, uh, considering this, we proposed a, a new strategy that take advantage of the uh, new three uh, of the new three trans, meaning that uh, new three can um, uh, hydrolyze uh, gangliosides of the adjacent cell, not only of the of the same uh, of the same cell where, where it is inserted. Um, and this, you can see here in the in the, in the left uh, upper panel uh, this uh, this uh, scheme with the, uh, the trans activity of uh, of new uh, feed. So um, as a first uh, trial of this uh, hypothesis, we expressed new three in an immortalized olfactory uh, glial uh, cell line uh, and selected the best uh, clones in this uh, this. And I'm showing you this, uh, the result with this C15 uh, clone expressing in three. And uh, well, this, this clone uh, stimulated action growth uh, in vitro better than the original cell line when it was co cultured with, uh, with neurons. Um, this, is, this is shown in this, in this panel here. And as well, um, um, they, they also stimulated. The number of axons crossing uh, across the, the injury site when they were transplanted in uh, injured uh, rat spinal cords. Uh, this is here in the, in the uh, bottom of the right hand. Um, 
Of course, these are very preliminary uh, results, but it seems that uh, this strategy could be uh, success successful. Uh, although, of course, there is still a long, uh, there is still a, a long way to, to go to to to, to prove this. And as a part of this uh, uh, strategy, uh, we are also exploring the, the possible uh, effect on action load of uh, galactin one covalent nucleus. And if you remember, this kind of uh, of galactins could uh, could form non-covalent uh, uh, dimers, and uh, this. Uh, this, uh, this was uh, the, the reason why we can cross link uh, like like a molecules in the, the cell membrane. But uh, we um, we decided to uh, to try to uh, transform this in this uh, multimers in covalent multimers. So this uh, this is uh, these are these covalent multimers are prepared by the combinant engineering. With, uh, we uh, we uh, insert different uh, peptidic linkers, uh, and uh, and we already know that some of them are are, um, are showing high activity, a very low concentrations. Uh, although um, we are we are still, as, as I say, uh, starting with this. Maybe I'll come back with the good news in the, in the next uh, future. But this uh, this will be for the, the next time. Uh, I have to to uh, stop here and uh, thank you very thanking you very much for your attention and and, uh, and thanking again the uh, organization for the for this uh, invitation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jose, uh, for your talk. It's really interesting the effect of glycans in the neural cells. So. Now we have time for, for questions. So I don't know if someone wants to ask anything. So maybe I can I can start. Uh, Jose, I would like to ask you if, if yeah. do you if, uh, do you think that any biomaterials with high content of galactin one will promote the outgrowth of the neurids? Yes, this is this is the the, the idea. Of course, uh, the the infusion the, the, the infusion of these galactins, uh, even uh, if they are um, um, wild type or, or these multimers that we are trying uh, directly there, uh, I think they, it it will not work very well. Uh, you have to you have to uh, to create a pattern inside the the injured cell. So, um, um, the, the the idea of of making this uh, these um, um, biomaterials uh, functional with this kind of uh, of uh, molecules is very interesting. And, uh, and I have to say that uh, that uh, as, as I have said in the presentation that this. Uh, these uh, multimers, for example, dimers and, and tetramers with a, with a short link, are working very well in vitro, in, in solution and uh, and uh, and even uh, attached to the surface. So my my guess is that uh, this uh, this kind of molecules will will um, will add uh, um, uh, strength to the to the biomaterial itself. Yeah. Okay. I have you heard. Uh... Try or proof any materials or not or just? Uh, no, no, not yet. We are we are okay. just starting with this uh, with this uh, uh, with this uh, idea, and uh, we are only do, doing um, work in in vitro. But mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, the, the next step will will be to try to to integrate this in in some biomaterial. Bio yeah. Yeah, I don't know at, okay. the, at, the chem, at the chemical level. I don't know how it how it will work, but uh, but we have to try, it, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, not Paula, if you want to ask something. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jose, for your nice talk. Nice yeah. talk. Uh, since I am not from biology, I am from material science, as you know. So I I had also this thought, but uh, I think we already asked you, but. Um, how do you see the integration of these uh, molecules? Uh, it, it could be in the cell culture media or directly linked to the scaffolds. It's somehow you already answered, I think, in the in, in the. Well, uh, 
to be yeah, able. I, I, what, yeah, yeah. What, what I can say is that uh, in, in in solution they work in, okay. in contact with, uh, with culture with culture uh, neurons, but okay. uh, I don't know how it, they will work uh, integrated. So uh, as as a as a function of the, of uh, any biomaterial, I, I cannot uh, answer you. It's just we have just uh, to to try it. It's, you know. Hello. I am Olat Smulua from Technalia. Uh, yes, I think I'm giving a presentation uh, in yes. 15 minutes. Yes, uh, we are just in the in the coffee break, uh, but uh, we will start at uh, let's see, say at uh, four. A uh, four. So in uh, 10 minutes, more or less. Can you? Can I work with you to make sure that my um, my presentation works? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, if you want, yes. Yeah, yes, I, wanted, yes. I just wanted to see if I could load my presentation. Yes, to to go to your presentation that you had to do is to go to. I'm going to give you the control of the application. One moment. And uh, here, and you have to go to the. You have to go to the. Uh, there is one uh, sure. show, one site that is uh, to share. You go okay. to share. You have open uh, previously your presentation in your computer. Yes. Um, okay. I, I have a question. Is it? Um, is it possible for me to show a movie or will the sound not work? Uh, a video? Yeah. Uh, it's difficult because we have tried already to share one video and uh, it's uh, it's uh, difficult to upload the, the okay. video. It doesn't work? You c no, it doesn't work. Okay. That's if it's yeah. short, if it is short, we can we can check we can check now if you want. Uh, okay, yeah, let's check now. Uh, should I share my screen or I should choose uh, a window? So you go to the point of uh, to share uh, yeah. in the button, uh, share your screen. If you click the little arrow that there is, uh, you have you can see the file of your presentation. So you click and. Uh, it's, uh, okay. Um, sorry. Um, should I just share my whole screen? Have you have you see what is the Is uh, to is one button that is in the top. I have in the top that yeah. is uh, share, share this uh, share, and you click and you have a, a list of buttons, and it's the first uh, share your screen. Just my yeah main screen. Okay, right. Is this one? It's like this. You take to share. And uh, you have a, li a list of buttons, and it's just the first this one, and it has a little arrow. And if you uh, if you click in the little arrow, you will see the name of your file of your presentation. Oh, the orange arrow? No. Sorry. Okay. Um, sorry. Oh, the arrow. Okay. I'm not sure what's happening. Can we go through that again, please? Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, Paula. Hi. Nice to meet you. And so you have three green buttons. Excuse me? You have three green buttons. Yeah. You click on the third one. Yeah. And then you have the play symbol. Oh, OK. But you need to have your PowerPoint already open. It is open. Yes. Okay. But you're not seeing it. No. Mm hmm. 
Okay. Um, is there any ad block or something that could be blocking the sharing in your computer? Because it happened previously in the morning with one of the presenters and he needed Can you see to it now? Not yet. Okay. Oh. Um. Yes, we were uh, talking about the possibility to how to do with the video. Hmm. But this probably, quite good. Um, probably it can be um, depending on the size of the video. Yes, it depends on the size. If it is uh, short, I don't know, could be possible. The video that yeah. we have tried this morning was uh, big, so it be possible. And yes, yeah. some people from marketing say us that uh, it has to be uploaded in the application and it's quite difficult. Yeah. But if it is, uh, but we can check. We can check. Is uh, it possible or no? We have time now, so uh, we can check. Okay. So regardless, you're not seeing my presentation, so this isn't working. Uh, so let me. Um, I, I'm going to leave and come back and see if that works. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> okay, nothing's working now. Uh, no problem. We have time, so we are going to be calm. No, all, all the quest technological questions, uh, or and if it's necessary, we uh, we speak with our uh, support system. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. I'll. Uh, I'm going to leave and I'll come back. Okay. See you a little while. Uh, Ricardo Rodriguez, the surgeon. The surgeon. Ricardo. I already. Yes. Is um, he sent me a message? He will connect. He was uh, attending the workshop in the morning. Yes, and Patricia. Now he will be connected. Patricia. Sorry? Yes, the next one. Uh, Guillaume Hill, Patricia Martins. Is Patricia that is connected? I have I, I see here in the panel that Patricia is uh, is connected. No 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 Patricia already we already talked. After Molly is Alexei, and after Alexei we have Ricardo. Oh, sorry sorry yes yes it's, <laughs> yes uh, sorry yes it's Alexei, and after is Ricardo yes yes Ricardo was mentioned he sent me a message. Um, he is now in the, is operating, so he's making a surgery, but he will connect 15 minutes before his talk. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just be sure that uh, he has the invitation as a panelist? Because he mentioned that he was connected in the morning, but I don't know if he connected like a panelist or as a just participant. Okay, Ricardo. Ricardo in this moment is not in the as panelist and as assistant, but as assistant, uh, he cannot uh, talk, I think. Yes, that's, that's what I, I am trying to, to understand. Yes. He has, he has received the invitation, right? As panelist. Uh, I, I say to Megan to send the invitation. Uh, she, uh, he has to save it. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Hi, Molly. Hi. I'm back. Right. You know what? I'm wondering, I'm on Firefox. Should I go to Chrome? Maybe that's the problem. Let me, I'm going to well, just try. Ahora, ¿vale? Miriam? Sí, digo que le envío otra vez. Le envío hace un ratito, eh, porque veía que no estaba ah. conectado. Vale, de acuerdo. Yes, Paula, eh, Miriam me is saying that uh, is, uh, she's going to resend to Ricardo the invitation. Okay, thank you. But he will join just 15 minutes before his talk because meantime he is making surgery. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, James Phillips needs to 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 give some classes, so he left. 
we will see if he can join us again. But he was asking if the since the um, we are recording the session, if then we can share with him the. the Yes, yeah, the session is recording. We are recording the session. Yes, all the session. Hmm. Hi, I'm wondering if I can try and share my presentation again. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm going to give you the role of presentation because I think that as you go out, ah, okay, yes. So try, try now because I don't know why. Oh, I think that's oh, yes. working now. Oh, your screen now it's okay no okay mm -hmm. okay yeah. perfect can and you try perfect. you want to try the video uh, we can try oh. it if okay, you can sure. try it possible to see the video okay let's try it um this is the video It works. Yeah. Yes. But wait, does the sound work? The I don't think so. I, I see the video. Can you hear it? No. Can you hear the audio? Okay. Oh, uh, is there a way to, is there something you pushed for audio to work? Well, if not, I can. I can um, can explain. I can, just, I can explain. Okay, okay. So maybe we'll try that then. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I can. Uh, Miriam, are you here? No. Sí. Sí, ah, sí. Miriam, yes. Uh, uh, para oír el video, to hear the video. Uh, is, uh, lo teníamos que haber subido a la plataforma. Ah, ok. Pero ya es tarde, porque ahora ya no puedo actualizar todo lo que está ya la herramienta. Ah, vale, vale, vale. O sea, no se puede oír, ¿no? Eh, no. Eh, ella lo puede explicar, pero uh -huh. no, no se puede escuchar. Ok. Solo se okay, puede sure. escuchar. Uh, yes, Miriam, my colleagues say me that it's not possible to hear the video. You can explain it. But uh, uh, we should uh, upload before, because uh, it's the only way to, to hear. We, had, we, we have checked that it's possible to, to see, but uh, you have to explain it. Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, so, should I, should I just um, leave it in presentation mode or you want me to take it down? So, we have uh, four minutes, I think, before to start. Okay, well, I can just leave it. I can leave the presentation up if, if that's easy, or do you want me to take it down? Okay, should I just leave like this then? No problem, I think. Yes. Okay, perfect. I'll do that. Thank you so well, much for your help. already cited this afternoon, Molly. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't join for the whole conference. It you missed like it. Great. <laughs> so many presentations, <laughs> but I'm very glad that you accepted. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Molly, just this uh, the time. Uh, we can start with the last part of the of the event, uh, in which uh, first speaker is uh, is Molly Stoit. I sorry, I don't know how how it say Stoit. That is professor at the University of Toronto, former first chief scientific of Ontario, Canada. So, when you want, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's really wonderful to be with you all remotely. And so, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share our research with you. And uh, the work that I will be presenting today was done by these people, and I will highlight their contribution throughout. And our collaborators are highlighted in blue. So. Um, let's see. Okay, so our research uh, is really at that intersection of engineering and biology and medicine. And uh, from the engineering perspective, we uh, we approach spinal cord injury and um, regenerative medicine really from a 
a chemistry and chemical engineering perspective where we try to understand uh, the key problems um, to be solved or the key, que key questions that want to be answered and then work backwards to design materials that we can use uh, to help answer those questions or solve those problems. And so um, in our research then what we've done is we've um, invented a series of new materials for either cell transplantation or biomolecule delivery uh, in the context of regenerative medicine for spinal cord injury, for stroke, or for blindness. Um, and then in the context of cancer, we've designed these um, hydrogels that serve as biomimetic environments uh, that mimic um, or, or serve to allow cells to, to grow into the hydrogels the way they grow um, natively uh, in us. And so today I'm going to tell you about our work obviously in spinal cord injury and the idea of overcoming barriers is that barrier of the glial scar. So I'm going to try and show you this movie um, that uh, relates to spinal cord injury and um, I will I will be I will be the voice of, of the movie. Um, uh, this movie was made by one of our um, Lesia Sezeka who uh, is in bio, was in biomedical communications. And so what we see obviously is this is spinal cord injury, which is devastating. You know, with spinal cord injury, we obviously have that devastating injury. We have that massive disruption to axons and we get that glial scar that forms at the site of injury. You know, really we have very few things that we can do for our patients. So to promote spinal cord injury repair, we look at stem cell transplantation and this is some of the work we're doing in stem cell transplantation. We've been transplanting neural progenitor cells and trying to promote their cell survival and their cell integration, which is of course a huge challenge. Now to promote the survival and integration of transplanted cells, we invented a new hydrogel of hyaluronin and methylcellulose. And these are some of the properties that we designed into our hydrogel. So we can inject the gel directly into the tissue with the cells, or we can inject the hydrogel just on top of the injured spinal cord. And we can use the hydrogel to deliver molecules like chondroitinase ABC. This is done to enhance the integration of the cells that we're transplanting. So with the delivery of chondro chondroitinase ABC, we can overcome some of the inhibitors of the glial scar. This is the problem with the CSPGs. So we degrade those from the, um, the glial scar. And what I'll tell you about today is about chondroitinase ABC and a more, a more stable form of chondroitinase ABC overcoming some of the critical issues. So we hope that all those aspects together will promote regeneration after spinal cord injury. So let me tell you then about the, the science behind that video. And I'm sorry the sound didn't work quite on the video. I tried to um, tell you mostly what was going on. So a number of years ago, um, chondroitinase ABC was shown to be really a potent molecule in terms of degrading the glial scar that forms after spinal cord injury by degrading those chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. But at, over the 
past um, decade or so, we've also realized that chondroitinase ABC, while it's very potent, it's also very fragile. And so coming up with a way to deliver it has been very challenging. We know it has to be delivered locally in order to be effective. And we know that we need a sustained delivery of chondroitinase ABC. And so there's been beautiful work out of the UK looking at delivering chondroitinase ABC um, either re re repeatedly or with um, a virus viral delivery. We came up with a different approach and that was to express chondroitinase ABC as a fusion protein uh, with circumology 3 shown here as this gray bar. And then to detect and purify the chondroitinase ABC, we expressed it with a his tag um, and a flag tag. And this um, pioneering work of affinity controlled release was first done by Katerina Bullock and then pursued by Malgosha Pokolska with chondroitinase ABC. And what you can see over here then is we can modify our hydrogel, which is shown with these blue strands with a peptide, uh, circumology 3 or SH3 binding peptide that interacts specifically with SH3, which is bound um, or which is expressed as a fusion protein with chondroitinase ABC. And so by controlling the affinity of this yellow, um, you know, dagger in a sense, and this, this green um, pentagon, you can control, um, by controlling the affinity of those two, you can control the release of chondroitinase ABC. And as I showed you in that video, we can inject it right at the site of injury uh, into the spinal cord. And so first we tested this strategy in vitro with a methylcellulose uh, cross-linked hydrogel. And um, you can see um, over here, um, if we just incorporate the chondroitinase ABC into the hydrogel, it diffuses out pretty quickly within about a day. But if we incorporate some of those affinity binding peptides onto the hydrogel, we can slow that release. And you know, looking at just the linear portion of these release curves in B, it's more clearly how you can see the, how we can control the release based on either having a weak binding peptide, so that's a weak interaction uh, to control release, or a strong binding peptide, um, which would be, you know, obviously a stronger uh, interaction, and then that slows release further. Uh, importantly for chondroitinase ABC, we demonstrated that it was still active out to seven days. So having demonstrated that we could control the release, at least in vitro, we could maintain the bioactivity of the chondroitinase ABC, we wanted to see if we could deliver it in a spinal cord injury model. Uh, this is a clip compression injury model in a rat spinal cord. And here, uh, so in the video, I showed you that we could inject our gel directly into the cord. But here, what we're doing is injecting it into the um, cerebral spinal fluid that bathes the spinal cord, so into that uh, subarachnoid space right at the site of injury. Um, and so we do it, we inject it into this fluid filled space so that we don't cause any potential uh, additional injury by injecting into the tissue itself. So when we did this study, initially we wanted to just see if we could detect chondroitinase ABC in the spinal cord tissue. And you could see we can detect it. So we did this um, by ELISA um, for, uh, we designed our own ELISA with a, a hiss and, with those hiss and flag tags. And um, we took serial sections of the spinal cord going down in depth. And you can see over here that we can detect chondroitinase ABC um, at two, seven, and even out to 28 days. And if you look at the other curves, you can see that as we go in depth down through the spinal cord, there's less and less there, but there's still a detectable amount. So importantly, we also wanted to see, well, not, can, not only can we see it, but does it do anything? And so, you know, we know that chondroitinase ABC, if it's active, will degrade the chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. And so when we delivered uh, the chondroitinase ABC in our hydrogel vehicle, we found that in fact it did degrade the CSPGs uh, more than um, just the vehicle itself. And so that was significant at two weeks after injury, but not at eight weeks after injury. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is something that has um, motivated us to come up with better strategies to deliver the chondroitinase ABC. But here you see 
Um, X at MC is that's just our cross-linked methylcellulose hydrogel. And here's the cross-linked methylcellulose hydrogel that we use to deliver the chondroitinase ABC. So we, we went on and did a functional assay where we delivered chondroitinase ABC with stromal-derived factor 1 alpha I don't, um, and, and looked for functional effects as well. And so I'll just show you some of the highlights from that study. Uh, if you wanted to read the whole study, it's, it was published in 2017 in Biomaterials. We looked at a motor subscore and we looked at foot faults. And um, what you can see is just looking at how um, the motor subscore in terms of improvement over time, uh, we see that with delivery of chondroitinase ABC and not with injury alone. Um, similarly, with we see fewer foot faults with delivery of chondroitinase ABC um, over time, but not with injury alone. One thing I wanna point out is that even though we see the significant difference over time with the delivery of chondroitinase ABC and we don't see it with injury, there is not a significant difference between those two groups. So this um, spurred us to think about how can we do better? We know we have this potent enzyme, we know it's fragile. Can we make it more stable? Um, and by making it more stable, have a prolonged activity. And so this work was done by Marian Hederacci and Matt O'Meara. And so Matt O'Meara, Matt O'Meara did the computational modeling and Marian uh, Hederacci uh, did the um, fusion protein and experimental work. And working together, they looked at making four separate single mutations shown here in all of these different sites. They were careful to avoid the catalytic site. And, uh, and then we also thought if we modify the chondroitinase ABC with polyethylene glycol, that could also help to prevent protein aggregation. So I'll, I'll tell you that after looking at all these four mutations, only mutation one um, we thought was worth pursuing. And, um, and so with, pro because only, um, that chondroitinase ABC with mutation one showed some promise. So we modified that with polyethylene glycol and looked to see if we saw greater stability. And we compared stability to that chondroitinase ABC that I just told you about that we had tested in the injured spinal cord uh, shown here in the white bars um, and compared that to um, modifying that white one with polyethylene glycol, so the blue bar, to just mutation one, to modifying mutation one with the polyethylene glycol. And you can see when we blow up this at 48 hours, we see significantly greater um, activity with mutation one that's being uh, modified with polyethylene glycol. So then what Marion did is we looked in actually a, a stroke injured brain and we looked to see if we could degrade the glial scar there. And what we found was, um, or what we compared then was delivering our vehicle alone, which is just that cross-link methylcellulose, delivering the original chondroitinase ABC fusion protein with Circumology 3 in our vehicle, or our new um, mutated and pegylated chondroitinase ABC uh, fusion protein. And we didn't see any effect in terms of lesion volume um, or the percent of CSPGs in the lesion. But we did see a reduction in the chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans um, in the 100 micron, so you can see that hopefully here, peri-lesion space, and then also in the 100 to 200 micron um, peri-lesion space, both at 14 and 28 days. And so this was, this was exciting. It was an improvement on what we had done, but we also recognized that there was probably the opportunity to do more. And so um, Matt went back to the computational modeling and used a program called um, Rosetta and PROS together to now come up with not just a single mutation, but multiple mutations in one um, fusion protein. And he came up with 37, 55, or 92 mutations. And those are shown 37, um, A is the, the red ball showing the 37 mutations, 55 is the addition of the orange balls, and 92 is the addition of 
the yellow balls. And so we looked at, again, all we expressed all these fusion proteins um, and tested um, Matt's um, prediction, whether these would all be more stable than our original uh, fusion protein. And in fact, uh, they were all more stable, but they weren't all more bioactive. So if I actually draw your attention to B, which is the half-life, comparing our, we'll call it our wild type, this was the original chondroitinase ABC SH3 fusion protein. You look at the half-life of all of the mutants, they're all greater, significantly greater than the half-life of our wild type. But then if I draw your attention to A, um, you know, the half-life is greater because they don't degrade as quickly as the black one. But what you can see also is the blue and the green mutations. So the, the 92 and 55 mutant um, chondroitinases um, are also less active than our, our starting um, chondroitinase ABC. So it was only the red one, the one with 37 mutation, which was both more active and more stable. And you can see that most clearly here in C, um, where we're looking at the de degradation of chondroitin sulfate A. Um, and so this is the mutation that we then took um, forward to uh, look at our release assays again. And so, as you may recall, when I first introduced you to this affinity release system, we depend on that affinity between circumology 3 and SH3 binding peptides to control the release. Now, we did not expect to see any difference in um, the release of our mutant chondroitinase ABC37, because as I said, release is controlled uh, through the fusion protein SH3 and not through chondroitinase ABC directly. Um, and in fact, we didn't see any difference. So um, just as I showed you before, if we have just the hydrogel, the chondroitinase ABC mutant comes out pretty quickly. Whereas if we um, have a binding peptide immobilized, so that's the red, um, we can slow the release. And the release of the mutant, so chondroitinase ABC37, is exactly the same as just our wild type chondroitinase um, ABC SH3, which is the black, so the black and the red. So we haven't changed the mode or the affinity of release. What we've changed simply is um, the activity and the stability. And if you look at the activity over time, you can see it's, and look at the area under the curve, we see it's significantly greater for this mutant than it was for the wild type. So um, with that, then I wanna just conclude and, and you know, we all knew that chondroitinase ABC is a potent and fragile enzyme, but we didn't really have a good way of delivering it um, locally because we know that we need to deliver it locally in order for it to degrade the chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans of the glial scar. Um, and so what we've been able to do uh, first with that point mutation, but now with the 37 mutate, mutated chondroitinase ABC is really create a significantly more stable, more bioactive and affinity release system. And so what we're really um, excited to, we're, we plan to be starting in the next couple of months is, is testing the efficacy of this in um, spinal cord injury, either alone or, or in combination uh, with other other biomolecules or cells. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share this research with you. This is the research lab. Um, these are the areas in which um, we have the privilege to, to work. Um, and these are all the people um, that I have the privilege to collaborate with. Um, grateful for funding and grateful for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Molly, uh, for this so interesting uh, presentation. The uh, next presentation uh, is uh, from Alexei Klimov, uh, that is uh, part of the consortium of Neurostim Spinal. He's a researcher at Regenerative Biomaterials Research Group at Radogunk, University Medical Center of Nimegen, the Netherlands. So, uh, one moment, uh, I'm going to give you the role of uh, presentation. I, uh, here, okay. You can share. Okay. When you want, you can uh, you can start. 
Thank you very much. Um, you can see the presentation. Oh, ah, like this. You can see the presentation. Uh, yes, we can see the presentation. Uh, we refer you. That's perfect. Um, so thank you very much. My name is Alexei. I'm a postdoc at the Regenerative Biomaterials Group at the Rato TMC in the Netherlands. And today I want to talk uh, uh, to you about some results on a systematic review that we have obtained. Uh, in the first slide, I, I call the necessary evil <clears throat> because it's um, about animal experiments and um, most of the researchers performing animal experiments in the field of biomaterials, uh, I don't think they really enjoyed because most of the time the animals uh, will be killed. However, before um, the material um, that, that uh, you're developing, and it might have great results in vitro, before this material can go into clinics, we need um, to uh, verify the efficacy also in animals. And once you're at the point, you will um, ask yourself uh, the question, um, what, what actually is the model that I need to use? What is the animal species uh, that, that I need? To, uh, the, is it important whether the animal is male or female? Um, what is the type of interaction that I want to achieve with my material? How I want to induce um, maybe a, a, a defect in the animal? What's the readout interpretation, et cetera, et cetera? And um, possibilities, um, how to choose it, are of course, if you're working in a lab that is frequently I working. Yes. I say, I'm sorry. We yes. are uh, seeing the same slides from the beginning, and it's slide number three. You are not in the presentation mode, and we didn't see the first slides. Sorry. Um. If you drop. We, so uh, we, we can, yes. Uh, we are in the, in the third uh, slide from the beginning. Third. You see yes. that I'm changing? Yes. No. I, okay. It's um, like screen is frozen or something. Okay. Uh, you can try to to open you and. Yes. No. Okay. Okay, now we are in number two and the presentation mode. Okay. And now number one. Presentation mode on? No, no. 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 Hmm. Um. But we see the slides, now, now they are passing. Yes. Now we, we don't see. Okay, now yes, but if... Uh, we select the number one. Mode, you can continue. If I go on this one, you don't see anything. You don't see the no, no. presentation mode. No. It's, we can continue if you want in this mode. This not like, presentation. Like but this should, should we continue like this? OK. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK. Apologies about this. I don't know how to change. <laughs> Uh, well, um, uh, as I said, th th there are different uh, possibilities to choose uh, for a model. Uh, if you're working in a lab uh, that is um, 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 daily dealing with the problems that, that um, you're dealing with, um, uh, material uh, development, uh, you might have colleagues uh, that are experienced with a certain animal model. But you can also go to the animal facility um, um, where um, uh, you are planning to, to make the uh, experiments. Maybe they have some technicians that are skilled with a certain model, but you could also look into international standards because there are some, especially for medical devices, which are suggesting uh, very specific animal uh, models. Uh, what we did is we went um, and uh, looked into the uh, literature and made a review on the, uh, the uh, animal models of spinal cord injury for the last of the last 30 years, and um, we were hoping to find uh, hotspots like um, uh, animal models which were frequently used, uh, which had um, uh, which, which might uh, be useful. Um, so um, I'm not sure whether you can see well or read well. Um, this is this is a typical chart for for system, uh, systematic um, uh, reviews. 
um, if you um, uh, we, we, we evaluated in vivo animal models that were used to stimulate spinal cord injury for the purpose of biomaterial mediated spinal cord regeneration. We were using two uh, databases, PubMed and Embase, and we were looking for uh, specific uh, articles which had spinal cord injury uh, animal models and combined them with biomaterials. Um, we ended up with about six and a half thousand uh, of which we could remove to 2,100 2, because they were duplicates. Uh, then we started to read the title in the abstract uh, and we could remove another three and a half thousand because they were either non-original research papers or uh, they were not in an in vivo study. Uh, they didn't induce uh, spinal cord injury um, or they didn't implant any uh, biomaterial. Uh, we ended up with about 1,000 articles. Some of them we couldn't um, uh, download or we couldn't get from the authors. So uh, uh, we ended up with 1,072, which we started to read. Um, and we could uh, remove another 680 because they were um, either not using appropriate control groups or they didn't report any relevant outcome measures uh, like uh, morphological, functional, or electrophysiological. So this we could um, throw out and we ended up with 393 um, articles that we further analyzed. We were looking for data uh, like the type of injury and there are four major um, uh, methods to induce spinal cord injury in animal models. Uh, I will come to this in a, uh, in a bit. Uh, we were looking for how the biomaterials were uh, applied. So what's the type um, of the biomaterial? How um, was the method of application? Uh, when it was applied, uh, when it was assessed, um, and um, exactly, and, and, and how it was used uh, within the model. We were looking for the level of injury. Um, we were looking for the species, of course, uh, the sex and the strain of the animals, if uh, it was applicable. Uh, of course, also of the type of outcome measure, uh, whether it was morphologically, functionally, or electrophysiologically assessed. And we were looking on the data on animal survival because we think it's important whether um, within the model um, many animals survive also the surgery um, for the future applications. And <clears throat> this is actually um, the overview of the four um, mainly used uh, spinal cord injury uh, methods. Uh, on the left, you see the contusion and compression model. Uh, for the compression uh, model, um, it's rather easy to, to, to do. Not, not easy, but uh, uh, you only need clippers, uh, uh, which you um, uh, use to induce uh, the injury for the contusion you are using um, a, a device which is uh, mainly uh, using a weight uh, to induce uh, the contusion. So the weight is dropped um, onto the spinal cord and you induce uh, with it the injury. Um, on the other side, we have the section models. So there you use um, uh, sharp uh, micro scissors to remove parts of the spinal cord. Uh, in the hemisection model, you remove only half of the spinal cord, and in the complete transaction model, you uh, separate the spinal cord completely. Um, it was interesting to see that uh, depending on the uh, country you're from, um, you might prefer to use uh, the one or the other um, uh, spinal cord injury model. Uh, so, for example, in Asia, it was striking that uh, the transaction and the hemisection made almost 80% um, of the spinal cord injury models. Um, in Northern America, only um, uh, one fourth of the studies was using the transaction, and 34% uh, were using uh, hemisection. And in Europe, only 10% uh, were uh, uh, doing the transaction, and 58% uh, uh, hemisection. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that, that um, and we, we are not sure whether it's just easier to receive the ethical um, approval of, to perform such studies in, in Asian countries um, or whether it's something that developed from, uh, from the early beginning that labs started with transaction models on pass them on. Uh, if you look at the uh, type of injury on a global uh, scale, uh, we also see here that um, about 70% 
So more than every second uh, study is using a section model, while about 30% use the contusion models. And um, the thing is that if you look in the um, clinics, the clinical observations are um, mainly um, found to be contusion-induced uh, spinal cord injuries. Um, so the question arises: Why? Um, why are so many people using uh, section models? Um, this might uh, answer it. Uh, um, uh, the uh, graph shows the different applications or different uh, biomaterial uh, specifics. Um, in blue, you see that the materials are implanted um, into the uh, into the defect. Um, these are um, materials which are, for example, 3D printed, which have a certain um, uh, structure and which you cannot uh, inject. And it's logical that such materials you only can put into a cavity, which you have to make. Um, on the other hand, contusion and compression um, um, uh, mainly uses uh, injections. However, you see here in the contusion also a little bit of blue, so it was an implantation. Um, and um, the answer, how was it possible, is um, maybe uh, something that we can answer with, with this graph. Here we see the time on the inter of, of intervention, and you see that the majority of the studies um, uh, is treating the injury that they induce um, in an acute phase. So uh, while uh, operating. So they perform the, the spinal cord injury and they use uh, the, the material um, acutely. Uh, but you still have some studies which use uh, the material after uh, several weeks or days. Um, and the studies that you can see here in the contusion um, uh, bar um, are studies which induced a contusion, they closed the animal, they waited for a while, they opened the animal again, and they removed the scar tissue, um, which has formed, and they implanted in this cavity um, their uh, material of interest. Uh, we think that it's a very interesting way uh, to perform uh, this kind of surgery, because it is very closely to what could be um, a chronic stage of, of uh, spinal cord injury in patients. Um, I have brought some uh, videos um, of, of uh, the um, uh, section and the contusion. Um, here in this video, you can see uh, the hemisection. So this is the spinal cord. Uh, the vertebra is removed and the spinal cord, you can see here in white, um, the surgeon is uh, piercing through the center of the spinal cord to allow a sharp uh, micro scissor um, to be introduced and to cut out a part of the spinal cord. Afterwards, the uh, neuronal tissue is, is removed which was uh, cut and it um, allows the surgeon to introduce uh, the material that uh, needs to be tested into the cavity. Okay, now you could close up the animal and uh, Evaluate after a while. Um, for the contusion, you need uh, more than just a pair of sharp scissors. You need the device uh, most of the time. Um, and here you see two of the devices. Uh, this one on the left is a quite old uh, construct. This uh, has been published in 1911. Uh, but principally, what it makes, you have a, a predefined weight uh, which you drop from a predefined uh, height. And by this, you introduce a damage uh, which um, uh, which you want. And, and the severity you define, of course, uh, by adding or removing the, the weight. On the right-hand side, you see uh, one of the modern impactor devices, um, which are more robust um, and which can be aligned. And um, But still, they work um, by um, the weight drop. Um, what we are doing at the moment... Uh, oh, wait a second. I'll show you first... Uh, 
how the contusion is performed. So here you see again a red, a red spinal cord. Uh, this is a shaft which is coming out of the um, uh, impactor. The, the shaft is removed, the impactor is lowered a little bit, and you can see in a second how the weight will drop. So the red contracts, and you know that the uh, damage was induced. Um, at the moment, uh, as a side note, we are working on a um, uh, impactor which will be uh, driven by electromagnetic uh, forces. You can see here a uh, simulated spinal cord. This is the, the, the impactor. It's a very early um, model. You saw the impactor coming out. Uh, we hope that we will uh, achieve um, uh, something that can be um, easily adjusted in force, um, adjusted in the period of um, impact, um, and which will be a little bit smaller than the devices that you can obtain at the moment. Um, once you have introduced the biomaterial um, um, and the red is alive, uh, you want also, of course, to assess uh, the uh, recovery. Um, the question was uh, for us, when do you uh, actually assess um, this? And as you can see here in the graph, most of the studies assess uh, recovery after um, um, two months. Uh, of course, you have also the peaks at one month and also three months. Um, this is a little bit, um, of course, depending on the question that you want to answer. But uh, in the beginning, of course, you need the rat or the animal to uh, recover from the, from the surgery and to give it a chance to regain um, the function in the uh, limbs. Um, and I said it already, it's also important which animal to use. Uh, I showed you the videos, um, and if you look into the literature, it will be no surprise that uh, the um, um, most used uh, animal model is uh, used in red, right? So we have 84% of all the studies that we have analyzed were um, used with, with the red model. Um, there are some uh, mouse studies, dog studies, primate studies, cat studies, guinea pig, pig studies uh, also, but by far the most are the reds. Um, also among the reds, you have some uh, darlings. So the Sprogdelli and Vistra reds are uh, used the most. What we found interesting uh, was that the majority of the studies was performed in female animals. And uh, if you look at the clinical uh, statistics, you will find out that most of the spinal cord injury clinical cases are male. Um, only one in four rats, uh, uh, that was, or one in four animals, which was used for um, this kind of studies was male. Um, the question is why, and the answer is probably because um, female um, animals tend to um, develop um, uh, bladder infections less often than the male animals do. Um, we also looked at the level of injury. And here again, if you look at the clinical uh, data, you will find mostly the damage um, in the, uh, uh, on the cervical level. Uh, however, as you can see here, most of the studies that were performed um, in animals are performed at the T89 and T10 level. Um, the question is why? <laughs> and uh, if you can see here, um, this is the human uh, spinal cord, um, or this is the human spine, this is the uh, red uh, spine. Um, you see that the, 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 the vertebrae at the C level are much smaller than the vertebrae on the um, thoracal level. Um, and you saw how small everything is uh, for the surgeon to operate um, in the video that I showed you. So this might be um, an answer because the surgery here might be more complex um, for, for, for the surgeon. And also, as you can see here, the red on the right side, it, the, 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 the spine makes a bow here, so you would need to stretch the animal to actually get to this area, and it might be um, not very easy to, to um, uh, operate on. It might be also that the sea level uh, will induce a higher mortality in the animals. And after the animals recovered from the surgery, um, a defect at the sea level will mean higher discomfort for the animals because it will mean 
that the animal has more uh, disabilities um, compared to the damages that um, um, are inducing at the T level. This is the data that um, we received in the end. This is just a, um, um, an example for the hemisection uh, groups that we that we received. You can see here that we have 132 studies, of which 51 have been confirmed um, by morphological um, uh, analysis. So it means uh, histological stainings or uh, MRI. Um, um, 92 have been confirmed by functional analysis. This is something like a movement um, a test. Um, um, 18 have been have been confirmed by electrophysiological um, testing, um, and we see here AS means um, uh, this, this is how many animals actually survived. Um, it's 90.4 percent. You can go further on the T level, uh, on the on the level of injury, um, and you see how many animals, uh, for example, survived um, in the studies that were performed on a specific uh, vertebra. Further, you can go to the species, sex, strain, etc. And using uh, the data that, uh, that we have collected, you might get an idea uh, with which animal, with it, which animal model you want to start um, uh, your experiments. Uh, in the conclusions, um, uh, I can say that most frequently uh, in the studies that we have found, uh, the animal or female uh, uh, red uh, was used for the animal models. Um, the section of the spinal cord um, was most frequently um, uh, used for um, using it with biomaterials. Uh, the method of spinal cord injury uh, induction um, is very dependent on the material formulations to be tested. So whether you have a material which has a certain form or whether it can be injected. The thoracic regions, T8, T9, T10, uh, was preferred over the cervical region. Um, and the materials uh, are mainly introduced during the spinal cord uh, surgery, um, although there are some other concepts which are, um, we think, clinically uh, relevant um, and might be interesting for um, uh, the stimulation of chronic uh, spinal cord injury treatments. Um, Evaluation is mainly performed two months after surgery, um, and this is maybe um, something that one wants to start with. Um, also, we uh, think that it's worth uh, to think about whether the animal models are clinically relevant and how to get the clinical uh, to, to clinically uh, relevant model. Uh, we see that the type of injury, and I didn't show the data, uh, we see that the type of injury shifts um, in the um, current period to transection and hemisection. So more and more um, uh, uh, surgeries are performed um, with transection and hemisection, um, especially when biomaterials are involved. And also here we think um, we should think about whether application, but what is more important, application or, or, or the relevance of, of the model. But maybe the section will become more uh, relevant when we have a material to treat also chronic patient uh, where we have to uh, um, um, slice out the part of uh, the damaged uh, spinal cord. Um, Location-wise, the overall majority is still uh, selects the low thoracic injuries for their biomaterial mediated therapy. So here is also um, uh, the question, what, what is more important, uh, how I uh, assess uh, the, the spinal cord and, and to lower the animal distress or should I go to the sea level, which is clinically more represented? And at the moment, there is more focus on female animal research. And uh, here we have to think about the complications for the animals, um, whether they are outweighed by the relevance, because it might be that the, an uh, the, the male uh, animals um, have other um, kind of um, regenerative capacity to the different uh, hormonal uh, concentrations. By this, I would like to um, um, end the presentation. I would like to thank um, uh, Kest and uh, René, who were uh, mainly uh, assessing the data from the uh, literature study, and the circle uh, at the Radboud UMC, who were helping with analyzing the um, uh, systematic review data. And of course, you uh, all for your attention.
Uh, thank you very much, Alexei, for your presentation. And uh, now, next speaker is uh, Ricardo Rodriguez Pinto, uh, head of the spinal unit of uh, the Centro Hospitalario Universitario de Oporto. Uh, I give you the role. So you can, you can start when you want. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, uh, we see your screen and you hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. It is a great pleasure uh, to participate in, in this meeting. My name is Ricardo Rodrigues Pinto. I am an orthopedic surgeon and um, the head of spinal unit uh, at Centro Hospitalar Universitario do Porto. Um, I am involved in some clinical research with the IO Spine Foundation in spinal cord injury, both in uh, traumatic spinal cord injury, but also in degenerative cervical myelopathy. Uh, and I also have some uh, basic research background. I've done my PhD in the University of Manchester in the development of cell-based therapies for intervertebral disc degeneration. But today I wanted to give you quite a clinical talk, focused on the clinical management of patients with spinal cord injuries. I hope that it will help you progress in your research and that it, you will help us uh, treating uh, spinal cord injury patients. The first thing I would like to point out is that uh, spinal cord injury may occur due to a variety of reasons. People are most familiar with traumatic spinal cord injury, as you see here <clears throat> in the left. The thing is that spinal cord injury may also occur due to other reasons. Some are degenerative, others are neoplastic uh, or iatrogenic. And the reason why I'm referring to degenerative spinal cord injury, uh, which occurs in the form of degenerative cervical myelopathy, is because this is an insidious onset spinal cord injury. And because I think this is where more advances can be achieved in terms of regeneration or repair, because in these cases, we still have some time. But I will start with uh, traumatic spinal cord injury. So this is a real case. Uh, this is a 50-year-old man. Let's call him Mr. Antonio. Mr. Antonio has had a few uh, cervical spine surgeries in the past, but he suffered a car accident and um, he was taken to the hospital. He did this x-ray and uh, as you can see, the vertebral bodies of C6 and C7 are not uh, uh, perfectly aligned. This is called uh, fracture dislocation uh, of C6, C7. Uh, during this dislocation, uh, as you understand the spinal cord suffered the contusion and for that reason when uh, Mr. Antonio arrives to the emergency department is Asia A below the level of C7. So what does this mean? Uh, Asia classification is the American Spinal Injury Association classification. It is a sensory and motor classification of spinal cord injury that separates injuries into complete and incomplete and according to the level and to the degree of injury. So, ASIA A is a complete neurological injury. The patient has no motor function below the injury level. ASIA B to D are incomplete injuries. ASIA B is an incomplete injury in which the patient has no motor function, but he has preserved sensibility. Asia C, the patient has some motor function, but it is below the level of, of two, which means that he can uh, do, have some muscle con contraction, but he does not uh, uh, resist gravity. Asia D, the patient has motor function and he can resist gravity. And in Asia E, the person is neurologically intact. So, Mr. Antonio has a complete neurological injury below the level of C7. Now, as you know, the spinal cord is divided into levels and the higher the level of injury, the most devastating it is. An injury between the level of C3 and C6 may affect the, the, the diaphragm, which means 
that it may affect our ability to breathe autonomously. An injury between C5 and C8 may give the patient some degree of upper limb function. A high thoracic injury will give will allow uh, upper limb motion, but poor trunk coordination. These patients may have difficulty to sit without torso support. A low thoracic injury will allow upper limb motion and good trunk stability in a wheelchair. And a lumbar injury, injury will allow some walking. With regards to cervical injuries, there are a few things that are important. Since each neurological level is responsible for controlling certain, certain muscle groups, C7 is responsible for elbow extension. So in the case of Mr. Antonio, at the time of injury, he is tetraplegic, but he has some motor function of his upper limbs. He has some degree of hand disability, but he can extend his elbows. And why is this important? Extending the elbows is extremely, extremely important for a tetraplegic because he can raise his trunk. He can transfer from bed to a wheelchair and from the wheelchair to a car. So having a C7 working, working nerve root is very important because Mr. Antonio will be autonomous despite his devastating injury. Now, the problem is that Mr. Antonio has only had his primary injury and that in the next, the next few hours and days are crucial. And I want to introduce you to the terms of primary and sec secondary injury. So the primary injury is the, the one that occurs at the time of, of the accident. If you sustain an injury like this on the left, and if you have a fracture that, that like that one on the right, the only thing you could have done was to avoid it. So prevention is the only option for a primary injury. Now, the problem is that immediately after that primary injury, a cascade of secondary events occurs. These events are caused by hemorrhage, cellular necrosis, inflammation, ischemia, and they develop over the next hours, days, and weeks. And they will lead to this secondary injury. What this means is that a patient that has sustained the primary injury which has a, a certain level. And you can see here in the image on the left, um, sorry, you can see that there is a white card signal below, uh, just, just, uh, just um, in the back of the spinal cord dislocation, you can see that there is an injury there and the size of the injury. And in the image of the right, you see the patient after the decompression and stabilization you see where the initial injury was and you also see a white card signal that is it's much larger so this means that the patient after a secondary injury can become a patient that was that had an incomplete injury can now have a complete injury or a patient that had a working c7 nerve root can now have a, a, an injury level by c5 and you understand the impact of this so Mr. Antonio can easily lose his elbow extension and now he needs someone to live with him. He needs someone to take him outside and he's not able to drive his car. So I think this is crucial. We all want to regenerate the spinal cord and to allow patients with complete injuries to walk again. But there may be avenues of research to decrease this secondary injury that although not allowing to fully recover from a, a spinal cord injury, may be very important to patients. And we also operate on these patients. We also expose the spinal cord. So there's an option there that uh, maybe with your biomaterials, we can try to also uh, decrease the secondary, secondary injury cascade that will develop over, over the next time. So what can we surgeons do about this? And the truth is that besides surgery, there's very, very little that we can do. We have learned some things in the past, and uh, the most important thing that we have learned is that time is fine. So this means that the sooner you stabilize the patient, you take him to the hospital, and you perform the surgery, the best for him. 
So this is the largest study to date. Uh, it was published last year in Lancet Neurology. And then it includes more than 1,500 patients. In this study, the authors compared uh, surgery uh, patients that have been operated within the first 24 hours after injury with patients that were operated after the 21st 24 hours. And of course, we want to operate the patients as early as possible, but sometimes the patients don't arrive to the hospital in time, the patients are not stable enough for surgery, the, sometimes the, the, the injury is, not, is neglected in the first few hours, so it, it doesn't always occur like that. And what the what authors found is that patients operated within the first 24 hours had a better total motor, motor score, they had more increase in light touch score, pinprick score, and AZ grade. So, early surgery is best. They also found that this um, advantage of operating the patients sooner was lost after three days. So the advantage of early surgery was lost after this period of time. So in this case, Mr. Antonio was immediately immobilized and transported to my hospital. He has had his surgery and now he lives alone and is somewhat independent. There are a few other drugs that are currently under investigation. Realizol is one of the most well-known, but to date, there's not much we can offer to, the, to our patients. There's been much discussion about corticosteroids. They've been used in the past because of their anti-inflammatory role. Uh, they've been discontinued in 2013, and most recent research says that in some cases, corticosteroids may be useful for our patients. But we clear, clearly there's still much to be done for these patients. So the other type of spinal cord injury I wanted to talk about as an insidious onset is a chronic spinal cord injury. Degenerative spinal uh, cervical myelopathy occurs due to a variety of degenerative changes in the cervical spine. These events lead to compression and ischemia of the spinal cord, causing spinal cord injury. It is the most frequent spinal cord injury and has an incidence of 41 per million in the, most in the USA. Clinically, it is characterized by loss of manual dexterity, gait imbalance, urinary emergency. So it is a slow motion spinal cord injury that may lead to quadriplegia. However, although it is a severe spinal cord injury, it is often neglected. It affects patients in their 60s and sometimes the loss of manual dexterity, gait imbalance or urinary emergency is initially interpreted as a normal aging or dementia process. And for this reason, patients usually take 2.2 years before the initial, between the initial symptoms to get the diagnosis, and they take 5.2 medical appointments to get a final diagnosis. And this is important because 20 to 62% of patients treated conservatively will worsen over the next years and the disease will progress. So these patients also require surgical treatment, and they have a, quite a significant improvement if they have timely surgeon. Surgery has, has been shown in a few studies. We know that some people have more chances to recover after surgical treatment. Those are young patients operated within the first year and with less severe disease. But we also know that symptoms remain. 95% of patients have an incomplete recovery, 50% are unable to return to work, 50% are dependent, and degenerative cervical myelopathy has the worst quality of life of most chronic diseases. When I was a resident 14 years ago, I learned that surgery for uh, myelopathy stopped the progression of symptoms, but we could not, couldn't do anything to improve them. We now know that timely surgery improves neurological function. However, we 
we also know that this improvement is not enough. We cannot restore neuro neurological function, and that is our goal. And that is, that is where we need you to help us. So in conclusion, spinal cord injury can be acute and degenerative. Surgery is critical for the best outcomes and complete recovery is still very rare in both cases. So we need your help and uh, I'm happy to, to, to discuss this with you. We need to understand how to uh, better approach our patients. And um, I'd like to leave you with this thought. How can we learn from a slow progressive spinal cord injury such as degenerative cervical myelopathy to better manage all forms of spinal cord injury. This is my email. Feel free to contact me if you if you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, uh, for the presentation. Uh, now is the, the time of uh, Gasconi Barretze, a professor of cell biology and histology of the University of Basque Country of Spain. So, uh, Gascon, you have now just the, the control, the role presentation. So, there we are. Now, I guess you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, so I go to the presentation. Okay, so, so hello, everybody. So, we are now approaching the end of this, uh, I would say, very, very good, fantastic workshop. I think uh, I would like to really really congratulate all the participants here because i have watched uh, a lot of presentations of a highest scientific level so this is i think something we, we, we could congratulate the participants of and then i'd also like to thank of course the organizers for allowing me to present uh, our work here which is um entitled um sorry i, I want to move this <laughs> The screen out of the out so let me i don't know so you can see the um, the application window right maybe if i try uh. yes Gascon, you can try to to put in the button the, yes. the of uh, buttons yeah i see um now the, your, because your it's not possible to so can, can i move I see it somehow, so so you can only see the presentation. We only see the presentation and your camera. Yes. It's okay. Oh, very good. Very good. So then, then it's, then it's perfect. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. So because I'm seeing the the window here, it's a bit. Yes, uh, but it's only he, he's seeing okay. there. Okay. Very good. So then, there's no problem then. Okay. So the title of my talk uh, seems apparently not to be uh, quite related to the main topic of uh, spinal core regeneration, right? So the title is Osteogenic Differentiation of Human Dental Path Stem Cells in the Cellularized Adipose Tissue Solid Forms. So you may remember that those scaffolds have already been mentioned in some of the talks during uh, today's workshop. Irache Madarieta specifically um, um, have described the um, synthesis of those scaffolds and some of the participants have also reported the results uh, of different applications of these materials. So in this case, we are going to use, I'm going to report our results using this material for 3D culture of stem cells. And in particular, we work with dental pulp stem cells because this is the cell type we, we commonly use in the laboratory. Okay. So then at the end of my talk, I will come back to the main topic of the workshop to discuss about some possibilities of application of this system for brain and spinal cord injury. So nowadays we have uh, many different technologies to decellularize native uh, human tissues, and this opens a large array of possibilities. So tissues like bone tissue, muscle tissue, and adipose tissue can be decellularized to their ECM components, and these ECM components can be combined, can be uh, implemented into uh, clinical therapy. This is the case of bone tissue, for instance. So the cellularized bone tissue is amply used in dental clinics worldwide to improve the attachment and integration of uh, dental implants, of the roots of uh, dental implants in the alveolar uh, tooth socket. In uh, my talk, I will discuss a very specific application 
of uh, the cellularized ECMs from uh, adipose tissue, just uh, holding the basic premise that these uh, ECM-based um, biomaterials will mimic much better the interactions that take place within live tissues. So in conventional uh, cell culture systems, we are missing the topographical and bioinductive interactions uh, between the ECM and the seeded cells. So we are using solid foams derived from the extracellular matrix of adipose tissue. So here you have an scanning electron micrograph of the of these solid foams. So you can see that they are porous materials. So they have pores of about 100 microns in diameter, which allow the infiltration and progressive colonization of the whole uh, biomaterial, the whole foam by the seed cells. We are combining these foams with dental pulp stem cells of human origin. So for those who are not familiar with those uh, cells, I can tell you that they are derived from the dental pulp of human patients. They are a very abundant source of high quality stem cells. Just bear in mind that millions of teeth that get uh, discarded uh, in dental clinics worldwide on a regular basis. The um, tooth extraction procedure is relatively non-invasive, uh, especially if you compare it with that of uh, bone marrow stem cells or adipose tissue stem cells, which require um, complex surgery. Then there will be no ethical concerns with this uh, particular source of uh, stem cells. They can be directly and straightforwardly culture without any need of cryopreservation. Another advantage that is often overlooked is that they are very well preserved in the dental chamber, away from microbial contamination of the rest of tissues of the oral cavity. Another very important advantage is that these cells are extremely resistant to hypoxia and ischemia. And this is of particular relevance for the for regeneration of brain and spinal cord lesions. And finally, the last two features are high expansion ability. So they, these cells can proliferate very, very fast when cultured in vitro. And they have an extremely high ability for multi differentiation. So they can give rise to many different lineages of mature cells. And those features are related to the neural crest phenotype. So the neural crest, as you all know, is a structure that gets uh, formed during embryogenesis at the time of fusion of the dorsal ends of the neural tube. Their uh, population of migratory cells gets generated and these cells will migrate to colonize uh, other um, peripheral parts of the embryo. So these neural crest cells contribute among others to generate the practical totality of cranio maxillofacial tissues and organs, including dental tissues. So during embryogenesis, neural crest stem cells will give rise to dental tissues as well as other tissues like adipose tissue, muscle tissue, con, um, cartilage tissue, and nerve tissue. Uh, the um, bottom line here is that uh, within the dental pulp of all of teeth, we can, we can isolate uh, populations of mature stem cells which have neural crest characteristics. So uh, if they are a culture um, in the appropriate conditions, they are able to give rise to adipose cells, muscle cells, cartilage cells, and even nerve cells. So, so um, yeah, they, this, this has, can be derived to a huge amount of mature cell lineages, including both mesenchymal lineages and non-mesenchymal lineages. Uh, regarding uh, uh, neuronal uh, differentiation, though this is, uh, still remains a bit of a controversial issue because uh, there's no doubt that these cells can give rise to neuronal marker expressing cells, but uh, still nobody has uh, demonstrated the generation of functional synapses between uh, HDPSC generating neurons. So there are some uh, issues that need uh, more clarification yet. But the, the, we are talking without doubt about uh, stem cell source with an impressive capacity for multilineage differentiation. And these cells can be grown using different methodologies. So the traditional way to culture these cells has, all, has been to uh, include fetal bovine serum on the culture recipe. This uh, culture in the presence of serum induces 
HDPSCs to acquire mesenchymal uh, uh, phenotypes. So these uh, cells uh, become plastic adherent. They, they attach to the bottom of the plastic flask. And this is the method of choice when one wishes to differentiate these cells to mesenchymal uh, related lineages like bone cells, adipose cells, or cartilage cells. There are also alternative methods to culture these cells in the absence of serum. So we use serum-free cultures supplemented with a specific growth factors. And in this case, what we get are dentospheres. Dentospheres which preserve better the neural crest characteristics of the original cell source. So this should be the method of choice when one wishes to differentiate these cells to neural lineages. So here you have a comparative assessment of uh, cellular morphology in plastic adherent and floating culture conditions. So in floating culture conditions, cells form colonies that uh, are, have to be periodically disaggregated to uh, make uh, culture patches. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to be talking uh, about the use of these cells to generate uh, mature bone cells, osteoblasts. So the initial choice we made was to stick to serum containing uh, culture media. And we combine them with solid foams derived from the cellularized adipose tissue. Here we use two different kinds of foams, foams derived from um, pigs, porcine, DAT, and uh, foams derived from human adipose tissue or HDAT. So here you have a scanning image of uh, foams showing pores. And our partners in Technalia um, very nicely combine these foams uh, with cell culture plates. So these foams can be incorporated pretty much into whatever cell culture device you want to consider. So we've been trying 96, 48, 24 well plates. They get no problem at all. They can even be incorporated into microscopy slides, Z slides. So this is a very versatile system that can be incorporated into many different formats, even allowing the implementation of uh, electric stimulation devices and so on. So here we use this uh, solid foam containing plates and we combine them with uh, HDPSCs. So uh, the initial experiment showed that there was an optimal viability. So here you have an image of calcium propidium iodide staining. And what you see here is that 100% of cells are viable. So they, they are staining in green and they are no orange cells. So they are no, no, no dead cells, They're, but all of them are viable. You can uh, notice that these, uh, many of these cells are out of focus. This is because cells colonize different layers of the foam. So uh, they, it's impossible to, to have them on focus at, uh, simultaneously. So our experiments show that um, these systems uh, offer an optimal HDPSC viability in cell culture. So we've been making cultures of different time length uh, in between 48 hours to four weeks. Four weeks is a pretty long time to keep uh, cells in culture, especially taking into account the fact that these cells proliferate. So when they proliferate, they expand the population. And after a while, um, the um, interchange of gases and nutrients can be a limiting factor in these 3D cultures. So for those who are not familiar with different stages of uh, bone differentiation, because here at the beginning, uh, so, so we, we went to the simplest application, which was to make um, 3D cultures of HDPSCs to generate a 3D bone tissue. So in the presence of FBS, most cells have a non-committed mesenchymal stem cell uh, phenotype. So they have typical mesenchymal markers, like CD90, CD105, CD73, as well as some stem cell markers like OCT4. So when, when cells uh, commit to, to become um, osteoblasts or bone producing cells, there's an extra stage where they begin to secrete, begin to produce bone matrix proteins like osteocalcin and osteonectin. Similarly, cells start showing alkaline phosphatase activity. 
and uh, they have a higher rate of collagen production as well. So when the cell reaches fuel maturity, as a mature osteoblast, uh, this can be assessed by the expression of specific transcription factors like osterix. The ethylene phosphatase activity is very high in these conditions, as well as uh, collagen secretion. And uh, when cells have reached fuel maturity, they are able to mineralize the extracellular matrix they are surrounded by. So we started uh, culturing uh, these cells uh, in these conditions. And uh, well, in the presence of FBS, these cells tend to naturally differentiate to osteoblasts. So this is their, their preferred differentiation pathway in this condition. And we observed that after two weeks in vitro, they express high amounts of osteocalcin and osteonectin. So here we compare PDAT CD cells with uh, cells seeded over plastic in two dimensions. So this, uh, this would be the standard uh, culture methodology. Uh, here you can observe that the cellular density is much higher over plastic than over PDAT, but you have just to remember that PDAT is a 3D culture. So this is, those are confocal images. So uh, in the case of PDAT, we only get cells that are present on the same focal plane. Whereas uh, in cells grown over plastic, we, have, we get the whole population of cells growing there. So we can observe that they express uh, osteocalcin and osteonectin as pre-committed bone cells. And um, moreover, they are able to respond to osteodifferentiation stimuli. So here we compare uh, the alkaline phosphatase activity in cells grown over plastic and over PDAT. And a very typical way to, to, to induce uh, bone differentiation here is to add a very simple pharmacological cocktail to the cultural medium. This cocktail consists of dexamethasone, beta glycerol phosphate, and ascorbate. So when you add these three regions to the cultural medium, this causes um, the, um, the this accelerates this induces an accelerated differentiation of HDPSCs to bone in cells. So here you observe that the ALP activity is higher under osteo differentiation conditions, both when cells grow over plastic and when they grow over PDAT. In fact, the relative increase in ALP absorbance is higher when cells are grown on PDAT. So we can conclude that cells respond adequately to osteogenic treatments uh, when they are uh, seeded on PDAT materials. Uh, not only that, but they are also able to mineralize the uh, PDAT matrix, generating uh, calcified nodules that are stained with alicinate red. So here you see merged images of uh, uh, DAPI, uh, so in cell nuclei, and alicinate red bright field images. Uh, some batches of PDAT gave very good results concerning mineralization. So this was, um, I mean, the results were, they were better when cells were grown on PDAT than on plain plastic. So high resolution microscopy allowed us to identify cell nuclei with a healthy appearance in close association with the alicinate red stain extracellular matrix, mineralized extracellular matrix. So uh, as the next step, we wanted to assess the uh, ultrastructure of this uh, mineralized PDAT. And to that end, we perform a transmission electron microscopy analysis. And uh, when we assess the mineralization levels uh, within solid forms, we found out that the, the so most uh, regions in the form could be classified into one of two categories either nor non mineralized areas or mineralizing areas. So, non mineralized areas were more abundant in control conditions and they had this appearance. So, you could see some lipid droplets, which could possibly be remains of the, the, uh, the solarization protocol, and we could see a network of uh, very thin collagen fibers. In contrast, in uh, cultures that have been seeded with HDPSCs and subjected to osteodifferentiation treatment, we could observe some mineralizing areas 
showing thick fiber bundles of collagen. So the, this collagen is much thicker than the remaining parts of collagen uh, in the foam. And besides that, they were electro then they had a higher electron density, showing that they were ongoing mineralization. So the more mineralized the tissue is, the more electro density it appears. And here we could detect transition area, transition uh, zones between the normal control matrix and the mineralized matrix. So here we are assuming that the thick collagen containing mineralized part has been de novo produced by our seeded cells. We could also observe in those highly mineralized areas the presence of intramembranous ossification sites. So here you can observe areas containing completely calcified collagen. So this is full electrodes, and those areas are found within, within the uh, parts of the foam that are being calcified that are de novo produced by the seeded HDPSCs. These uh, osteo osteogenesis sites are anchored to the rest of the collagen network by Sharpe-like fibers. So you can see the, the ossification sites here marked by yellow arrowheads. And you can see the transition zone in between the mineralized parts and the non-mineralized parts. So then we, we assess what cells could, were associated to those uh, different parts of the, um, of the foam. And we, we found some very nice osteoblasts, like uh, the one I show you here. So they have a typical, these cells have a typical round morphology of mature osteoblasts. They are uh, secretory uh, cells have many secretion vesicles over here, and they are uh, associated to um, electrodense collagen containing uh, PDT areas. So we can observe, we can uh, really um, corroborate that an effective osteoelastic differentiation is taking place here. Interestingly, we also found some mature multilocular adipocytes. So these cells are also derived from HDPSCs. And uh, it's interesting to note that they acquire uh, um, a phenotype resembling brown fat. So there are two types of fat tissue in the human body. The white fat, which is unilocular adipocyte um, morphology. So here, uh, white adipocytes will only have a single lipid droplet. And the adipocytes we obtain here have multiple lipid droplets. These were more abundant in control conditions. So uh, there's a possibility that the, the cellulite adipose tissue matrix has also some inductive properties which drive the differentiation of some of the HDPSCs to mature brown adipocytes. And this is something we have into consideration, especially when we compare the osteogenesis effect between HDAT and PDAT. So this is something that was unexpected at the beginning, but we found out that um, unlike PDAT, which was quite permissive for osteogenic differentiation, HDAT was refractory to it. So no matter whether we grew cells in control or osteodifferentiation conditions, we didn't manage to observe uh, bone matrix precipitates stained with addition in red. And we corroborate with these results with other techniques like uh, ALP staining, uh, QPCR and immunohistochemistry. And in all cases, we, we found out the, the same result. So unlike PDAT and collagen 1, which uh, sustain mineralization, uh, as you can see here in this uh, um, alkaline phosphatase uh, stain images, in human DAT, we didn't manage to observe any ongoing mineralization. So it looks like uh, PDAT and collagen 1 are permissive for osteogenesis, whereas HDAT is not. So collagen 1 uh, would be included here as the gold standard of uh, estrocellular matrix, which is permissive uh, to osteogenesis. Uh, remember that collagen 1 is the main organic component of the bone matrix. So we don't know whether this is related to, to the presence of different inductive signals. It could be a possibility, uh, taking into account that some of the cells under control conditions can differentiate to adipocytes, but this is something we, we still have to, 
uh, to corroborate um, and to, to confirm. Okay, so I would like to um, to highlight some some facts here. So uh, we have demonstrated that PDAT and HDAT can be successfully combined with human cells, like HDPSCs, but you could consider any other type of stem cell, probably, and you can make very nice in vitro 3D cultures using this system. So this system offers the advantage uh, of better mimicking in vivo conditions for ph pharmacological assays. So here we are including all the information, all the, all the, all the environment provided by extracellular matrix, which is a much closer reality to in vivo conditions than plain uh, standard cultures uh, over plastic. Then we found out a very low responsiveness to osteogenesis by HDPS is grown in human DAT. Uh, at the beginning, we thought it could be well, a pretty disadvantage, but um, coming to think about it better, it could, you, you could, uh, you could um, consider it the other way around. So that can be possibly useful to treat some uh, um, rheumatological injuries like the tendon and ligament injuries. So in those cases, what you want is precisely not to mineralize too much the matrix. You want to maintain a strip of connective tissue in between uh, mineralized parts. So in the case of ligament between two bones and in the case of tendons between the bone and muscle. So well, this is something that could be possibly interesting to consider. Then uh, regarding PDAT, we have found a very good responsiveness to osteogenesis, which is similar to collagen one which is the gold standard uh, to induce osteogenesis. And just remember that we are talking about matrices that uh, have a very low immunogenic immunogenicity, in theory at least. Just remember that some of these uh, formulations are already applied in clinical practice without any, any um, adverse reactions. So this system of DAT and HDPSC cultures offers very good possibilities for the on-demand generation of not only bone tissue, but many other varieties of tissues, including vascular and nerve tissues. And here I am going to make progressively a trip back to the main topic of this workshop, coming back to a spinal cord injury, because we found some, some interesting uh, properties of these cells. So they are very versatile. I told you about the different culture methodologies of these cells in both plastic adherent and um, pre-floating conditions. So these, uh, these were the results of a paper published in 2019 in Frontier Physiology, where we culture cells in dentosphere form, we desaturated them and we grafted them to the brain of immune compromised mice. We sacrificed animals for 30 days and we were surprised to find that uh, many of the cells that have been grafted there had differentiate and given rise to mature blood vessels. This is what you can observe here, a flawless blood vessel containing CD31 expressing cells. And this antibody recognizes specifically the human form of, human, of, of CD31. So we, we can um, make sure, we can corroborate that those are cells, endothelial cells of human origin that generated a blood vessel within the brain. And in the last year, we have fine-tuned the protocol to obtain... Okay, sorry, sorry, yes. Aston, yes. uh, you are more or less in your last minutes of the auditorium. That, that, that would okay. be enough. So sorry. Just, uh, I, I'd like just to, to mention that we have fine-tuned the protocol. So at the beginning, we were relying on commercial culture uh, media like NeuroCult to obtain these vascular cells. Now we are able to, uh, to generate a similar vascular structure in completely defined media. And we have patented this technology. This technology now uh, we have received a positive international sales report and we are on the verge of concession of this patent for the entry in national phases. So we will be glad to discuss possible partnerships to try to spread this uh, technology in the revascularization of brain lesions. And finally, just a couple of uh, highlights to tell you that these DPCs can also differentiate two neural cells, including uh, cells of neuronal and glial lineages. So here we compare the uh, rate of generation of neural cells of DPSCs compared with uh, mouse NSCs with very good results. And well, coming back to the initial topic, so the, here the challenge is to bridge the gap in SCI uh, lesions. We need to overcome the glial scar. And many of the materials that have been presented here, in my opinion, they have a very high High, uh, have very high possibilities of applications. So we've seen very, very promising results using 
um, different um, gel, um, um, gel and gums, uh, graphene based materials, materials couple or containing enzymes. So regarding the use of the cellulite adipose tissue, well, it depends on what you consider because uh, regarding the, the application of collagen, um, there have been both positive and negative reports. So collagen one is, is being reported to be detrimental for Gaia scar, where, but in most of collagen you find in both the cellulite adipose tissue is not collagen one, but thin collagen, possibly reticular fibers and so on. So I'm just finishing my talk. So thank you everybody for, for listening. So this is a single in group I belong to. So John Luzuriaga, Igoria Stork and Patricia Garcia have, uh, have been involved specifically in this project. I would like to thank a lot uh, our partners in Tecnalia, Nerea Brit, Irace Madarieta and Beatriz Olalde for, in, for having invited us to give this talk and for providing us the materials to carry out this study. And finally, Jose Ramon Pineda, who is also part of our group, he has a double affiliation with UPBHU and Achucarro, who played a very important role in the studies of vascular and neural differentiation. So thank you for everything. And now I finished my presentation. So um, let me see. Uh, well, I hope you could uh, follow it. And um, I'd be glad to, um, to take uh, any of your questions in the discussion round. Okay, thank you very much, Gascon, for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, now we have time for uh, questions in the discussion, whatever you 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 want. Uh, so uh, I don't know if someone can uh, start putting some uh, asking some question. Uh, someone that could. Could put some, some questions for in the chat. We have not uh, questions. Uh, if some of you want to ask something, okay. So no, nobody. All is clear. <laughs> so uh, okay. So that is remain is that I would like to to thank every everybody. For the for attending the the event and obviously to the speakers uh, for the effort for the presentation and for the work it has been very interesting. It has been an opportunity to interchange uh, information and uh, I hope that it was uh, one point of uh, initiating some collaboration, some discussion uh, in next days. And uh, okay, uh, it has been. Uh, I would like to be grateful too to the supporting team of uh, Technalia, marketing team, Miriam and Vanessa, and uh, my colleagues, uh, always the uh, uh, Bea Olaldi and Irache Madarieta. And, um, okay, uh, I don't know if you want Paula to say anything to close the, the event. I just want to, to thank you, of course, for taking care of this uh, workshop organization. I know that it was a very hard, but it was, uh, I think it was a, a great, a great day of discussions. And uh, I think the, we all be, uh, are aware that uh, repairing the, a spinal cord damage is like uh, solving a puzzle. And uh, I think that several that the puzzle were revealed here today. So there's really a challenge to imagine how these pieces could be brought together and to further um, repair the, the spinal cord injury. So I, I, I hope that uh, each of us will take some meshes, messages home and reflect on them and then convert them into fresh ideas to be executed. And most probably, we will also have the opportunity to to make uh, to, to bring novel ideas to think about the new collaborations. And I want to thank all the attendees. I I think we will have the statistics later, but uh, I, I saw that we have almost 70 participants, which is very good for for the workshop. So thank you so much, uh, all us to to deal, to lead and to be. In this um, this workshop, 
And uh, I would like to thank all the invited speakers for bringing us so very interesting talks. So thank you all. And uh, don't uh, hesitate to contact us if you want. Okay, thank you, Paula. I I, uh, I say that the event will be has been recorded and we put in the in YouTube channel. Uh, we will send you the links and all these things uh, according to, to the opportunity to see. And okay, thank you to everybody. And we uh, we hope to to have another occasion to to do this meeting and to connect with people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. I will stay in contact. Thank you for organization and see you soon. <laughs>